The man with long hair looked helplessly at the sky, thinking that if he had taken the sword before his sister was sent to the Empire, there would not be a monster called me. The hero would not have met his minner. If he had known, he would have acted differently because he wanted something different. Tired, he was just sitting on the ground when a young man approached him and called his opponent a monster. In response, the hero told him how many people he had killed and how many empires he had destroyed alone. After that, having learned the story of the boy's hatred and his name, he asked the young man to do him a favor, namely to kill him. The boy swung his sword with the intention of killing. But still, falling to his knees before the monster, he could not do it. When Jack saw this, he put his hand on the head of the crying young man and asked him to tell him that the war was over because the monster was dead. With these words, the man simply falls to the ground living his last moment. Did you like the beginning of the story and want to continue? Then like the video and leave a comment below. The man felt like he was drowning. He thought it was a dream in which his father was present, who always doubted that Jack was his son. The face of his mother, who died shortly after his birth. His sister, known for her beauty even outside the empire, and his older brother, who always pestered him. All the memories came back to the man, namely that he used to be Jack Ballantyre, but having forgotten his name, he became a soldier who crossed the whole continent. Thoughts about his experiences overwhelmed the man's head, and it was hard to understand whether it was a dream or reality, whether Jack had died or been killed. What if it was just a memory before death? The Second Continental War he started and his victory in it, which made him a monster among monsters, his desire for revenge that destroyed the Tolkien Empire that dominated the Western continent. The wars he started and ended with his victory. At that moment, it was not difficult to accept death because there was no incentive to live on. The man's heart had already begun to stop when suddenly he found himself in a young body wondering if he had really gone back in time. And how is this possible? The family of the Marquis Ballantyre was famous in the Teslan Empire, they were one of those who openly sympathized with the ruling power in the person of the emperor. Jack was the third child in the family, the youngest, young marquis in the Teslan Empire. If this title was enough for him, he would have lived a happy life. Everything was very simple, but not for the Marquis of Ballantyre. Jack was in the Rose Garden, thinking that the garden itself was an extension of their estate. It looked beautiful, but only from the outside. In reality, it was a kind of place of exile a place that was needed to limit the youngest child from supporting the family and vassals, which is what the Rose Garden really was. He was brought out of his thoughts by the voice of Ron's butler who brought the juice. He was the only person who really appreciated Jack out of the entire estate. Turning to face him, the boy smiled, noting that the Ron he knew had always been a little sneaky, so there must be poison in the juice. At this, the butler blushed and tried to object. But Jack smiled gently and said he was just joking. With a light smile, the butler walked away, leaving the boy alone. As he sipped his juice, the young man reflected on the fact that there were 11 other people in the Rose Garden besides him. One of them was Ron, who had just brought him the juice. The other 10 are the guards assigned to watch over him. In any case, apart from Ron, Jack is not interested in anyone else here. Looking up at the sky and holding the glass, the young man continued to think about the fact that this was not a dream after all. He could not even think that he could be in the past. Only an hour had passed since the moment when the young man was able to understand what was going on. Of course, it can be considered a chance. At that moment, he was only 14. There are no wounds on his arms, and not even a hint of a man of heart inside. If you compare Jack to other children of noble families, he is a complete bottom, which is understandable since at this age his mana is not yet. Jack was not allowed to continue his thought by a figure behind him who hit him on the head. Not realizing what was happening, the young man drops his glass, which causes it to break, thinking that the last time he was hit on the head was many years ago. When Jack returns, he sees his older brother, Palon Ballantyre. He thinks about the fact that Palon was the second child in the family and three years older than the protagonist, and the problem that prevented the young man from practicing magic was Palon's constant bullying. The protagonist stood in front of his brother, angrily looking him straight in the eye. Recalling that many years had passed, and Palin still pissed Jack off. In his past life, his brother treated him like trash, saying that unlike his sister, the boy was completely useless, he could do nothing, neither wield a sword nor use magic, and if Jack wanted to learn, Palin would consider it a betrayal and kill him. So for now, the young man in this family should eat what they give him, and wear what they bring, and then let things happen. When the brother becomes the head of the family, he may accept Jack as his younger brother. As a child, the protagonist was very weak, 
which is why many in the family made fun of him, and of course the conversations went beyond the family circle. The third child of the Marquis was a complete trash, and even ordinary people ridiculed him. Palon and Count Minas in particular contributed to the spread of this talk. Even so, it was funny for Jack to look at his brother because the first child was his sister anyway. The girl was the only one in the family who could be relied on, the only one in the family who cared about Jack. She was a year older than Palon, but because of her gender, she would not be able to take on the role of head of the family. The fate of the beautiful daughter of the Marquis, who could not lead the family, was predetermined from the very beginning. The girl will marry someone her father will like and will live her whole life in a small estate giving birth to heirs. This is how her life was and will be. And now Jack is facing the man who will contribute to all this more than anyone else, the man who is ready to sell his sister to the first person he meets just to take the place of heir as soon as possible. If Jack kills him now, he'll be doing the world a favor. Not satisfied with his little brother's gaze, Palon swings for the kill, but the protagonist intercepts his hand, shocking his older brother and the guards around him. In a panic, Palin starts shouting that the boy doesn't dare to do that. Jack throws him over his shoulder, knocking him to the floor. The bewildered young man turns to his younger brother, not understanding what is wrong with him, and sees him mocking him, ironically asking if Palin needs help getting up. Angry, the young man grabs his sword to gather mana. Looking at this and fearing the consequences, the guards remain in place. Standing in a stance, Jack concludes that the guards will certainly not interfere and it is quite funny. At this point, Palin is about to launch, but Ron stops him, asking him not to use mana right now. Unable to withstand such impudence, the young man hits the butler on the cheek, causing him to fall to the ground. This makes the protagonist think that there is probably no point in doing anything now, as Ron has plenty of secrets of his own and Palin continues to point his finger and say that now both Jack and his butler will die. The younger man continues to mock the older one, smiling, saying that he probably wants to stun him. At these words, the elder releases his anger and draws his sword. The protagonist thinks that he did not expect such a turn, and even though his body does not know what training is and could not reveal mana, he is not going to lose. Palin swings his sword, but Jack is struck, thinking that the magic of the third circle is the limit of his older brother. No matter how expensive Palin's sword is, he is still a child, but it is too early to kill him. With this thought, smiling, the protagonist approaches his opponent closely, continuing to mock, and surprisingly for the butler, grabs Palin's head, filling it with mana. At that moment, Jack was ready to take revenge for every abuse he had suffered, unless of course his brother was against it. Having defeated his brother, the protagonist kicks him to check if he is alive. Then he turns his gaze to the guard who was about to draw his sword, ordering him to freeze if he doesn't want to end up like Palin. Having calmed the guard down, Jack turns to his brother, taking him by the hair, and begins to drag the carcass, complaining that Palin should have gone on a diet. Continuing to drag his brother, the boy approaches the pond and raising the unconscious young man's head says that it is very hot today, so Palin should refresh himself. Then he dips the boy's head into the water. And while holding him underwater, he thinks about the shock of his brother's state of mind, even if he doesn't use the mana he has been saving up so hard. And if you think about it, a lot of things have gone wrong because of Palin. After he sent his sister to the Empire, he poisoned his father and became the head of the family. He tried to influence the affairs of the Empire as if he had the right to do so. The result is obvious to everyone. The house of the Marquis Ballantyr was destroyed and wiped off the map. Of course, the protagonist doesn't care about this. He only regrets the loss of the opportunity that his sister gave them with her wedding. My sister was always smart. She had a nice personality. It was obviously painful for her to leave this house. It's hard to imagine how she felt when she went to another empire to ensure their family's good reputation. She knew exactly what she was doing because her husband was the fourth prince, who was the subject of bad rumors. For the sake of her family, the girl was ready to do anything even such things. If only her father and that bastard knew how she really felt. But enough about that, the more he thought about it, the angrier he got. Pulling his head out of the water, Palon began to ask his brother for mercy. Looking at this, the protagonist thought he had seen this expression on his face, such grimaces of fear were everywhere during the war. With such thoughts, continuing to hold his opponent by the hair, Jack asks if his brother remembers everything he did to him. Should he help him remember? Or is it better to let him feel everything on his own skin, so that he realizes the importance of family? Then he swings for a punch to Palin's poor face, admitting that he was wrong. 
Jack is stopped by Ron asking him to stop. Listening to the butler, the young man finally knocks out the air and lets him go. Then he turns to the guards, ordering them to remove what is under his foot, saying that Palin is still alive. The guard quickly runs over to help his master, while Jack is pleased with his work. Meanwhile, Ron was looking at the guy who passed by with a surprised expression on his face at what he had just done. The whole house immediately learned about what had happened, and of course it turned everything upside down. Palon Ballantyre is Jack Ballantyre's half-brother and future heir, who was supported by the forces of the influential Count Mintis family. Therefore, being understood in the family in which the title of Marquis was to pass to him, the sight of a broken Palon and his new fear of water caused a total stir. At this time, Jack himself was sitting drinking tea and enjoying a cake under the gaze of an embarrassed Ron. There were many rumors that Palin had gotten the third round at the age of 17, and that he had been defeated by his younger brother, who was not trained in magic or fencing. Was Jack hiding his talent? Next year, Palin will be 18 and was supposed to be introduced as a successor, but now that the younger man has shown his claim to the headship, it is not known who will be the heir. Overhearing the maids discussing these rumors, the daughter of the Ballantyre family could not help but ask what had happened. Meanwhile, the talk spread further and further, and many in the estate came up with new details of what had happened. Finally, the rumors reached the current head of the manor, who immediately ordered the third man to be brought to him. While Jack was enjoying the cake in the company of Ron, the maids suddenly entered the room and immediately went to the butler. After listening to them, Ron turned to the young gentleman and told him that the master wanted to see him right away. Rising from his chair, the young man put on his jacket and headed for the door. When Ron saw this, he wanted to go with him, but Jack refused, claiming that he was no longer a little boy. This answer puzzled the butler, but he could not object, so the man only bowed and wished him good luck. The protagonist walked up the stairs to his father under the watchful eyes of the staff. Thinking about how he hadn't felt for a long time how it feels to be non-existent for others, although it doesn't matter what others think about him. The main thing is to get it over with as soon as possible. Jack wanted to open the door but couldn't. The guards closed the entrance in front of him with their weapons, pretending that the guy was not there at all. Smiling ominously and a little irritated, the young man kicked one of the guards in the leg, asking if he was blind. The guard looked at the young man angrily. In the past, the protagonist would have run away from such a look, but not now. With a gentle smile, Jack responded to the look by telling the guard to relax, otherwise he would cut him in half. Not expecting such a response, the knight asked what he meant. The protagonist answered that he had hit the guard in the leg, relying on the fact that he did not repeat twice that the Marquis had called him, so he had to pass. But the guard still couldn't let Jack through. Realizing that he had to wait, the protagonist turned around and started walking away, thinking that there was no point in waiting to be called, he was nobody here anyway. The guard behind him asked where the young man was going. He replied that the guard should tell the owner that if he wanted to talk to him, he should come himself. This surprised the two guards. After Jack left, they immediately reported it to the head. Unable to believe what he heard, the man asked if it was true. The answer was that it was true. Smiling at this news, the master put down his pin and picked up his cane and said that the younger man had changed a lot. Jack was sitting in his garden drinking juice and thinking that his father should have been home by now. As soon as this thought crossed his mind, he noticed the people approaching him and the easy-to-remember head. Even his father's face showed that he was an old and stubborn goat. What was even more surprising was the fact that Jack remembered him exactly the same. The owner approached the protagonist, who at that moment thought that sometimes he wished his father did not exist at all. In his past life the head tried to kill him when the boy tried to run away from home. The man was someone who could sell his child for the sake of reputation, too greedy for power and unable to achieve what he wanted, such was the Marquis of Ballantyre. With this thought in mind, Jack greeted his father with a bold greeting. That's why he arrogantly asked what was wrong with the boy. The young man pretended not to understand the question. This provoked the anger of the Marquis and the indignation of his mother, whom he called a barking bitch in his head. After that, he calmly began to say that they had come all this way with the desire to go back inside, or would they talk here? With these words, Jack defiantly threw the plate away to everyone's surprise. This caused his father's obvious anger, and he began to collect mana. The protagonist immediately realized that the Marquis was trying to check whether the mana heart had appeared in the boy's body. However, of course, it is not there at the moment. After checking and realizing that there was no heart, the head asked that if Jack had a talent for martial arts, why didn't he show it earlier? 
The boy took a sip of juice and thought about the fact that he couldn't tell him that he was weakened and wanted to start talking. But his frantic mother interrupted him shouting that the little shit didn't dare to act so arrogant at such a young age. Raising his hand to pacify the woman, the Marquis said that he thought the younger man was completely clueless, but it turned out he wasn't. These words hurt Jack's feelings, and he put down his glass and got up from his chair, saying that since he was useless, he had no right to call himself his son. Hearing this, the father asked if Jack wanted the man to recognize him as his son. The protagonist, who folded his arms across his chest, replied that he was not interested. The servants behind the head began to whisper at what they heard. Realizing the situation, the Marquis turned around and strode away, leaving Jack wondering why the man had come at all if he was leaving. Unable to bear the look of his second son's mother, Jack said with a sincere smile that the elder son's mother had new wrinkles after the incident, so she should take care of her skin. These words made the woman blush and get angry. Jack could hardly contain his laughter, thinking that even though he was not a pervert, it was very pleasant to look at the woman's face at the moment. Finally, the boy bowed, wishing her a good evening and asking her to convey his apologies to the elder. Sometime later at the Ballantyre estate, Ron read an order that the third child in the family was sentenced to solitary confinement for 20 days for making a mess in the house. The butler was outraged by the news and wondered what had happened while he was away. Drawing a picture, Jack objected to Ron, saying that what happened happened, and in general, he stood quietly while the older man mocked the boy, so let him not be angry. After these words, the protagonist wondered how solitary confinement is even possible. He was already sent to the Pink Garden, and now this, do they really want to ban him from going outside? Meanwhile, Ron sighed and said that there was only a month of vacation left at the academy, so solitary confinement was not a big deal. Hearing this, Jack was surprised to remember that he had completely forgotten about the academy, he was now 14, and therefore he had to attend the Imperial Academy. All the aristocrats of the Teslon Empire have to study there, unless they are disabled. The training lasts four years. It starts at the age of 14, so now the boy is in his first year. The first semester has already ended and summer vacation has begun. Thinking about it, Jack smiled a little excitedly at being a student again. But then he remembered one more thing. His mentor is directly connected to the academy, so he can skip any subject but not hers. That's why he can't argue with the Marquis about trifles anymore. Finishing the painting, Jack concludes that he will go to the academy. There are 27 days of vacation left, 20 of which will be spent in prison, and it will take 6 days to get to the academy, which means that his father is literally sending the young man to study after his imprisonment. Sitting in the room, Ron asked if the boy had finished the painting yet. In turn, the young man got up and asked where he would be imprisoned. The butler fell silent at this question, but the boy insisted on telling him. Taking out a letter from his jacket and handing it to the boy, Ron began to say that there was only one place for solitary confinement, and it was for criminals who had committed crimes on the territory of the Marquis' property. Pale Jack asks if Ron means prison, to which the butler answers yes. This news made the young man completely depressed, and he decided that he would not let it go. To tell you the truth, the heirs of aristocratic families don't need vacations at the academy to relax. This can be understood by looking at Palin's smashed head. Almost every day from the beginning of the vacation until his head was smashed in, he attended social events and met other aristocrats from noble families. Jack, on the other hand, had never done so. Of course, the official affairs of the Marquis did not interest the guy, but he was angry that his relatives said that there was no place for Jack here or anywhere else, bastards. The protagonist decided to go to prison himself without waiting for the convoy to come for him. It was hard to understand how much he was hurting by the face of the sad Ron who was looking at Jack in the wake. The butler was worried about the young man's health, even though Jack himself thought it was all a joke. This is the Karen prison, a bed, a toilet, and three meals a day. Looking at these things with disgust, the protagonist did not understand what the point of it was. The bedspread had not been changed for half a century, and even flies refused to eat the soup. A lonely prisoner has plenty of time to think, and it's too much. Aristocrats who have land holdings can punish the inhabitants of these lands as they wish, using local laws, not imperial ones. In fact, aristocrats have the same rules on their territory as the head of the empire. Even though Jack is in prison by order of the Marquis, he is still the son of an aristocrat. If he had rebelled against the head of the state, one could understand the imprisonment. But this is how they want to comfort the wounded elder. I wonder if Palon used poison or forbidden artifacts as an excuse for the public. Surely the Marquis has already come up with a good story. 
Jack Ballantyre, to the shame of his family, studied forbidden black magic because of his greed. At that moment, his older brother saw him and ordered him to stop. However, Jack not only disobeyed his older brother, but also used magic on him. And although Palin was severely injured, he found the nobility to forgive his younger brother. The Marquis and the Marquis had this scenario in their heads. Just thinking about it made the protagonist sick. Falling down on the bed, the boy continued to think about what if they had kept him here for at least a few days, but he didn't want to spend the whole vacation. In general, the young man doesn't care about this place. He can escape at any time, but he can't for three reasons, his sister, Ron, and his mentor. In addition, Jack is still too weak to survive on his own. He is 168 centimeters tall and 55 kilograms in weight, and has no muscles. The guy knows the rule of survival in this world. The strong eats the weak, the stronger survives, and the weak become food for him. Thanks to his strength, Jack was able not only to survive but also to get what he wanted. But now the young man does not want to organize a massacre like in his past life, but he still has to take revenge on many people. To do this, he needs two things, time and power. You can get them at the academy. By studying, the young man can gain a lot of influence and buy time to gain power. If he succeeds, he will be able to protect his mentor, Ron, and his sister. Having decided the main thing for himself, Jack sat up and sat down more comfortably, and although he didn't like it, he had to take what was rightfully his, so he began to manage mana. There are 10 levels of magic, 1 to 3 circle for beginners, 4 to 6 circle for experts, 7 to 9 circle for those who have magic at the highest level, and the 10th circle for people who are called masters or superhumans. In any case, it was even good for Jack that there was no one else. It takes about two hours to create the first circle. In his past life, the guy started studying magic at the age of 17. While the young man was practicing his magic, he heard footsteps in the hallway, so he quickly dispelled it to avoid getting caught. The sound of shoes could be heard in the corridor, but not as heavy as the Marquise's. Wrapped in a sheet, Jack just waited for a girl to come up to him across the corridor and call his name. Hearing her voice, the protagonist immediately jumped up. It was a person whom he could only meet in his past life in Elizabeth Ballantyre's dream. The girl stood in front of the camera with tears in her eyes. Touching her little brother's face, she asked if he was injured. When Jack saw his sister, he immediately thought that she was just as beautiful and kind at heart. Elizabeth gently touched the protagonist's face, asking if Jackie was hurt. At that moment, the guy was thinking that he hadn't heard himself call that for a long time. Taking her hand, the young man put it to his cheek, saying that he was fine. The sister came to ask why Jack used black magic. She could have taught him ordinary magic. She was very sorry for the situation. The boy should have stayed at the academy instead of going home. While she was saying this, the young man just looked at her and could not believe that she was standing in front of him. Elizabeth was worried about her brother's health. He just smiled and wiped away his tears and said that he was just very happy. After that, he asked his sister to run away to some small village and work together in the field. The girl sank down from these words. Meanwhile, Jack continued to say that he knew how her mother and her friend treated her, so they needed to leave everything behind and live together in a quiet place, find a person who would sincerely love her, and not remain under the oppression of the Marquis. Unable to stand it, Elizabeth yelled at her brother, which confused him and told him not to talk like that. But the Marquis is their father, he loves their mother, and this love is the reason they were born. She knows very well how he feels about Jack and will try to change that, so he should be patient a little longer. At this moment, looking at her sincere face, the protagonist thought that in his past life she had said the same thing. After all, he had really gone back in time. Taking his hand from the girl's palms, the guy said that he was glad to see her. Elizabeth smiled at his words. After this conversation, Jack started to get up, asking his sister to move away a little. The girl listened to him. Seeing that she was at a sufficient distance, the boy began to collect mana in his hand and then directed it at the bars in front of him. The lock cracked, which shocked Elizabeth, who was watching and could not believe how he was able to make a magic circle. Without listening to her, Jack threw himself into her arms with tears in his eyes and apologized to his sister, who did not understand what was happening. Because of this, the girl was again worried about her brother's health asking if he was sure he was okay. Smiling, the protagonist hugged her, saying that this time everything would be different, they would not need to return, he would give her the life she deserved. They stood there in an embrace for some time. The joy on the protagonist's face was replaced by anger. 
Once upon a time, the boy decided to find out the truth about the fourth prince who took his sister in his past life. And this truth was much more horrible than the young man initially thought. It would make him a monster much bigger than he was before. His sister's life, which no one knew about, was a living hell. In the past, it changed Jack because he decided not to forgive the Tolkien Empire in any way, because he was a good brother. In his past life, the protagonist ran away from home at the age of 17. But even after another 10 years, he realized that nothing had changed in his home. The Tolkien Empire had disappeared, and so had the Marquises of Ballantyre. After that, the Teslon Empire became the largest on the western continent. Of course, the House of Ballantyre continued to exist nominally. After learning about the whole situation, Elizabeth could not believe that her family was in prison. So she begged the prince to save her family. However, she herself was in the position of no more than a concubine. So of course the fourth prince ignored her request. But Elizabeth could not let it go. For three days and three nights she knelt in the rain, begging for forgiveness. Then he came to her and listened to her request. That's how the story was told to the whole continent. However, only Jack knew the true horror behind the words. In the palace, Elizabeth thanked the prince, saying that she would do anything for him. He pressed her against the wall and said that she had misunderstood that he could end her family with a snap of his fingers, although if she listened to him, everything would be fine. At that moment, the girl became his toy. Both the fourth prince and the emperor controlled her as they wanted. In this situation, the recognized wives could not stand aside. What happened was obvious to everyone. The fourth prince eventually lost interest in her, and Elizabeth literally became a hostage in the annex. Soon after, the Ballantyre house was destroyed. In order to take revenge, the protagonist had to become a demon. To destroy all the toolcans and everyone connected with them, the empress, the princess, the wife of the third prince, the wife of the fourth, the families who supported them, even distant relatives. Jack wanted to erase every trace of the Tolkens from the face of the earth. But now he thought that this was too horrible a future. He held his sister's hand here and now, and listened to her care for him, smiling back at her. This time he would definitely save her. After this meeting, Elizabeth returned to the house thinking about how much her brother had changed, because before he would have just taken it all in stride. Recalling what had happened and looking out the window, she hoped that it was all for the best, but the fact that the boy had used black magic worried her. With her sixth circle, she didn't feel any traces of dark magic, but her father's seventh circle would probably be more obvious. Finally arriving at her father's house, Elizabeth went into his office and asked him to fire Jack because he hadn't studied dark magic, because it was too difficult and the young man would clearly not succeed. Saying this, the girl thought that her father probably did not want the truth to get out in the open. After a pause, Elizabeth continued to say that the head himself knew perfectly well that Jack was not aiming for the title of head. Lowering her head, the girl concluded that this was a warning to her. The head froze at this insight, smiled, and replied that the girl was quite smart. Elizabeth had long ago realized what fate awaited her. The life of a toy created to increase the status of the house, and this situation was a warning to her. What could happen to Jack if she did not agree to follow the path laid out for her? The girl stood there realizing all this and listened to her father say that she knew very well that the younger one was not suitable for their family, so when he became an adult, the man would announce the death of his youngest son and send him away to live under an assumed name. This news made the girl happy. But the father added one more detail, that until then, she should not forget about her debt. And then also, this made his daughter gloomy, but she agreed. After reaching an agreement, the head said that it was still strange that Jack was able to defeat the older man who had the third circle. The girl turned pale at this news, remembering that moment in prison. Hearing the words that her father allowed Jack to be released, the daughter bowed and walked out the door, remembering her brother's offer. However, she knew perfectly well that she could not escape her fate, and this made her sob helplessly. The protagonist woke up in his cell. Because of yesterday, he had been dreaming about his past life all night. Exhaling a breath, the guy says to himself that maybe it's this place that causes nightmares. Suddenly, his attention was drawn to the voice of a guard who came in with the news that the young man was being released. Jack clearly did not like the fact that a simple guard was addressing him on a first-name basis. After a calm exhalation, the boy replied that it was a pity that he was leaving this place. It was quite nice. After that, he wanted to take his clothes, but the guard did not want to give them back. This made the young man think that this man was going too far in his attitude towards the son of the Marquis. 
Meanwhile, the guard himself boldly said that he had no clothes for the young man, so let him not bother with questions and leave. These words make Jack angry, and the boy approaches the guard, wondering if he thinks Jack is some kind of friend. Unexpectedly, the guard starts to backtrack, saying that he didn't mean it, but the protagonist was unstoppable. After this situation, Jack was heading home when suddenly his attention was drawn to Ron, who was looking at the guy in surprise. Then he began to fuss about whether everything was all right with the young gentleman. Inspecting the young man, the butler noticed a trace of blood because he began to cry from what Jack had experienced. Ignoring Ron, the young man looked around and noticed that there were too many guards. To which the butler said that there were 10 guards and one knight from the Iron Blood Squad. Looking at the knight who stood out, Jack concludes that he is the one and sympathizes with him. Because it was probably not in his dreams and plans to look after the little offspring of a rich man. It's sad to even look at this. And he knows 100% why Jack was in prison. While the protagonist was thinking about this, the knight himself, after listening to the report, approached Jack politely and asked him what happened in the cell. This politeness made the young man stunned. And the soldier, sweating nervously and bowing, said that he had received information that Jack had attacked a guard, broken his finger and gouged out his eye. Hearing this, Ron immediately began to defend the young pan arguing that he could not have done such a thing. But the knight, though trembling, continued to insist that he wanted to know why he had done so, even though he had no right to. Here, it was Jack who giggled, which puzzled the warrior. Covering his face with his hand, the guy began to say that using the word right in this situation was inappropriate. But then he thought that judging by the movements and posture, the person opposite him was at least of the fourth circle, so he must be the menace dog. The knight, angry at these words, was about to object. However, Jack interrupted him, saying that there was nothing wrong with talking to a dog like a dog. The man was only assigned to look after the third child. There were no other orders, so he would be the one to decide all the consequences. Therefore, you shouldn't even dare to talk about rights if he wants to get a promotion, and he begs Jack not to make a fuss. Realizing the whole situation, the knight just seems to agree with the protagonist. This gives the other a sense of victory. Turning around in the end, the guy says that enough talk, let the man deal with everything and come to report, and if he has any problems, let him complain to the Marquis. The guy himself is not even going to treat him like a knight, but rather like a chicken, so the soldier can squawk when he is called. After these words, the protagonist hurries Ron away and finally leaves, leaving the bewildered soldier behind. On the way, Jack's stomach growls and he tells the butler that he is hungry for meat today. Ron bows and says that he will cook it right away. After a while, the table was already filled with various dishes, which the young man happily tucked into. While enjoying his meal, Jack thanks his butler and praises his cooking skills, while Ron just pierced the young gentleman with his eyes. Noticing this, the guy says that if the man has something to say, then let him speak, not burn with his eyes. Sighing, the butler denies Jack's guess. Seeing his friend's excitement, the young man picks up a piece of meat on his fork and hands it to Ron, saying that they can eat together the portion is still large. With a sigh, the butler replied to this gesture that he could not share the meal with his master. But Jack did not want to accept the refusal. After giving up, Ron sits down at the table. He immediately asks how his sister is doing, to which the man replies that she is doing as well as ever. As the young man winds up the spaghetti, he says that his friend is not a fool and he knows Elizabeth's condition better than anyone. These words took Ron by surprise because he did not fully understand what Jack meant. Putting the food in his mouth and chewing it thoroughly, the young man continued to say that he would try to explain it in other words. Since his childhood, all his memories have been filled with Ron. When the young man had no worries, he would run to the kitchen to check if the butler was cooking something delicious. The man confirmed what he knew about it. Smiling, Jack said that there was something Ron didn't know and that he needed to clarify it. Then he asked if his interlocutor was a ninth round pick by any chance. The butler simply fell silent at this question. And Jack began to tell him that since Ron was on his mother's side, he had to know what she was like, unlike the boy who never had a chance to see her, because she died on his birthday. They say his sister is like her, which means she was a good person too. Listening to this, Ron just kept quiet. While Jack continued to say that his butler was trying to protect his lady, his mother had a ninth circle wizard in her retinue, and if this was the plot of a novel, the young man would complain that the story was not realistic, but it was all true. In his past life, Jack did not run away from home alone. He ran away with Ron and tried to escape from the guards sent by his father. 
When he turned around, he saw the Knights of the Iron Blood Squad, just like the one he saw today. The Marquis had sent them to kill his own son. The commander of the squad was a swordsman of the Ninth Circle. At that moment, Ron died defending his young master. All Jack could do was watch helplessly. The protagonist drank tea and continued to say that it was hard for him to accept that all this time his butler was a Ninth Circle wizard and belonged to his mother's retinue. However, Ron had to know that the woman was not ordinary, although even the Marquis did not know about it, so she did not tell the servant anything either. Now the boy could pretend that he did not know anything, but it was important for a young man to understand what kind of person his butler was. With his head bowed, Ron asked what his master wanted from him. Jack replied that he could trust only two people, him and his sister. Therefore, the man needs to protect Elizabeth. Hearing this, Ron says that the head's daughter is already a sixth circle wizard at 18 years old and is capable of protecting herself. Jack denies this on the grounds that his sister is too kind, even willing to die for others. However, Dying for family or honor is not a life worth living, and only the Marquis would like that. Since the young man is planning to leave for the academy tomorrow, he is not going to return here if everything goes well. Therefore, it is Ron who must stay with the girl for all four years, and after that he will be able to live his own life. The butler, excited by what he has heard, does not understand what it means to live his own life. Jack says that the man will be able to find what he likes, and not hide behind his third son. In four years, the young man will learn and protect his sister. Suddenly, their conversation is interrupted by a knock on the door asking for permission to enter. The young man is reluctant to let the guest in. A knight enters the room with a report that the guard has been treated and sent to the hospital. After listening to the knight, Jack asks if he has anything to add. The knight reluctantly begins to say that they found out that the guard had accidentally lost control of his blade and cut off his finger, and while in a state of shock he accidentally poked his eye out and you were frightened and ran away. Satisfied with this story, Jack offers the knight a treat like a mud of the marquee for a good job and a chicken. The man did not let the boy finish saying that his name was James Canner. Jack ignored this information and happily said that he was going to start fencing training, so he needed a wooden and real sword. Bowing his head, James replied that it was not his responsibility. The protagonist pointed to the man on the side with a fork and said that since he didn't like him so much, it would be a great chance to resolve all disputes. This turn of events made Ron jump out of his seat. Cantor, in turn, asked if the young man was serious. Jack replied that of course he was serious, especially since the boy's arms were quite weak, it would not be difficult for the knight to defeat him. Puzzled by these words, James asks if the boy really wants a man to become his teacher. But Jack just laughed and said that he had heard such nonsense only three times in his life, so let the chicken get his swords ready. Left alone, Ron wonders if Jack is okay, since the knight has the fourth circle, if the young man is confident in his abilities. Hearing this, Jack offers to bet on who will win, the chicken or him. Thinking about this proposal, Ron says that it is better to bet not on victory, but on how many bruises will remain on the young gentleman's body after the fight. Realizing that the butler is ready to bet, Jack asks what he can bet, but the man asks if the boy will really go to this fight? The protagonist frowns at this attitude because his friend does not believe in him and says that if the chicken hits him even once, Ron will win, and the loser will fulfill his wish. The dejected butler says that if the young gentleman wants something, he should just give the order. After all, he is only a servant in this house. Jack can hardly stop himself from laughing at these words and says that he has already said that there are only two people in this house whom he can trust, his sister, and, of course, his butler, and that's it. Trying not to show his joy, Ron notices that it is not nice to poke people with a fork. Seeing this expression on his friend's face, Jack says that he is telling the truth, he is not giving his men an order, but only asking. Hearing this, the man agrees, which makes the protagonist happy. Just at the end of their conversation, James came into the room and immediately knelt down and began to say that he had clearly overreacted. If the young gentleman needed an assistant, he would be it. So let him forgive his insolence. Looking at Cantor, the boy thought that too many people, like the guard, do not treat the young man with respect. However, indirect insults and direct violence are different things. James is obviously afraid of the consequences, so he gets down on one knee and apologizes. Having finished his thoughts, Jack says that they will go to a deserted place unless the chicken in front of him is afraid to lose. This behavior makes Cantor angry because he becomes absolutely confident. Jack notices the confidence of his future opponent and asks Ron if there is a deserted place. 
The man takes the young gentleman to the training room. While warming up, Jack says that he didn't even know they had such a place in their basement, so does Ron work out here? The butler denies it, saying that Jack's mother arranged this place for her children. This makes the guy wonder why he didn't know about it before. To which Ron replies that it's because the young gentleman has never practiced here. Looking at the basement, the protagonist notices that even though this place was not used, it is quite clean. Then, with a happy smile, he thanks Ron for cleaning it up. This makes the butler happy. Changing his face, Jack stretches out his hand to the chicken so that he doesn't stand there, but finally gives him the sword. They start with a wooden one. James hands the boy the sword. He immediately takes it and takes a stance. Cantor notices that his younger son knows how to hold a weapon. Jack smiles at this, thinking that if the chicken knew how many people he had killed in his past life, he would not be so happy. Then he thanked him for the compliment and finally started a fair fight by rushing to attack. James, in turn, easily blocked and deflected the young man's sword, thinking that a beginner is a beginner, so you need to be careful not to hurt the kid too much. Before he could finish the thought, the tip of the enemy's sword was at his throat. Jack stood holding his weapon right next to the knight's chin. Ron, who was watching the fight, dropped his jaw. Without lowering his sword, the protagonist said that if it had been a real fight, James would have been dead. Smiling with satisfaction, Jack looked at the puzzled canner who tried to understand how the third child of the Marquis knew such techniques. Does the boy really know how to handle a sword? Ron stood there wondering what it was that the knight was able to do to deflect the attack, but Jack managed to get close to his neck. The butler obviously did not think that a young gentleman of 14 was capable of such a thing. It should have happened differently. James was supposed to knock the sword out of the younger man's hands and end the fight with a complete victory. However, right now Jack is fighting on equal terms and his stance is excellent, his defense is correct, and if he had been given a real sword, the knight would have died long ago. Has something happened to the young gentleman? He has never been seen with a sword, let alone in training. Perhaps he has a talent? Although even for a genius, this is too much. While Ron was thinking about it, Jack stood there smiling contentedly and saying that the chicken was already in his 20s. Cantor confirmed that he was already 23. Then the younger man asked him at what age he started training mana. The man replied that he started manipulating mana at 18. Hearing this, Jack concludes that in five years James has received the fourth circle. Then he thinks that the fourth circle at the age of 23, with such late training, is a sign of talent. Using his ability, the guy decided to make sure of it. James had a seventh circle or even an eighth. A man could reach that level if he trained harder, and he could even get the title of Captain of the Knights. Throwing away the wooden sword, Jack went to the real weapon. Picking up one of the real swords, the boy thought that with such a talent, the chicken would have to be supervised by a child. The young man turned to his opponent saying that he was beginning to like him. Looking at the weapon, James warns that the young gentleman might get hurt. This warning makes the protagonist laugh. With a confident smile, Jack begins to say that he will give the chicken some advice, that there is a difference between confidence and vanity, and that what happened was clearly not an accident. These words make the veins in Canner's face stand out, and the man begins to get angrier and angrier, while Jack continues to provoke him by telling him to attack the chicken. Unable to contain his anger, James rushed at the young man. Seeing this, the boy thinks that this is the character trait that prevents James from developing. With such thoughts, the young man blocks the sword of the enemy, knocking it out of his hands and putting the blade to Canner's chin. Then he says with a satisfied smile that the chicken has died for the second time today. Surprised, James screams, asking how the guy did it. Lowering his weapon, Jack replies that he simply changed the direction of the sword during the attack. From this answer, the man simply turned pale, still not understanding how the boy managed to do it. At that moment, the young man said that it was just a higher technique and if necessary, he could show it again. Angry even more, James agrees, but this time he will also have a real sword. While the man was taking the weapon, Jack turned to Ron and told him that he had won the bet. With a calm sigh, the butler accepts defeat. The boy's desire was unchanged to protect his sister. Realizing the importance of this wish, Ron bowed saying that he would lay down his life to fulfill this cause. While they were talking, Canner had already come out to the site, saying that this time everything would be different. Jack began to fill his blade with mana saying that this time he had an interesting chicken, so he could add some mana as the boy would do the same. James agrees to the rules asking to attack. Jack immediately starts attacking his opponent with a slashing blow. Canner manages to block the guy's blow. However, the force invested in Jack's sword was too much. 
James can't stand it any longer and drops his weapon, falling to the ground. Stepping on his armor, the protagonist wonders if this is all the chicken can do. The defeated man says with the last of his strength that the young gentleman must have a third circle, because such strength is impossible with the first. At this point, Jack understood perfectly well how upset James was to lose the first round. But everything was much simpler. Usually, mana is distributed throughout the body to increase physical capabilities, but the guy directed it to one place. After such thoughts, the protagonist turns to the chicken and asks if he really wants to become an official. The latter does not understand what he is talking about, since he does not yet have such a status. Jack says that hunting dogs are quite loyal, so let James become his dog and serve under his youngest son. It will still be more interesting than the life of an ordinary knight. Cantor's face was filled with panic. The man finally dared to ask what was in it for him if he agreed. Exhaling, Jack begins to say that the man could have asked what he had to do first. However, the guy still tells him what the benefit is. If James becomes a dog, he will gain strength and power. Hearing this, the man immediately asks what his responsibilities will be. To which the young man replies that his duties are simple, to kill those who interfere and protect him. These words shocked not only Canner under Jack's foot but also Ron. James did not understand who he was supposed to kill. Raising his foot from the armor, the protagonist says that it should be obvious, and he is given only a day to let the chicken choose the right side. Nevertheless, the knight agrees to the third gentleman's terms. While doing the massage, Ron asked if the young gentleman was too carefree. He could hardly trust that knight. Holding his glass of juice and enjoying the massage, Jack agrees with his friend, saying that perhaps the chicken will report everything to the Marquis. This guest brings a smile to the protagonist's face. In turn, Ron says that now is not the time to smile. If it happens, it will only be to her advantage. If she finds out that the third gentleman is leaving tomorrow, she can do something, maybe even kill him. Jack replies that even if she does, she won't succeed. Several days have passed since the incident, and his brother is still afraid of water. Of course, the Marquis wants her younger son to die, but she cannot do it yet. Because the Marquis is now taking special care of Jack, because he needs the younger one to lead his sister. Therefore, the Marquis cannot kill the third child of the family in this situation. Continuing the massage, Ron asks if the boy is sure of his words. Can the Marquis allow him to do it? Jack replies that he is going to the academy anyway, so there is no point in killing him. The woman can only wound him, but not kill him. Many people tried to kill the protagonist, Lady Harpy, Lord of Orcs, Lord of Dragons, and no one succeeded. So how can an ordinary woman do it? The guy started laughing at these thoughts. After that, he thanked me for the massage and stretched his muscles. Putting on his robe after the massage, the guy turned to Ron and smiling sincerely said that if he did not want to die, it would not happen. The butler asked what was going on in the guy's mind. But the man smugly said that it was better not to know, and if he was so interested in what would happen, the man could follow him. Ron asked him if he shouldn't have gone with the young man from the beginning. He replied that the man was not allowed to go with him. That was an order. He would rather watch him from afar. The butler agreed to this plan. Jack was about to leave, but he remembered something. Ron immediately asked if the young gentleman needed anything else. The young man only asked that no one be allowed to come to him because he wanted to create a second circle. The puzzled butler asked if the young man really thought it was that easy. Smiling, the boy says that for him it is. This stuns his friend even more. Meanwhile, James was heading somewhere, thinking that these were clearly not first round skills, but at least third round. The young gentleman is certainly talented, but his request that the man become a tame dog is simply ridiculous. The guy has no support, for example, from the Count's menace and no personal knights. He is alone. Besides, his words were too strange for a child. All this must be reported to the Marquis about the hidden martial arts skills in their conversation in the basement. This is the opportunity to show off in front of the Marquis and the Marquis. No matter how talented the third gentleman is, he will never beat the Marquis unless he is a monster. The Marquis herself spoke to Elizabeth saying that her mother was a commoner, but left a chance for her to have a good life. Talent and the title of Archimage are not important. All a girl has is her beauty. This attitude made the girl obviously sad. Seeing this, the Marquis asked her not to be upset and offered her a glass of wine. Elizabeth politely refused on the grounds that she could not drink in front of the Marquis. The woman herself did not deny herself the pleasure. Then she continued to say that it seems that the eldest son of the Duke of Malone is interested in the girl, as is the middle son of the Duke of Ozenblatt, although the middle son will not be suitable. A woman will find the best match herself, 
so Elizabeth should take care of herself if she does not like anyone. The former immediately denied that she did not have such a person, to which the Marquis said that it was good because if there was, she would have to remove him quietly. And by the way, the younger one came up with something interesting, he tried to lure the knight to his side. It's even funny that Jack thought about this possibility, because James had long been on the side of the second son. The woman begins to laugh out loud at how Jack is trying to destroy them. At this point, Elizabeth sat thinking that it was because of her father and mother that her brother had such thoughts, so she needed to be more careful or their hatred for their youngest son would become even more serious. When she finished laughing, the woman said that it was good that the girl understood her. The Marquis herself will continue to look for a suitable partner for Elizabeth, so for now the girl can go her own way. And just in case, she repeats that if the girl starts dating a man behind their backs, something terrible could happen. Such pressure from her stepmother made Elizabeth's face look fearful, and she said that she understood everything perfectly. The woman smiled happily and said that dinner was coming up, so she should come down first. The dejected girl agreed to this proposal. It was already evening. The maids were setting the table for the whole family except Jack. While they were eating, someone burst into the room, surprising those at the table. It was the youngest son, who happily said that everything was fine in the country, so why was the atmosphere at the table so gloomy? Elizabeth began to panic at this appearance. While Jack himself had said that he was their father's third son, there should clearly be a place for him at the table. The family should have dinner together at least once. A few minutes earlier, Jack was sitting in his room creating a second circle, for which there were two main methods. The first is the distribution of mana throughout the body. This method helps to improve the properties of the body, increase senses, intelligence, and of course strength. The second method is to materialize mana by creating a formula. Fireball, ice arrow, demonic fire, and other types of magic. Ron is a ninth circle wizard. The knight is a fourth circle wizard. There are two reasons why people who use magic are divided into mages and knights. Jack is a knight. And of course, this means that he can also use magic. Gathering mana, he practiced creating a second circle. Looking at this, Ron said that it took him two months to create the second circle. Hearing this, the young man thought that usually the transition from the first to the second circle takes four months, but Ron managed it in two. He did not travel in time, it is hard to imagine how much effort the man made. Smiling, Jack praised the butler for such a quick result. The man said that it was strange to hear this from someone who had created the second circle in five hours. Not realizing what time it is, the guy asks Ron what time it is. Taking out his watch, Ron says that it is 5.48 in the evening. The guy started to get out of bed, surprised at the late hour. At this time, the butler says that it's dinner time, so he can cook a steak. However, the guy refuses, thinking that others should be eating dinner too. Then he decides to go to his family, just to tell them that he is leaving for the academy tomorrow. The maids nervously watch Jack enjoy his meal. Without finishing his chicken, he says with a satisfied smile that it is certainly tasty, but Ron's food is much better. This causes the Marquise's displeasure. Having eaten to his heart's content, the young man's attention is drawn to his father, who asks if his son has come to say something. Smiling smugly, the young man begins to say that there can be no other reason, he would not have come here for nothing. The Marquis, unhappy with the situation, says that he thought the younger man would be ashamed to show up uninvited, but the boy is here anyway. Jack replies that he shouldn't say such things about him, otherwise the head might spoil the atmosphere. The tension between father and son grew. In a panic, Elizabeth suggested that her brother go out and talk to her if he needed anything, but her father stopped her, ordering his son to speak here if he still had something to say. With a satisfied smile, Jack began to say that he would return to the academy tomorrow. He could not bear to be in such a terrible environment. The head agrees with his son's decision, although Jack did not need his permission. Standing up from the table, the boy turns to his brother and asks how he is. And is he still unable to drink anything because of his fear of water? Then he takes a bottle of wine, saying that Palin must be thirsty, even though his older brother has treated him badly all his life. But a brother is a brother. It's not water, it's wine, so he can drink it. Jack defiantly pours the wine on the table, which frightens Palin. Seeing this, the Marquis jumps up from her seat, angry that the little brat is making a scene. However, the protagonist simply ignores her and throws the bottle away, leaving a frightened Palin a worried Elizabeth and a damned angry mother who swore that she would definitely not forgive the bastard for what he did. Turning to her in the end, Jack mockingly said that he would look forward to seeing what she would do. 
While the Marquis was furious about what had happened, the maids could not believe that the young gentleman was capable of such a thing. But no matter what anyone said, Jack's night was calm, except for the spanking from his sister. Jack was heading to the academy, looking out the window at the scenery. The third son was on his way. However, the procession looked rather modest. The protagonist was already thankful that he could at least sit comfortably thinking about the fact that Regin, the guard who was riding alongside him, was a knight of the sixth circle and responsible for the procession, and was afraid to even look in Jack's direction. 100% the Marquis had given him a special order about her third son. On the other hand, James was riding along, scared no less than the first knight. The protagonist was brought out of his thoughts by the voice of his sister, who asked why she could not go with him. The boy replied that he would be fine, but Elizabeth said that the other's mother was clearly up to something, so it would be better if she spent. Interrupting his sister, Jack said that he would be fine, that changes were coming, it was true, but there was no need to worry. She knows that her brother is not going to die. With her head bowed, she accepts this fact. After traveling for several kilometers, Jack orders his sister to turn back. She agrees, but warns Jackie to be careful. At this time, Ron, no less concerned, asked the same question as Elizabeth. Noticing in his head that the butler now has the same expression on his face as his sister, the protagonist reassures his friend, reminding him of their agreement, which he has to fulfill tonight. Exchanging glances with the guard, Ron replies that he remembers everything. Hearing this, Jack orders him to finally leave, because his sister should not be left alone. Turning around, the butler asked the boy to be careful once again and rode away. When the man left the carriage, the young man thought that everything would be fine. Ron was to watch the procession from a distance, so he would witness what might happen. This is a gift for a faithful butler. While he was thinking about this, he began to fall asleep, and he did not deny himself such a pleasure. However, he slept under the ominous gaze of Reggie. Did you like the story and are you waiting for the sequel? Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the second part and like the video for the fastest release of your favorite story. Waking up in the middle of the night, the protagonist decides to find out why no one woke him up. Leaving the carriage, the guy sees the servants setting up camp. He concludes that they will spend the night here. Looking around the place, Jack notices James staring at him intently. At this look, the boy decides to respond with a smile, saying that this is the decision his chicken has decided to make. However, this is his choice, so there is nothing the young man can do about it. And what could he expect from a chicken anyway? With these words, Cantor goes to Reggie, who begins to say that since the boy has understood everything, there is no point in long speeches. Hearing this, the protagonist asks to explain to him what is going on here. In response, the guard says that every night during the entire trip to the academy they will set up camp. When Jack hears this, he pretends not to understand what the big deal is. However, the answer is given by Reggie's ominous grimace, saying that every time they set up camp, the boy's ribs will be broken. And when the time comes to move on, they will cure him with potions. And there is a separate order from the Marquis. She knows that Jack can make a circle of mana, so they are going to destroy it. Finishing his speech with a crazy smile, the guard makes the boy think that the destruction of the heart's mana circle is like death. Of course, it can be restored, but the chance of filling it with mana again is extremely small. In addition, due to the shock, there is a chance of remaining disabled for life. And they want to do this to the son of a marquis? The young man is brought out of his thoughts by Reggie, who continues to say that James has told him everything. The boy is not only good with mana, but also with a sword. This is why others may be mistaken, but in reality, the boy is nothing special. It is impossible to change anything with just a sword and mana, so let Jack not resist, or it will hurt. With these words, the guard begins to draw his sword with an evil smile. Looking at the servants who were waiting for the fight, the protagonist thought that this was a familiar atmosphere for him, as if he had returned to where he came from. But now he has experience from his past life. And no matter how peacefully the young man has lived these few days, the wounds in his soul still haunt him. Although it would be more accurate to say that the experience from the past will not disappear just like that. With these thoughts in mind, the boy checks to see if Ron can see him, and then begins to say that he spent 10 years in the mountains where he met a mentor and learned a lot from her. But when he came down after her death, he found out that a lot had changed. Valentier's family and their entire country collapsed, and he thought that he didn't care who died and why. The only thing he cared about was what happened to his sister. With these words, Jack pulls his blade out of his cane. But remembering his sister, he continues to say that Elizabeth is smart and talented. And he thought that at least she would be lucky with a husband, 
since her family didn't work out. If she was okay, maybe then the guy would forgive her. At these words, Reggie and the guards start laughing because the young man in front of them has gone crazy with fear. Their laughter is stopped by the confident step of Jack, who was already gathering mana around him in front of the soldiers and thinking that if he had pissed off the Marquis and the Marquis, then one broken rib might not fix the situation, and they certainly wouldn't be able to break his circle of mana. After these thoughts, with the words that great strength and outstanding talent can turn everything around and Jack will demonstrate it. The main character, having collected enough mana, begins to conjure up a storm. Looking at their youngest son, at that moment the guards felt in their gut that if they tried to kill the boy, they would die themselves. The tense guards watched as the young man in front of them, saying that a strong and destructive wind would destroy them all, attacked them in a second. Until that moment, the chicken was confident in the correctness of its actions. After all, choosing a second family owner with strong support was a smart decision. It was better than choosing Jack, whom no one noticed. But what happens now? At that moment, James felt as if time had stopped and this world had come to an end. The main character's sword broke from such a force as did the soldiers lying on the ground. Looking up at the sky, Jack tells Ron to come over. Coming out of the bushes, the butler asks what it was. Pausing and breathing tiredly, the boy says that it is a fencing technique he learned in a state of transcendence. It is one of eight, divided into four characteristics. The young man could explain in more detail, but it is unlikely that the man will understand. Looking at the gentleman's pale face, the butler says that he doesn't know much about his master, but it was more like a method of controlling magic than a technique. Agreeing with him, the boy turns toward the carriage and asks if Ron has a potion. Then he leans against the carriage, spitting blood, saying that it's nothing, he just needs a potion. The butler immediately takes a bottle out of his jacket. Jack empties it and closes his eyes with a cough from fatigue. Looking at this, Ron says that if he hadn't been there, the young master would have died. Smiling, Jack says that he would not have died. In addition, the boy knows that the butler always has a potion for an emergency that he will give to the boy first. This situation reminded the protagonist that in the past Ron had already given his potion to Jack instead of drinking it himself. When he returned to reality, the young man says that he was unable to say something, namely words of gratitude to his butler. For some reason, these words seemed difficult for him. He had clearly been a fool in the past. Hearing this, Ron said that the young gentleman knew what would happen in the future. Smiling, Jack confirms this and, getting to his feet, concludes that the potion was expensive since he recovered so quickly. Deciding to check on the guards, the protagonist headed for the bodies. Picking up one of the swords, the guy hung it on his belt. Seeing James, the guy says that the chicken is dead. He thought he could make something good out of it. Ron approaches and says that as a knight, Cantor made the right choice. Hearing this, Jack says that's why James and the chicken. One should not expect more. After examining the bodies, the protagonist turns to his butler and smilingly asks if Ron is not curious about the time jump. This question puzzles the man, and he says that if it's about the future of the Marquis, the Ballantyre family may indeed be destroyed. And judging by Jack's reaction, it will be truly terrible. Patting his friend on the back, the guy says that to tell the truth, he would like the butler to pretend that it didn't happen. However, if he is interested in something, he should ask. After these words, the young man smiles smugly, wondering if Ron would like to ask a question. The butler declines the offer. What is the reason for the boy's dissatisfaction with the man's boredom? Is he not even interested in learning about his future? Rubbing the back of his head, the butler says with satisfaction that he is still not so easy to kill. To which Jack immediately replies that Ron really died easily. After that, seeing the sadness on his friend's face, the young man says that he shouldn't be upset, and now he needs to rest. Entering the carriage, the boy immediately lay down on the couch. Meanwhile, Ron leaned over the soldier and closed his eyes thinking about the fact that the young man had killed 25 people in one attack. Although it was hardly an attack, he destroyed their hearts without touching them with a sword. How is this possible at all? Going back in time, I wonder what life was like then? And will everything be okay now? The protagonist is brought out of his sleep by the screams of a man who wanted to make sure that the potion had helped Jack. The sweaty boy replies that he could lose consciousness from the pain. Realizing the situation, Ron holds out a bag with the knight's belongings, which contained five elixirs, 63 gold coins, and 40 shillings. Looking into the bag, the young man is surprised that Menace's squad carries so much money. Looking at his master, the butler offers to drink the elixir, but the young man refuses. Then he gives three bottles for the one Ron gave him. 
The butler accepts them while Jack is already leaving the carriage. The man who follows him asks what they will do with the corpses. The boy replies that they will leave them here. The bodies will be torn apart by wild animals or someone else will clean them up. Hearing this, the butler says that if they do that, Jack will be suspected immediately. These words surprise the young man. So the man has to clarify that the young man might be suspected by the Marquis. As he packs the bag into his suitcase, the young man replies that he will let it be. There is nothing the Marquis can do anyway. Ron says that if he were the head, he would immediately call the boy in. The pleased young man offers to bet, but the butler refuses, saying that he doesn't want to lose anymore. Then, looking at his master, the man gets down on one knee saying that he really believes that the young master has his reasons. Smiling, Jack asks if anyone knows that Ron is here. The butler confirms this, saying that he used an illusion and that he is probably sweeping the street now. Hearing this, the protagonist thinks that illusion is a magic available to the ninth circle. Usually, those who can use it or at least recognize it work in the demonic forest, but one can never be sure. Because of these thoughts, the boy says that the Marquis might start questioning Ron about what happened. So if he feels threatened, let him say that it's all Jack's fault. And if the man feels threatened by the fact that the head wants to kill him, he should tell him. If Ron or his sister dies on the same day, the entire Marquis family will be destroyed. After these words, there was a pause in the air, which the protagonist dispelled by happily saying that this was a last resort, so there was no need to look at him so worriedly. Having calmed down a bit, the guy thought that he hoped everything would be fine. He would give the Marquis one last chance to become a real father to his sister. The young man's thoughts are brought out of his thoughts by the butler's question whether he really needs to go to the academy. Jack answers that the academy has its own rules. From the beginning of the semester, unless it is the death of a relative, you cannot leave. Ron said that he had to go. However, his face showed that he wanted to go with the young master. And the boy could see it perfectly, but it was too early for that. So the young man simply wished the man not to meet any monsters on his way back. The butler asks if this means that the next time they will meet is only four years later. Jack replies that he doesn't know. However, the main thing is that Ron looks after his sister. After the butler left, the protagonist began to think about the fact that it is possible to camp three times from the Marquis estate to the academy, but if you go by road, it will take four days, although it will be about the same on the mountain. Although it is impossible to say that the mountain path is harder. It is no different from a regular road. Besides, there should be a village nearby. Having finished his thoughts, the boy untied the horse from the common sled and began to climb on it, but he did not succeed at first. Finally, the young man complains about his short stature. Then he sets off on his way, reflecting on the fact that this night is rather quiet, considering what happened. The young man was not going to go to the academy right away. He is sure that it is now in its true form. Although he is ashamed of Ron and his sister, he needs to focus on his mentor, Valentine Milos, who brought him back to life, gave him the strength to take revenge, and turned him into a man who was considered a nobody before. And even if everyone has forgotten about it now, she is one of the strongest dark magicians. For those who remember, she is the most terrible memory. It had been a long time since the boy's heart had fluttered like that. Arbaloa. The province of the Viscount Arbaloa, a vassal of the Duke of Osimbol. Arriving in the city, the protagonist looked at the tavern thinking about whether he should stay here for the night. However, after seeing the smiling faces of children, he concludes that it is a good place. Entering the building, he sees people drinking, tables full of snacks, and a happy dog. Heading to the table, the young man hoped that he would not quarrel with anyone here. Sitting down at the table, a waitress immediately approached Jack, asking why their new guest had come here. Seeing the worker, the guy thought that she looked more like an adventurer. Then, handing over three shillings, he said that he wanted just water, food, and one room. He also left his sword by the horse, so if they would be so kind as to take it to the room. Taking one shilling out of three, the worker happily said that one would be enough, and she would bring him the famous Arbaloa apple pie and steak. And she could offer him milk or beer. Jack replies that he'll have milk. After that, the waitress leaves him with his thoughts that it's pretty good here. Although he is not a local, the girl did not try to get more out of him. Although it is clear now that it is still before the war. Looking at the dog, the young man jokingly said that this big guy doesn't even know what awaits him. Although there is happiness and ignorance. Suddenly, the protagonist's attention is drawn to a conversation at the next table, in which it is said that there is a rumor that this time they plan to get rid of all the demonic monsters. They even seem to be recruiting more mages to deal with them all at once. 
Although this probably makes no sense, since even Tolkien doesn't make decisions, and there are only 20,000 mana users. This conversation makes Jack think about the fact that he has already mentioned the Iron Blood Knights who were on a mission in the Demon Forest. By order of the king, knights were selected from the guard of each noble family to go hunting in the Demon Forest with the Iron Blood Squad. This huge forest is located on a high mountain range called the Grand Canyon. This neutral zone may seem ordinary to many, but it is home to ogres, orcs, goblins, elves, harpies, and even dragons. Troll blood is used to make potions, ogre tendons are used as bowstrings, and metal monsters, parex, serve as scrap metal for weapons and armor. Harpy feathers are used for women's jewelry, and elves are kept as pets because of their appearance. In the demonic forest, all these creatures are not a threat, so everything that happens there is stupid human greed. Although this time they will lose. The Iron Blood Knights lost one-third of all their soldiers, and knights from aristocratic families were also killed, a major defeat. Because of this incident, the Emperor will lose the support of the people and noble families. Probably from that moment on, the problems in the Imperial family would begin, and in about a year a civil war would break out. The boy is brought out of his thoughts by a man shouting that the Emperor is to blame for everything, and that he should not give power to a stupid man. The man's friend immediately covers the man's mouth so that he does not lose his head. The people in the tavern turn to hear the shout. While the protagonist just thought that many people had already lost their heads because of the words in the direction of the emperor. Suddenly, Jack's attention is drawn to the words about the third son of the Marquis, as if he had used black magic. And he wasn't even sent to prison. And who can you learn black magic from anyway? Black magicians are all extinct. He must have learned from some aristocrat. A worker finally came to the boy's table, wondering what made the young man so happy. Looking at the food, he realized that the gossip had made him laugh. Meanwhile, the waitress sits down at the same table as Jack and asks him to tell her what made him laugh, because they're all bored. Looking at her smiling face, the young man replies that it's nothing. It's just that this third son of the Marquis is obviously a big fool, judging by what people say about him. To this the girl replies that all people are like that gossiping about things they could not see or hear. Hearing this, the guy asks how the girl judges people. Smiling, the worker says that she must see for herself. The happy protagonist says that sometimes gossip is true. These words amuse the waitress. At that moment, the young man himself took a piece of pie and, having bitten off a piece, concludes that the pie is not as tasty as Ron's, but it is also not bad. The young man's meal is interrupted by the girl's words that she still thinks that if we judge that the third son of the Marquis is a pretty good person in life, then the gossip was lying. The surprised protagonist looked at the girl again, this time noticing her scars on her face, her muscular body, and the mercenaries around her, and at the gesture of the worker handing him a sliced pie, asked if she was the leader of the Adventurer's Guild. The waitress was surprised at first, but then just smiled. At this point, the guy put a piece of pie in his mouth thinking that he had asked this question for a reason. There are many laborers in this village who are looking for a way to earn money. They can join the local guard, be detectives when they need to find a cat, or become hunters and catch a monster. Such tasks are issued in the Guild of Adventurers of any province. That is why such guilds usually offer accommodation. After finishing the pie, the young man said that the girl seems to have a lot of free time since she serves in a tavern. The head of the guild starts to complain that the building next door belongs to the guild, but there is little work there, so she spends more time at the tavern. She also needs to live on something. Hearing this, Jack thinks that he was right. This place is a kind of cover for the Adventurer's Guild, and he is known as a disgrace to the Marquis family. Jack's life story is a common tale for local mercenaries over a beer. But how did she manage to recognize the guy? Are the guild masters really that good? A few minutes earlier. The protagonist arrived at the village. At the entrance, he was stopped by a guard who asked him why he had come here. The guy showed them the coat of arms of the Marquis of Ballantyre. The guards immediately bowed and led him through without any questions. So now she learned about him from the guards. Putting a piece of steak to his mouth, Jack says that no matter how important the information is, it is dangerous to contact unverified sources. The waitress is pleased with his concern. Smiling, the young man says that so far, Despite all the rumors, she treats him better than his brother or those knights. The joyful girl thanks him and extends her hand and introduces herself as Jane Arbaloa, the master of the Arbaloa Guild in Arbaloa. After shaking hands and looking at the girl, the guy thinks about the fact that her name is the same as the name of the village. That's why he asks if she is the first or the second. 
Rubbing the back of her head, Jane replies that she is the third. Her older brother is the local lord. Drinking milk, the young man was surprised that aristocrats were doing this. Wasn't the girl supposed to be married off since she was an aristocrat? Continuing to smile incessantly, the waitress said that she would be happy to, but her family would never sell her to anyone. These words made the boy feel bad that his family was not like that. Meanwhile, calling Arnold's dog to her and taking him in her arms, Jane asked what the Marquis's son was doing here. Unguarded? Picking up the next piece of steak, the young man replies that the house of shame doesn't need a guard. These words puzzle the girl. Then she says with admiration that it is strange. The young man is not like the rumors about him. Jack interrupts her saying that he needs an escort. He needs five people with experience in camping and good cooking skills. And the payment will be two gold pieces in advance and three when they get there. This generosity made Jane's heart grow fonder. While the protagonist was thinking about the fact that usually only 30 shillings per person are paid for escort, imperial money is quite simple. 100 pennies equals one shilling. 100 shillings equals one gold piece. After finishing the meal, the boy thanked them for the food. While the girl had already said that everything would be ready by morning and the young man would pay for food and room separately, taking his pouch, the young man took out three gold pieces and said that he would give them if he had horses and a carriage. Looking greedily, Jane handed over the key, saying that the young man should not worry. There were experienced hirelings here. Taking the key and heading away, Jack thought that with such a guild master, he could not worry about the welfare of the village. When he got to the second floor, the protagonist went to his room and immediately fell on the bed. He wanted to take another bath, but the nap was stronger. So he fell asleep. The protagonist was in a cave and was crying under the gentle light of the moon. And he heard a woman's voice saying that does this unfortunate child want to live his whole life in weakness? Jack just shook his head. Then the woman in chains continued to say that being good is not bad but being weak is a sin. The boy needed to change. With these words, the stranger extended her hand to the young man. Deciding to change, Jack took the woman's hand, and she threw herself into his arms, saying that from now on he should call her mentor. Suddenly, the protagonist woke up from this dream with tears in his eyes. It was already dawn outside. Jack was just lying on his bed when Jane burst into the room, which he clearly did not like. The girl announced that everything was ready. Meanwhile, Arnold jumped to the boy and licked him dry. Still sleepy, the young man goes downstairs where his head meets him, happily saying that the boy had a good night's sleep. She had also prepared a wonderful carriage and people with great experience in escorting him, among whom stood awkwardly two men who had spread rumors about the third son last night. One of the men held out his hand and introduced himself as John Doe, captain of the Fire Ant Squad and escort of the third son to the Stone Mountain. The boy looked at his new acquaintance thinking about the fact that the name John Doe is given to unidentified corpses. Then he shook the man's hand, noting that he had an interesting name. Realizing that the deal was already done, John began to explain the plan, saying that it was a long way to the Stone Mountain. There will be several small settlements along the way, so they plan to camp twice in secluded places. They will have two excellent cooks with them, and everyone is also very good at setting up camp. After hearing this and yawning, Jack asks if he has to do anything to which Doe smiled and said that he wouldn't have to. Having finished the conversation, the guy gives the order to leave because he's already tired. Heading for the exit of the building, the young man turned to Jane and said that the squad was really experienced, to which she enthusiastically gestured okay. Jack himself thought that this would have been enough for an ordinary mercenary. And even though his body is weaker than before, his senses and eyes are as sharp as ever. Ron is now in the ninth circle, and although he hides his powers, he is hardly an ordinary person. But there is also a mercenary with the eighth circle, so maybe he has potential. Having finished thinking, the guy said to the head of the guild that they would see each other again, to which the girl offered to drink a mug of beer next time. Smiling, the young man replied that it would be on her and left Jane waving goodbye. The carriage set off on its way. The protagonist was lying on the roof enjoying the beautiful weather and his health, which had improved since yesterday. Noticing John's look, the young man met his eyes. Then he turned to the hired man on the other side of the carriage, puzzling him, and asked if the man knew who he was. The excited adventurer replied that the boy was an aristocrat, and the master said that the young man was traveling the world. Hearing this, Jack decides to ask his interlocutor a question, which makes him even more worried. Taking a watch out of his pocket, the young man threw it into the hands of the hired man, asking if he knew what it was. Gently holding it in his hands, 
the adventurer replied that it was the coat of arms of aristocrats. Deciding to add to it, Jack says that somewhere in the distance is the estate of the Marquis of Ballantyre, and their damn house will soon be destroyed, so this is their coat of arms. Such words shocked the accompanying persons. The guy himself continued to say that he had heard that this family had a complete loser who had even been imprisoned recently. This attitude makes the man tremble. Looking at the hired man, Jack thought that they finally realized who he was and that this was the only way to explain everything. After a short reflection, the young man continued to say that the rumors that he had been imprisoned for using black magic were true. Listening to this, the adventurer tried to apologize. But the protagonist was enjoying the conversation, so he continued to say that he did know a little bit of black magic. With these words, the guy began to think that it was not surprising, since his mentor was one of the best black magicians in the world. And although he is a swordsman, it is impossible for him not to know about black magic. After these thoughts, the guy continued to tell the man that there is no point in using black magic because there are fists. When he was done with one guy, he suddenly pointed his finger at the other, scaring him and asking why he just stood there and did nothing when his friend said that. Don't they know what happens for swearing at aristocrats? Doesn't he feel sorry for his third son? Everyone present at that moment was confused, all except John Dell. Looking at the captain of the squad, Jack thought that probably only John was told about the situation by the guildmaster and not everyone else. Turning back to his companion, he patted him on the shoulder, saying that now it was all in the past. They had a few more days to be together. The pale hired man agreed with the young man's words. Night came. Dinner was being prepared on the fire, and one of the men in the squad began to say that he now knew for sure that gossip was just that. Gossip. These words puzzled Jack. The mercenary clarified that the guy did not look like an ordinary aristocrat. Ordinary aristocrats are afraid that an extra drop of water might fall on them and spoil something. But the young man was not like that. He even washed the dishes after himself. The young man was a little surprised by these words. Sitting down to eat, Jack thought that the beef pie tasted better than Jane's apple pie. Yorkshire pudding, pie, sausages. He would definitely need to hire them to work in his kitchen. Even Ron with his cooking is out of the picture. After finishing dinner, the young man thanked them for the food and asked who was on duty tonight. The already slightly drunk and hired hand said that they would be drawing lots, and if the boy wanted to, he could participate. Making a face, Jack replied that little children need a lot of sleep to grow up well. And if he didn't grow up, the man would have to take responsibility. Waving his hand away, the hired man said that then there was no need to do it. The fire continued to crackle and then, out of boredom, Jack decided that they needed to tell stories and he would start first. The boy asked if they ever wondered how many dragons there were in the world. To which one of the men asked if the founding emperor hadn't destroyed them all. And then Jack began to say that this is indeed what the founding myths say. In a nutshell, it says that the founding emperor, Julius Teslane, together with two comrades, killed all the dragons that inhabited the western continent and built the Teslane empire here. Over time, the empire grew smaller and smaller and could not be compared to the Tolkien Empire in the neighborhood. This is the truth that everyone knows. But in fact, there are still two dragon lords in the Black Sea, a small dragon in Tolkien Castle, five dragons in the Forest of Monsters, eight of which the young man knows personally, polymorphs, and sixteen living dragons. When Jack finished the story, he thought about how hard it was for them to believe. Usually dragons are only mentioned in legends and myths. No one has ever seen them in reality. After finishing his thought, the guy smiled and continued to say that dragons do not come near people because they are bound by an oath that prevents them from approaching places that would threaten their lives. After hearing this story, John clarifies that the emperor did not kill dragons. The protagonist answers that the emperor did not kill them all, but found a way to negotiate. Although it would be more accurate to say that everything worked out thanks to his two comrades, whose names are lost in history. After these words, there was a silence, which was broken by Doe asking what the dragons were doing now. To which Jack replies that in fact their continent is not the only one in the world. In addition to the western one, there is an eastern one across the Black Sea. The little dragons have a lot to do, but the dragon lords have one mission, to protect the border in the Black Sea. The young man is not sure himself. The border was created many hundreds of years ago and divided the western continent from the eastern one. All dragon lords have to defend the border. Although I wonder what the dragon world looks like on the eastern continent. There was a pause in the air that was interrupted by the laughter of the squad. One of the men hugged Jack, saying that the guy was a great storyteller and they just needed such a companion. At that moment, 
The protagonist simply smiled and thought that he did not expect to be believed. Jack got up and went to the carriage. When asked if he was going to bed, he replied that he was going to wash and change his clothes. The guard immediately jumped up to offer his help, but the young man refused, saying that he could do it himself. As he climbed into the water, the young man reflected on the fact that these stupid hired hands did not believe his story. And even though they didn't believe him, they didn't need to laugh. Then the question is why did the boy allow them to laugh at him? Is he really the main character who has to hide his powers? Boring. Now we only need to worry about John Doe. Maybe he's a spy for the Tolkien Empire. He's suspicious, and his behavior raises even more questions. This whole situation looks like a big puzzle. The guy asked for good hirelings, but among them was the owner of the Eighth Circle. Eight circles is a lot. The captain of the Iron Blood Squad also has eight. In other words, such a cadre would have been torn off with arms and legs, but he is simply the captain of some unknown unit. I wonder if there's a reason for that, though there are more important things than John. With these thoughts in mind, Jack touched his body, which immediately began to glow, and continued his thought that he had already recovered a bit thanks to the rest in the carriage and the elixir. There should be no problems now. In any case, the young man should go to his minor. However, if the man does turn out to be a spy for the Tolkien Empire, it is better not to take him with him. You will have to ask him directly. Having finished bathing, the boy returned to his squad. Holding his sword, Jack said that he had an urgent matter. The protagonist looked up and pointed the tip of his sword at the captain, saying that he was to blame for the boy's experiences. How can a person with eight circles work as a mere hired hand? The young man is going to an important place, and he is not going to bring a person who is hiding something. One of the hired men could not believe what he heard. Raising his hand to calm down, Doe said that he was indeed in the eighth circle, but that didn't change anything. Jack said that he had told an interesting story, and now he wanted to hear John's story. Let him tell him who he is and what he is doing here. After listening to the young man, the man asked what would happen if he refused. Smiling, the boy replied that Doe would die. Turning his attention to the cook, the young man began to suspect him, and then, to the captain's surprise, he even mentioned the guild master. The mention of Jane made John angry, and Jack asked if the man was not interested in whether the boy would treat the girl to a beer before killing her. Now the situation was getting interesting, wasn't it? At this turn of events, Doe only cackled. Looking at him, Jack thought about how he had gotten this far, but the man was not using magic. He wondered if it was on purpose or if he was up to something. But it's for the best for him, because the guy would have killed him right away. With these thoughts in mind, the guy said that he was not in control, so John has two options. To die, or to stay alive. He is given one minute. With these words, the main character smilingly waited for an answer. Earlier in the day, at Jane's Tavern. The guild master standing behind the counter told Doe about her third son, and that his family had almost abandoned him, but he was not as rumored. The boy's eyes showed that he was hiding a lot. The young man asked for an escort, so it's better for the man to find out what's going on. Perhaps he will be able to change their lives. Recalling this conversation and the way Jane held his hands, John began to think that Jack was really not like the rumors about him. But looking into those eyes, he couldn't tell that his family hated him. What to do? And then there is this aura around the boy, as if the man became a deer that met a lion. All the sensations just screamed danger. Standing in front of Jack, John thought that the situation was rather strange. How did the boy even realize that he was in the eighth circle? Did Jane say something? No, she wouldn't. She wouldn't have said anything even if the boy had asked. Meanwhile, Jack said there were 40 seconds left, to which Doe said that the young man had just said that he was in his eighth lap. So would he be able to win? Jack's look changed. Looking into the eyes of his third son, John did not understand why they were so thirsty for blood. At that moment, the man doubted whether the boy in front of them was really a child and began to think about what to do. Could he somehow get out of it? Or should he tell the whole truth? What should he say? The man had spent his entire life as a mercenary, and now all the choices he had made were coming back to him. The man has always been lucky, so now he decides to rely on his intuition. At that moment, Jack announced that time was up, and now he would have to kill John. However, the mana collection is interrupted by Doe's words, which surprised the guy. The mercenary began to say that he could tell him what was happening to Jane. Agreeing, the young man lowered his sword, deciding to listen to the man. His story was simple. A love story between an aristocrat and a commoner. You can hear them everywhere. When he was 19 and in his seventh circle, he met Jane. They fell in love at first sight and have been inseparable ever since. Now it's clear why she hasn't gotten married yet. 
After listening to Jack, he began to think that even though it was a connection between a commoner and an aristocrat, he could become a pillar of Tesla with his eighth circle. It is strange that the man continues to work as a hired hand. He looks ordinary. Although given Jane's character, it's safe to say that her family is not interested in power as a result of marriage. When Jack finished his thoughts, he said that he could not believe that this was all because such a simple story was easy to make up. Using his eyesight, he asked if they remembered the story of the dragons. I wonder what the Tolkien Empire did with the dragons? John replied that he could not know about mythical creatures. Smiling with satisfaction, Jack began to say that everyone knows that those who carry ten circles of magic in their hearts are called masters. However, even masters do not know that there is something more in this world. Monsters who use their souls, not mana, as their power, transcendence. In two years, the captain of the Knights of the Tolkien Empire, Heinz Begerman, will become a master and be named the strongest knight on the continent. He will help the forgotten stories about transcendence become a reality again. The funny thing is that he will never become one himself. He will replace half of his blood and bones with dragon bones, and going crazy on this, he will become half human and half dragon. And by the look on your face, it's pretty clear that this is not a fun story at all. After hearing this, John asked how it was connected to what was happening now. To which Jack continued to say that there is one dragon in the Tolkien Empire. And although they are almost immortal, you can't do many experiments with one dragon. Therefore, the Empire sends its subordinates to other countries to gather information and find other dragons. Hearing this story, Doe started laughing, saying that it sounded like a story from a novel. So he told the guy to tell it to the other mercenaries. Maybe they would bite. Seeing the man's reaction to his story, Jack thought that it was too early to say that Doe was a spy. The man asked if the young man's doubts about the spy had been dispelled. The boy said yes, and that he would be waiting for an invitation to the wedding. Suddenly, sensing something, the protagonist quickly turned, pulling out his sword and putting it to the throat of the man who was trying to get his weapon. Angry Jack said that since he was the first to suspect the man, he would save his life. The young man then grabbed John by the collar, adding that this was his last warning. If Doe dared to do anything to him, the guy would turn everyone, including the man himself, into dust. The people in the group started to worry and tried to stop the argument. Seeing the reaction of the mercenaries, Jack thought about how he thought they had begun to trust each other, but with this situation he pushed them away again. Well, nothing can be done about it. The relationship between employer and employees is always like that. While he was in the carriage, John's colleagues asked him what he would do now. He wouldn't stay here with the Eighth Circle, would he? The man also said that two years ago he had a fourth lap. Doe confirmed this. With a sigh, one of the mercenaries wanted to take offense at the lie, but changed his mind. After all, John would make a good captain. Instead, the man said that perhaps the captain should become king of the mercenaries with his eighth circle. Rubbing the back of his head, Doe thought that this was a rather stupid title, and there were four masters among the mercenaries. With those thoughts in mind, the captain simply said he didn't want it. The cook, who was still standing on the sidelines, asked excitedly if what they were saying was true. John confirmed it. After calming down, the guy said that of course it was shocking news, but he would take it. Everyone has their own skeletons in the closet. But then why didn't the captain do anything in that situation? Doe did not answer, thinking about the fact that his hands were still shaking with fear. He felt as if he was facing death. Any more, and he would have peed his pants with fear. This third son is interesting, though dangerous. The whole continent is on edge right now because there is a struggle for the throne in the Tolkien Empire. If spies and dragons appear in this situation, it will only get worse. So we need to find out as much as we can about the guy. A few days later, sitting in the carriage, a smiling Jack offered to listen to another story. The surprised hirelings could not even think of what it would be about this time. Then the young man asked what the men knew about the orc lord who lived in the magical forest. The captain replied that they knew almost nothing except that the Lord had the Ninth Circle. The enthusiastic boy corrected his interlocutor, saying that the orc was probably in his tenth, but it was impossible to know for sure now. Anyway, this will be a story about the past. If we count in imperial time, it would be about what happened 23 years ago. Did the men even know that the Lord was very fond of weapons and even had a relationship with harpies? The not-so-interested mercenaries unanimously said they did not know. Then Jack went on to say that it was difficult because it is generally accepted that orcs and harpies don't get along well. Moreover, they are almost on the verge of war. However, the boy thought that the mercenaries who roam these neighborhoods for money should know something. These two races are considered the strongest in the magical forest. They are even called the defenders of the forest. 
There is one reason why they were given these nicknames. It's simple. They are very strong. In general, it is strange to hear that the Orc Lord and the Harpy Lady are in such a relationship. In fact, at first they were not enemies, but just neighbors. At that time, Blackman became the Orc Lord and began to increase his power. However, problems began five years later. When everyone found out about Blackman's relationship with the Harpy Lady, humans, harpies, orcs, all races end up going for the same thing, power. They want it. Some harpies and orcs wanted to overthrow their lords. Of course, the coup operation was supposed to be secret. But in the end, their stupid plan failed. And the lords still rule. After hearing this story, John asked why relations between the races hadn't improved. Jack replied that after the end of the rebellion, Blackman and Vilia decided that their peoples were more important than love. There was silence in the carriage. They began to think about whether this story was true. However, the man was sure that for decades harpies and orcs had not been as dangerous as they were now. Since when did these two races begin to grow in strength, and ten years ago they were first called stronger? John's thoughts were interrupted by Jack, who continued his story by saying that the harpies were able to steal and copy the secret techniques of orcs fighting, and the orcs learned elementalism from the harpies. This is how the largest races inhabiting the forest were able to learn each other's secret techniques. Blackman and Vilia contributed to this process. After that, the two races became distant from each other and became the main ones in the magical forest. Perhaps later, if the captain meets orcs or harpies, he should tell them this story. Then maybe they won't kill the man right away. Not knowing whether this is true or fiction, Doe decides to pretend to believe the story. After that, he offers the young man some meat which the man gladly accepts. Meanwhile, at the estate, one of the Marquis's subordinates reported that the entire guard accompanying the third son had been found near the province of Arbaloa. They conducted an investigation, and most likely they were killed by high-level magic. This information made the head worry, thinking that it really happened when there were no Knights of Iron Blood. Could it have been the Emperor's actions? Or the Duke? And if not them, then who? A personal investigation was needed. Having finished thinking, the Marquis orders Hansel Eyes to find the culprit. The boy replies that he will obey the order. Returning to the topic, the Marquis asks why the report did not mention anything about the younger man. Did he survive? The young man says that Jack was not among the corpses and may have escaped. Hearing this, the man says that in that case, his son must know something, so let Gonzalez use all his strength to find out. As the young man was heading for the door, he stopped when he heard the head say that the man thought his son was useless but it turned out to be the opposite. The young man gave the Marquis a determined look and then left the room. The next day, at the beginning of the mountain range, the protagonist held out a pouch. Opening it, John saw gold coins and exclaimed that there were too many of them. Smiling, Jack said that ten gold coins with the elixir would be enough for him, and the rest was a tip. Besides, he had fun on the way, and let Doe forgive him for his suspicions. And now it's time to say goodbye. Let them be careful on their way. After saying goodbye, the boy saw that the mercenaries were still standing, so he asked what had happened. The captain replied that he might have crossed the line, but he wanted to say that the work of a hired hand was not so bad. The man doesn't know everything, but he says that he is sure that he is the third son, abandoned by everyone. He has seen the end of many such people, so. The young man adds to the hired man's sentence, saying that in other words, the captain wants the boy to become a hired man. Taking the young man by the shoulders, John said in all seriousness that, as he had said, being a mercenary was not such a bad job. If you don't go on dangerous missions, you can see the whole world and make money. After listening to his interlocutor, Jack pointed his finger at the people behind the man and said that maybe others didn't understand, but that night the boy could have killed the man if he wanted to. Having said that, the young man thought that John should know. The boy might not be an eighth circle magician, but the man must have felt the closeness of death. Meanwhile, Doe said that he knew exactly what had happened that night, and that was why he was asking. The young gentleman did not yet realize the extent of his powers, and the man himself no longer cares about what happened. In a world where everything is decided by whose sword is sharper, many people hide their strength and intentions. Therefore, in general, it was the captain's fault. The happy guy expressed his gratitude for such words. Then he asked Doe to bend down and said that he would tell only John about it, because he seemed special to him. In a few years, a great trouble will come to the western continent. That's why the man had better hide. Now, the captain won't understand what I'm talking about, but let him remember these words, because it will be a very serious disorder. Also, 
Do not let Do sell himself for a few gold pieces. Money is important, but not more important than life. Smiling, the hireling agreed, and then Happy Jack patted his escort and said that the hireling was now free. The protagonist was about to leave, but he was called by Do, who wanted to know what the young gentleman's name was. This curiosity surprised the guy, and he said that the man already knew the young man's name. However, he could remember it as Jack. And since the young man introduced himself, he should let the captain introduce himself. A little nervously, the man said Dinazismo. Repeating his name to remember it better, the protagonist happily asked to meet him again. After the guy left the squad, using magic, he quickly reached the target. Jumping down from the cliff, the tired guy wiped his sweat looking into the distance and saying that he was getting close. Carefully descending from the cliff, the young man continued to resent his small body, because of which he could not jump as far as he would like. Having reached the entrance to the cave, the young man entered it, lighting the way with his magic. When he reached the end, he found himself in front of a large monolith, thinking that he had reached his destination. Behind this wall is his minor. In the past, the young man found this place by accident. In fact, in the past, all his thoughts were that he wanted to leave his family. With these thoughts in mind, the protagonist opened a bottle of blue liquid and poured it on the wall. After that, he took out his sword and put it in his palm and made a fist. A small sacrifice was needed. In the past, before he returned at the age of 17, the protagonist simply hid and ran away. Having lost Ron, he had nothing else to do. Throwing away the dagger, the guy still could not kill himself because he began to cry bitterly. They fell on the wall, mixing with blood. A second later, the monolith creaked and a hidden passage to the cave began to open before the young man. This was a great success for Jack. By now, the boy was ready for what was to come. Confidently walking along the hidden part, the young man reached the stairs leading to the bottom. Going downstairs and rewinding his wound, he could not understand why he was so worried. But it was probably because more than ten years had passed since their last meeting. Finally, Jack went down to the end and went to the woman, sweating profusely. Seeing her, the young man dropped his suitcase from his hands. In front of him was a shrunken, shackled copy of the former great dark sorceress. Looking at her face, Jack wondered if it was possible to make a living person immortal. Everyone in this world wants to live as long as possible. Orcs, dragons, emperors will all die sooner or later. It's natural and right. And for a woman, too. Yet his mentor has been living for 400 years thanks to the separation of soul and body. Magic is what keeps us connected. The problem is that this process will also come to an end. In her previous life, the woman lived another 10 years after the meeting. However, this time everything will be different. In this life, they have 13 years to live. The protagonist's thoughts are interrupted by a woman's voice who could not understand what the young man was saying. But the boy was already glad to hear his mentor after so many years. The shackled doll asked who he was, to which the young man offered to guess. However, the woman did not want to be patient and said that she would not ask twice. Falling on one knee, the happy boy began to talk about how his wonderful mentor used to be so rude. He missed her very much. Looking at him with a haughty look, the doll said that she didn't even know him, but he knew her. The young man confirmed this, thinking that he could not forget her. The time they spent together cannot be called an illusion. However, of course, only the boy remembers everything. With these thoughts in mind, Jack said that Valentine Milos, the heroine of their world who ended the era of honor and began the era of humanity, was in front of him, and he was her student from the future. This information made the woman think, so she said that if he was from the future, he should know that she doesn't like predictions. Continuing to be happy, the guy replies that he certainly knows that. Any prediction is subjective from the point of view of the person making it. Hearing this, Valentine orders the child from the future to answer her. If in the future there really was a child in his life, well, what would his answer be in such situations? Embarrassed, Jack replied that in such a situation, his mentor would order him to get out. Milos was irritated and said that the boy was good at guessing, so he could open his own fortune-telling tent. The young man tried to say something else, but only heard her say that she was nothing to him. With a smug smile, the protagonist began to get up from his knees, thinking that everything was the same as before. Then there was nothing to be done about it. It remained exactly the same as in the past. With these thoughts in mind, Jack pointed his blade at the doll, apologizing for having to go so far. The main character was gathering mana around his blade. When Valentine saw this, she realized that the boy was using an aura. Continuing to collect mana, the young man said that he realized he was behaving wrongly, 
but his mentor would be able to punish him later. Realizing what her guest was going to do, the woman tried to warn him that if he broke the chains, then. The boy interrupted her saying that he knew what would happen. He would break them and everything would collapse, but he had no choice. With these words, the young man rushed straight towards the chain sorceress. He did something that clearly surprised the woman. Julius Teslane, whom everyone calls a hero, locked her up here. He promised that he would return one day. However, this traitor did not keep his word. Ten years, twenty years, fifty years. Time passed and the woman finally realized that she was abandoned forever. So now Jack swings to free the captive, frightening her a little, but still cuts the chains. In the silence, the shackles begin to crack and finally break, releasing the woman who is surprised and says that the shackles were made of dragon bones. How could this guy even do that? In flight, Jack catches the woman and holds her on his arm, saying that he is not like Julius Tesla. And he proves it not with words, but with actions. These words almost bring Valentine to tears. However, there was no time to waste, as pieces of the cave were already falling from the mountain. Pointing at them, Milo said that the walls were beginning to crumble. Ordering his mentor to grab hold of him, the boy noticed the stones and, gathering mana, began to say that the land on which he was standing belonged to him alone. Therefore, let nothing on his land block his path forward. The boulders that were falling on the young man stopped. Looking at this, Valentine thought about what the young man had called one of the four basic defense techniques, the mountain of the four great elements. Meanwhile, Jack gathered his strength and struck the ground with his sword, which immediately cracked. The boulders that were supposed to fall on his head at the same moment went the other way. At that moment, a light appeared in the center of the cave, which then became a big explosion, destroying the entire dungeon. Continuing to hold on to the boy, Valentine asked who he was. After a pause, Jack smiled and said that he had already told her he was her student. Letting go of the sword, the young man sat down in front of Milos, who asked how a young man could have such strength at such a young age. The boy replied that for her student, such powers, even if he is from the future, are nothing. And for the next 13 years, they would explore the world together. Looking at her savior's face, Valentine stretched out her hands and touched his face. At that moment, Jack thought that this was the way a woman always checked whether a person was lying. Although he is not sure that this technique is accurate. Letting go of the guy's cheeks, Milos asked if her savior was really from the future. To which Jack replied that he had rather return to the past. Finally, the woman believed the protagonist and he smiled and finally fell down from fatigue. Sitting on it, Valentine began to say that it was strange to start their relationship with so much strength. And does the guy really think they can work together after what happened? The exhausted young man replies that if he hadn't done it, she wouldn't have believed him. Therefore, he sees nothing wrong with being friends as mentor and student. Looking at him, Milos notices that despite the pain, the boy can still argue. Smiling, the young man says that she taught him that. And by the way, his name is Jack. And he hopes they will work well together in this life. Five days later, the province of Osenville. Sad Jack was wondering why he and his mentor, who had been by his side all this time, had not spoken for five days. With these thoughts in mind, the young man asked if the woman was still thinking, but he received only silence. Not hearing a word, the young man asked if the mentor was not paid for her words. Then Valentine finally said that at first she could not even imagine that the young man was from the Tesla Empire. She also didn't understand how he could control soul magic at that age, to get such power. The woman does not finish the sentence, wanting the boy to finish it, who understood perfectly well that if he did not say anything, his mentor would hit him like in his past life. That's why he said that there are powers that only a few people have. Milos confirms this, but says that the boy has thousands of murdered people in his soul. Smiling, Jack said that he would like to tell about what happened in his past life, but his mentor had not spoken to him for five days. When Valentine entered the diner, she continued to say that there was more blood on the young man's hands than on hers. Did he ever wonder why he was given the chance for a second life? Chewing on the meat on a stick, Jack really thought about the fact that he had been thinking so much about everything but the fact of his return. So much had happened in the past. After a pause, the boy said to his mentor that he had thought about it, but hadn't come up with anything. So let him not look at him with such a disappointed look, as if he had brought himself back to the past. Walking around the city, the protagonist continued to say that maybe the person who did this to him had a purpose. And if so, it means that the person who did it will appear sooner or later, and if not, the guy will just move on. The time he spends with his mentor is still the most important. 
Valentine says that the guy really knows how to pour honey into your ears. But what is his plan? Overjoyed at his good fortune, Jack replies that he needs to find some friends. But he thinks about the fact that he needs people. Then on the hike, five days ago, when he took his mentor with him, the young man almost died. He had to drink two elixirs of the highest class. However, the pain did not disappear for another five days. The boy still has a bad body. That's why he needs good protection. With these thoughts in mind, Jack says he needs to go shopping. He needs a new sword. While he was talking, a girl suddenly ran out of the street and shouted at him to get out of the way. The girl ran into him and fell down rubbing her forehead and apologizing. Holding out his hand to her, the young man said that it was his fault for not looking around. Seeing her, Jack thought that he could start with her. Meanwhile, the girl was picking up the flowers that had fallen out of the basket, and she looked up and asked if the boy was hurt. The young man smiled and handed her the bag, wondering if she wanted to work for him, or rather with him. This turn of events puzzled the girl so much that she exclaimed at the stranger's words and took the pouch. When she opened it, she saw gold coins and threw the bag up in surprise. Then she handed the coins back saying that she could not accept such large sums of money. This made the protagonist think that for the girl it was probably a fortune. Smiling, the young man asked her how much she wanted. The delighted girl replied that one shilling would be enough. Jack gave her one shilling and bowing, the stranger handed over the flowers, saying goodbye and running away. However, she stopped for a second to bow again. Looking after her, the boy thought that this would be his first girlfriend. Meanwhile, Valentine said that she hadn't seen a vampire for a long time. The happy boy also said that he did not expect to meet a vampire here. Then he turned to his mentor and asked what she meant by the word vampire. She replied that wasn't that the reason the boy had chosen this stranger as his target? Looking at the joyful girl, Jack said that he had just thought that she would be able to reach the 10th circle. Snorting, Valentine said that the boy's stupidity was amazing. She would have to teach him a lot. To this, the joyful boy said that he hoped his mentor would live a long time and teach him a lot. In fact, she hasn't changed at all. Walking away from the scene, Milos looked at the back of her head, thinking that she had seen that stranger's face before. It was a long time ago. The woman clearly didn't think the forest dwellers would show up here. So many amazing things have been happening lately. When she finished thinking, Valentine said she knew where to find the sword. Supporting her, the group headed towards their common goal. Vampires are a special race, just like dragons. While the consultant was showing her products, Jack was thinking about the fact that 10 years ago there was a war between dragons and vampires. The reason was the power over the demon forest. Of course, the dragons won, and most of the vampires had to leave the forest. Probably, that girl also escaped from there. Or she is the daughter of those who escaped. The boy is not very interested in wars, and it makes him angry. While the young man was flying in his thoughts, the settler managed to sell him a sword. Having paid for the purchase, the young man said that he had already decided who would be his first partner. Not quite understanding why, Valentine asked if the young man was sure. Smiling and leaving the store, Jack began to say that he understood his mentor's doubts, but that it might not only be useful for him, but also help her to unleash her potential. As Milos approaches the target and looks at the girl from afar, he wonders if the guy is doing this for the sake of his plan. However, the protagonist looked at the vampire, thinking that the curiosity of his mentor was justified. It was 400 years ago. Since the woman had dragon blood, many people, including the emperor, made a pact with her. It said that no races should interfere in the affairs of people. It was after this treaty that many races moved to the demon forest. But that was 400 years ago. The emperors who supported this agreement are long dead. No matter how strong you are, time will be stronger. However, even after the agreement expired, other races could not leave the forest. The dragons, who had been bound by the agreement for two more years, began to forbid other races to leave. If they can't, then no one else can either. They watched everyone very closely. The laws of the mentor continued to be in effect. So they had to kill all the dragons. Maybe in this life, the boy could save them. Having finished thinking and keeping an eye on the target, Jack turned to his mentor and took her small hands and said that she should not be burdened with responsibility. Watching the girl, Valentine said that the young man knew nothing about her, to which Jack replied that he knew a lot, since he was her student. After that, the young man laughed. And Milo said that she would say only one thing, that the young man should not feed his blood. Not realizing what the mentor was getting at, 
The protagonist returned to his primary task and realized that his future child friend was deciding to feed her something sweet. Meanwhile, the girl remembered that meeting with the stranger and smilingly wondered what she should have said. Did the stranger really want her to become his assistant? It had been a long time since she had seen such generous people. If her mother drank some blood, she would feel better. Her mother had told her since childhood not to drink people's blood. And in principle, any blood, except for the one given by her uncle. Maybe he would come back today? The girl came home with these thoughts. Thinking that her mother was sleeping, she hurried upstairs. The woman who was lying on the bed turned to her daughter and said that they had guests. Suddenly, the vampire's attention was drawn to the stranger from the street who was sitting on the windowsill. Frightened, the girl jumped away from the guy. While Jack was enjoying his target's reaction, Valentine ordered the woman to stand up and appear normal. After the vampire stood up, Milo said that they hadn't seen each other for a long time. She asked why Vivian de Royale was in such a state. She's a vampire of noble blood. Did you like the part and are you waiting for the sequel? Then leave a comment so that the new part will be based on your favorite story and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss new videos. The protagonist spent the time with his goal, not understanding why he was wasting his time here if everything could be quickly finished with mana. Meanwhile, in the house, a sick woman asked the guest who she was, to which she looked at her and said that she had been forgotten, and then shocked the vampire with her name, saying that Vivian's entire family had been forced to leave the forest, and she clearly could not forget about it. De Royale wanted to respond, but was unable to do so because of a cough. Writhing in pain, the woman finally coughed and asked her guest who had made her so doll-like. Milo's replied that it was a curse, that only one night a month she could live like a normal person. But this is not important. What is more important is the reason why the vampire elite is in this place. Looking at Vivian, you can tell that she hasn't drunk blood for a long time. Sweating with sickness, the vampire asks if the witch feels sorry for her. Valentine just kept silent. Then Vivian began to say that a lot of time had passed, but Milo's used to be very strong, someone everyone was afraid of but she doesn't have that old vitality anymore. And if not for the sorceress, vampires could have died at the hands of fanatics. And in honor of this, the woman will tell Valentine what she wants to know. There are five creatures in the demonic forest. Two lords stand behind them, controlling them. In the past, the vampires had to leave the forest to escape their abuse. The woman's daughter was still very young then. They were eventually caught up by one of the pursuers. The dragon said that he was sorry for Vivian, so he would have mercy. In this village, the vampire lives near cows and pigs, but she and her daughter manage. In order to raise her, after listening to de Royale's story, Milos felt sorry for the woman, which is why she said that the aristocrat has the blood of the lords in her, but she lives in a miserable village just waiting for her death. While the two acquaintances were talking about their own business, a girl in the yard asked Jack when he would leave because her uncle, who doesn't like visitors, is coming soon. Interested in what Charlotte had to say, the young man asked her to tell him about her uncle. This curiosity shocked the girl, and she blurted out that the young man was not her uncle's type. Surprised that the vampire thought of this, Jack said that he was just bored waiting, so he wanted to hear a story. Thinking about it, the girl starts to say that her uncle is rich. She doesn't know much about him, but he bought this house for her and her mom. He also brings them food every three days, and he is very kind. After listening to the story and looking at the blood, Jack comes to one conclusion. He is about to warn Charlotte, but is suddenly distracted by a voice. The same uncle appeared near them and asked his niece if she had a new friend whom he had never seen before. Seeing him, the girl was very happy, while Jack deduced by ear that this was the one Charlotte was talking about. While the man was wondering what brought the young man to this house, the protagonist determined from one look that he was facing a dragon. Looking out the window, the man didn't care who the boy was because he had an even more interesting guest. While the dragon was heading into the house, Vivian asked Valentine to call Charlotte. Looking at the man, the protagonist immediately contacted his mentor saying that they had a visitor. Upon hearing this, Valentine ordered the girl and her husband to be brought to her. Ignoring the dragon's curiosity about the young man's mutterings, Jack said that his mentor had called him and that the man could go with him. He had come to talk to the doll. Hearing footsteps, Vivian was about to turn to her daughter, but when she saw the new visitor, she was frightened. 
Looking at the vampire's reaction, the man asked why she was so surprised, as if she had seen a ghost. Sitting down in the room, the dragon began to smile with satisfaction, saying that he had come just to talk, not to make a scandal before de Royale's death. Meanwhile, Charlotte sat down by the bedside and tearfully asked if her mother was getting worse. Vivian wanted to answer, but the girl began to say that she had blood and if her mother drank it, she would feel better. The exhausted woman stretched out her hand saying that she did not need blood. She had also prepared a birthday present for Charlotte and wanted to apologize for not being able to give it to her. Looking at her sick mother, the girl began to scream excitedly, asking what was wrong with her mother. Observing this situation, the protagonist thought that when he and his mentor arrived in this city, they were not supposed to see this. They accidentally ran into Charlotte and followed her out of pure interest. The boy had no reason to look after the girl, but he would create that reason now. With these thoughts in mind, the young man approached the sick vampire, asking her if she would trust him with her daughter. This request clearly surprised Vivian. Taking the woman's hand, the young man said that they had little time so he would get straight to the point. What does a woman want for her child? Does she want him to become a full-fledged vampire? Does she want the whole world to be at her feet? And if not, does she want to take revenge for all vampires by killing dragons? Hearing these words, the man who was just watching began to smile smugly. Meanwhile, asking Jack with her trembling hand to bend over, Vivian began to say that she wanted Charlotte to have a different fate. The woman has nothing to wish for but for her daughter to smile all the time, and that will be enough. And if the young man didn't mind, she asked him to tell her his name last. The boy immediately introduced himself to the lady. Breathing heavily, the vampire said that he had a wonderful name. Then she asked if he could protect Charlotte. Looking at her face, the guy answered that he could. Therefore, she can go in peace, the bearer of noble blood. After thanking Jack, Vivian de Royale touched her child's face and said that she loved her. These were the last words of the woman before she turned to dust. Charlotte begged her not to leave, crying bitterly, but it was too late. Meanwhile, Jack took his mentor in his arms and looked away from the empty bed. This situation seemed sad to everyone, except for the dragon, who started laughing, and was laughing harder and harder. Seeing him in such a state, the protagonist's eyes became angry. When the man finished laughing, he said that he almost died of laughter. The young man took responsibility for a child who would soon die. For this little vampire. It was really funny. Unable to contain his anger, Jack was already flying at the dragon with a ready blow, from which the man pierced the house with his body and flew out into the street. While in flight, the dragon did not understand what was happening. When the man landed, he said that the young man was very impolite. He attacked a defenseless person. Therefore, he would hardly be a good friend for his Charlotte. With these words, the dragon began to release his mana and wanted to teach his offender a lesson, but Valentine stopped him and ordered him to identify himself. Having stopped his attack, the man did not understand at first where he felt this weak magic. Was it coming from a talking toy? Without waiting for him to obey the order, Milos began to say that if the two lords were removed, there should have been five dragons left in the forest, but the man was not among them. He must be about 200 years old. So he was born somewhere in this period of time. At these words, the dragon, still disturbed by such piercing insight, exploded in anger, asking who she was and how she knew this information. The protagonist did not like this reaction of the enemy. Valentine asked her apprentice to let her go, saying that she could handle it on her own. The boy gently put the doll on the ground and then she addressed the dragon, saying that she was Valentine Milos, a sorceress of the past. This information shocked the man, and he decided to clarify that he was looking at a necromancer of immortality. The woman confirmed this, saying that in ancient times she was called that. The dragon tensed up and said that he was not stupid enough to fall for such nonsense. Then, to prove her point, Milos named two names, Bahamut and Balamot which puzzled her interlocutor even more. Looking at the doll, the man thought about the fact that the woman had mentioned the names of the dragon lords, or rather, their real names, which can only be known by those who have personally met them or are dragons themselves. Having finished his thoughts, the dragon said that he now believed that he too was a dragon, Machiavelli's Valactus. 
And who could have thought that he would meet such a person in this wilderness? And the man only wanted to play with the second toy after the death of the first. After listening to him, Valentine ordered Valactus to leave immediately. He bared his fangs and said that she had no right to order him if she remembered what had happened. It was they dragons who had surpassed humans in everything in one. Therefore, she had no right to give him orders. When Milos heard this, she said that the man was confused. The fact that the dragons surpassed humans in everything is complete nonsense. It was she, not the dragons, who did it. Machiavelli clearly forgot that it was she who separated them from humans. Because of their pride, the world began to crack at the seams. But the dragons continued to stubbornly insist that they were better than anyone else, continuing the outrage. Angered by these words, Balactus threw out his mana, pointing his finger at the woman and saying that she could not know anything about the past. Intervening in the conversation, Jack turned to the lizard, telling him to listen instead of flapping his tongue. But if he was so cool, why did he start trembling when he heard his mentor's name? These words were the last straw in Machiavelli's patience, and he rushed right at the guy to show him his place. However, Jack easily dodged Valactus' claws and with a turn hit him in the leg, sending him flying straight to the wall. Crashing into it, the man felt pain. The protagonist approached the dragon. He put his foot to the evil Machiavelli's chin and told him not to consider himself better than his mentor. Out of breath, but still angry, the dragon began to say that he was a dragon and therefore better than them. Humans are trash. Not really wanting to keep listening to this, Jack gathered mana in his hand, saying that if the lizard continued in the same way, he should just close his eyes and he would just kill it. However, Valactus himself was not going to give up. He grabbed the young man by the leg and threw him into the house, telling him not to hide behind Valentine, thinking he was better than her. Milos herself just watched the situation. Meanwhile, in the ruined house, amidst the dust, Jack shook off the dust to Charlotte's surprise, saying that it was quite dirty. If Ron was here, he would have fainted. And now the boy realized that Charlotte's uncle was a bastard. Hearing this, the girl began to cry even harder. Seeing her reaction, the young man grabbed her hand and showed her the bastard below who had destroyed her family, killed her father and played with her mother until she died. Flooding with tears, the girl could not believe what she was hearing. And then Jack said that her mother had given her answer, but he also needed Charlotte's permission. Now her word would decide everything. When he finished speaking, the young man took out his sword and turned to her and said that he would show her how responsible he could be and how much strength he had. With these words, the young man was already flying towards his goal. When he got close enough, the guy swung his sword, but Valactus managed to dodge the blow by jumping away. The opponents stood opposite each other, crossing fierce glances, and in an instant, the enemies rushed at each other. Machiavelli had already exposed his claws striking a series of blows at the young man. After finishing the lunge, the man looked proudly at his opponent, saying that although his expectations were high, the boy's technique was banal. Suddenly, to the dragon's surprise, his hair began to fall to the ground. Smiling, Jack said that he didn't want to spoil Valacta's face, and now he looked fine. Machiavelli, furious, began to radiate his mana, saying that he would not hold back any longer. With these words, the man used a slash of wind that flew directly at the guy. However, with a swing of his sword, the protagonist easily repelled the spell. This stunned Valactus. Looking at the fight, Valentine thought about how the boy was able to repel the dragon's magic. Jack himself was already flying on Machiavelli, grabbing the man by the head. The young man nailed him to the ground. This almost made him lose consciousness. Walking away, the protagonist suddenly remembered something. So he turned around and began to say that Valctus Machiavelli must be the son of Luca Machiavelli from the Forest of Monsters. Hearing this, the dragon could not believe that the boy could know such information. Meanwhile, Jack was thinking about the fact that Luca Machiavelli is one of the five dragons that control the Forest of Monsters. In his past life, it was the boy who had taken the dragon's head off. But the boy, who was lying in front of him, did not see this boy in his past life. Perhaps someone killed him, or Valctus was hiding somewhere. When Jack finished his thoughts, he said that it was amazing how Machiavelli was similar in personality to his father. 
Still not understanding how the boy knew about his father, the man asked who he was looking at, to which the young man replied that he was the first and last student of Valentine Milos, whom Valactus had mocked. Breathing heavily, the man asked how the man managed to stop the magic. But Jack didn't want to answer, pointing his sword at the dragon. The guy said he was giving him five seconds to apologize for everything he had said to his mentor. Tired, Valactus asked what would happen if he refused. The boy replies that he will grind the dragon into powder that no one will ever be able to find, as he did with the others. After that, standing in front of an angry Machiavelli, the boy began to count. Five, four, three, two. And as soon as the boy counted to one, the man immediately flew into the air, running away, deciding to tell the other dragons about everything that had happened here. Looking at him, Jack thought about the fact that the lizard had really run away. He certainly didn't want to go that far, but what could he do? Having finished his thoughts, the protagonist had already surrounded himself with his mana and began to cast the concentration soul sword technique. Looking at her, Charlotte just stood there in complete shock, and Valactus turned around and saw that a whole storm was coming behind him. At the same time, Jack said that this is the first of the four techniques, heaven. Looking at such magic, Machiavelli just hung helplessly in the air, not realizing who he had actually contacted. Valactus was in the darkness trying to escape, but he could not do so because Jack himself seemed to be watching him. The dragon stumbled and fell to the ground begging the boy not to approach, but the young man was about to grab the dragon when he suddenly woke up in an interior he didn't know and couldn't understand what he was doing here. He looked around and wondered where he was. While he was thinking about it, a sad Ron came into the room and asked what had happened to the young man. Seeing that the young man was awake, the butler immediately rushed to him and asked him how many fingers he could see on his hand. After reassuring his friend, Jack began to say that he was not a kid anymore, and why was Ron here at all? And what is this here? The butler thought about it. While the young man added to his questions another one about whether the man had seen the toy and the girl. To this, Ron replied that they had washed the girl and put her to bed in the room next door. He doesn't know what happened to her, but it must have been something terrible. And the toy is over here. The butler pointed to Valentine sitting on the couch. Irritating his mentor, Jack greeted her good morning with a smile on his face. Still angry, Milos said that it was evening, which surprised Ron. Seeing how irritated the woman was, the boy asked if he was the reason she was so angry. Valentine looked away and said that she couldn't possibly be angry about anything else. The boy was the only one who was hurt. Glad to see such concern, Jack tried to calm his mentor down. Listening to this conversation, Ron began to say that it was strange that a young gentleman was talking to a doll that had been sitting still for three days. Trying to get up, the young man said that he would explain everything later, but now the butler needed to remember only one thing, the toy was a mentor, so he had to be careful with it. With a sigh, the butler bowed and said that he was sure the young gentleman had a reason for talking about the toy in this way, so in the future he would be more careful. Moving on to another topic, Jack asked what had happened. The story turned out to be quite trivial. The knights who were traveling with the young man were found in the mountains. The Marquis learned about what had happened and hired a knight to investigate and find his son. In addition, many people in the province of Arbaloa saw the boy. After that, there were rumors that the boy was in the province of Osenbol. Suddenly, a storm appeared in the sky, which the Marquis's hired man saw. Eventually, Jack was found unconscious. No one knew what condition he was in, but his wounds were serious, and he was moved here. We had to give the young man three top-class elixirs with strawberry flavor. At this point, the story ends. When Jack heard about what had happened, he smiled and said that Ron still remembered that the boy liked the taste of strawberries. And that's all well and good. But why is the butler here and not protecting Elizabeth? Taking his head, the man began to say that Lady Elizabeth also wanted to go in search of her brother but the Marquis stopped her and sent Ron instead, since the butler also knows the boy well. Surprised that the Marquis himself sent the butler, the boy smiled and said that his dad was a complete jerk. He was also glad to meet his friend again. After finishing the conversation, Jack turned his gaze to someone he hadn't seen before, asking who was he? Seeing the young man, the unknown man said that the third owner had woken up. And since he has to introduce himself, 
His name is Gonzales, the deputy commander of the Knights of Iron Blood. Perhaps the guy has already learned everything from the servant. The man was the one who was appointed to investigate the incident, and that's why he now has questions. Doesn't the young man know that the third son of the Marquis is not supposed to travel around the provinces and play with the commoners? For the third son of an heir, this might be possible and would be allowed, but the boy is the third son of a Marquis and he cannot do this. Ron was about to intervene in the conversation, but Jack stopped him, deciding to listen to the knight. Smiling with satisfaction, Gansalas said that he had a few questions and hoped that the young gentleman would answer honestly. At this point, the protagonist was thinking that, judging by Ron's words, it was the man in front of him who had bought three elixirs of the highest quality. So the guy would only last up to three questions. With these thoughts in mind, the young man confidently agreed to Gansala's offer and with his look, he worried the detective a little. The knight began to say that the young man was the only survivor of the incident, so let him tell what happened there. When Jack heard his interlocutor, he said that nothing had happened. His guards had received a strange order to cripple his third son, and then to give him an elixir and, before he could finish his story, the guy saw Hansel's look and asked why he was looking at him like that. Was this the first time he had heard about it? Calming down, the detective asked the young man not to change the subject and continued his story. Restraining himself, Jack continued to say that the knights themselves said they had received such an order. They had to stop somewhere on the way to the academy for four nights. And during those four nights, they were going to break the boy's bones and in the morning treat him with an elixir and so on until the end of the journey. Another sixth grade knight, Reggie, believed in himself and wanted to destroy the boy's monacalos. Hearing his master's words, Ron began to worry, while Jack himself said that he had just killed his offender. Gansalas, who had been excited up to that point, was distorted, not believing the young man's words. Rising to his feet, the protagonist began to laugh smugly, saying that he had killed them all. With this information, the detective began to think about how the kid was able to defeat the entire squad. On his own? Is it even possible? Having finished his thoughts, the man said that he could turn a blind eye to many things, but not to such daredevils. The boy should not even dare to mock him. So now let him be careful. No matter how much Lady Elizabeth loved him, what he had done could not be overlooked. The knight was about to leave Jack, but Ron stopped him, offering to talk privately. Hansel and Gretel pushed the butler away, saying that ordinary servants have no right to touch him. Seeing this, the protagonist still does not restrain himself and punches the detective right in the face, causing him to fall to the ground. Standing in front of him, the young man says that he restrained himself three times, but it was too much. Ron, who was standing next to the young man, said that it was unnecessary, the guy was still sick. Exhausted, the young man falls down on the couch and responds to his butler's concerns by saying that he is just a little dizzy, and that detective must have, give or take, a seventh circle. What's even more surprising is that the knight is mocking ordinary servants. At such pleasant words, Ron simply smiled. Grabbing his friend by the collar to hold on, Jack told him not to live like that anymore. The guy was stupid, he thought it would be easier with Ron by his side, but now he thinks differently. Since he is his friend, he wants the butler to live like a human being. After listening to his master, the man says that the young man has never said that before. Looking at his butler, Jack waited for an answer. Ron said he didn't want to, and the protagonist just accepted it. As he was getting up, the man turned to Hansel eyes and said that the deputy captain should be the third in command. Although the young gentleman does not know him, the butler remembers him well. Looking at the way his servant took off his jacket, Jack asked how long ago it was? Maybe five minutes? Ron, warming up, replies that who better than his master to know what he is capable of? A minute would be enough for him. I think everyone already knows that Ron is a great cook, but now we're not going to talk about food, which can be understood by the butler's movements. The man easily deflected his opponent's attacks and just as easily counterattacked. Gonzalez was already beaten up, but he was not going to stop attacking Ron. Deciding to end the fight, the butler waited for the right moment and pushed the knight. People began to gather at the noise, while Jack just sat watching the fight and thinking that he had seen these moves before. Of course, he had seen Ron fight in the past and even use spells, 
But even on the ninth circle, the man's main strength was magic, not physical strength. Therefore, this situation in which Gonzalez, a seventh circle wizard, loses to an ordinary servant looks strange. However, Ron has a lot of experience with men stronger than this. Besides, you can always say that it was a spy of the Tolkien Empire that Ron killed him, but a butler can hardly kill someone. While the young man was in his thoughts, the beaten Gonzalez took the sword from one of the guards and headed towards his opponent. Seeing this, Ron quickly closed the distance, stabbing the detective in the face from the knee. Looking at this fight, Jack thought that because of him, Ron had to hold back and not show his true strength. With these thoughts in mind, the young man turned to the butler, and the latter gladly began to listen to the young gentleman, who said that he had asked for food. How long would he have to wait for it? While the man stood in astonishment at this question, Gansalas got to his feet and attacked the enemy from behind. However, Ron sent the knight flying with a single punch and said that the food was ready. Against the background of the unconscious detective, Jack said that the fight lasted a minute and twelve seconds, so Ron should try to be faster. A little upset, the butler agreed. After the fight, the protagonist ordered the guards to go back to work since they had already watched the fight and deciding to talk privately, the guy approached Gonzalez and took him by the hair, saying that the man had a cool name, good skills, and the marquee trusted him. The knight wanted to snap back, but the young man stopped him and approached him with a smile on his face and continued to say that the knight hadn't realized it yet. He came here to find out what happened. Now he knows what happened and who is behind it. Looking at Gonzalez, the young man thought that he was the Marquis's favorite, the third knight, who was in his thirties and also the deputy captain. It would be a pity to kill him. Having finished his thoughts, the boy turned to the man and asked him if he wanted the eighth circle. Doesn't he want to become a captain? Gonzalez is surprised by this offer, while Jack says that they could make a deal. Watching what his master was doing, Ron was sincerely glad that the young man was so mature. Suddenly, someone poked the man's leg. It was Valentine. Dropping to one knee, the butler said that the young master called the doll his mentor, so the man should introduce himself. Interrupting her interlocutor, Milos asked if he had used an impulsive attack. Looking at Ron, Valentine began to say that this was really impressive. Nineteen or even twenty years ago, the man was already in his ninth circle. To get it in his third decade of life is amazing. And now his skills must be even greater. I wonder what such a person found in serving. He could have gotten the tenth circle, and perhaps even become an archmage. Wasn't twenty years enough? Twenty years of using magic would have been enough. Hearing Valentine's words, the butler thought that nineteen years would be more accurate. Ever since Jack and Elizabeth had arrived at the Marquis' estate, the man had never used his magic. Recently, of course, he had to do it. Just once. To save a young gentleman. But it didn't matter now. While Ron was thinking about this, Milos continued to say that the butler must be sorry that he gave up his old life. Let him be honest. The people around him are weaker than him, so why should he be treated like this? He doesn't have to turn a blind eye to his desires. Or is he going to keep living for the sake of the child? Now the woman understands where Jack got his skills. Does Jack even know how powerful his servant is? After a pause, Ron said that the young gentleman had once said that there was no point in looking back at the past, no matter how hard it was. So he probably knows everything, he just doesn't pay attention to it. If Jack had heard this conversation, he might have pretended to know nothing. But Jack himself did not know much. In fact, right now, the young man was talking to the beaten Hanselis, telling him to finally remember. The young man would have gladly finished the man off, but he would need him, so he is still alive. And now he would ask for the last time which side the knight would be on. Trembling, the detective tried to answer, but could not. Then the protagonist sat on top of him and tried to touch him. However, the man began to shake his head. After removing his hand, Jack said that Gansalis should not move and not use mana if he did not want to be hurt. After these words, the boy touched the knight's chest and sent his mana into his bloodstream, looking for what he needed. Finally, the happy young man found seven crystals that made his heart beat. Leaning closer, the boy began to envelop the crystals with his mana. Sensing this, Gansalis began to resist, but the boy stopped him by pinning him to the ground and telling him not to move. 
as the young man could kill him at any moment. Looking at his test subject with a satisfied smile, the protagonist asked if everything was clear. Resigned to his fate, the detective stopped resisting. Meanwhile, Jack was already injecting his mana into the crystals of Ganzala's, raising wind currents around him. After injecting enough mana, another crystal appeared. As a result, even more streams of air rose. Finally, the procedure was over and the guy said that the man could open his eyes. Everything was ready. The knight immediately touched his heart feeling the new crystal. Looking at the detective's reaction, the young man said that the crystal would work for three to five months. Not understanding why he had been made stronger, Gonzalez asked who the young man was. The protagonist replied that Gonzalez shouldn't ask questions. The man simply fell silent. Satisfied with the result, the young man smiled and said that now the knight had no choice. He would have to do what he was told. And the boy hopes that the man understands what will happen if he refuses. He will die. A horrible death. So horrible that it is hard to imagine. This turn of events caused fear to appear on Hansela's face. Meanwhile, Jack, still smiling, said that the knight must know what rumors are circulating about his third son. That he possesses black magic. Back when Jack beat up Palin and went to prison, he heard rumors that he had black magic. And it was true. Playing on this, the protagonist said that all these gossips were true. And the knight should have realized this by now. And now let him kneel down. When the frightened man took the pose they wanted him to take, Jack began to say that now the detective had better turn on his brain and listen carefully. The first thing Hansel Eyes needs to do is to return to the marquee. Secondly, when the man returns, he will report back, saying that the third master knows nothing about what happened. Bowing, the knight said he understood. Which pleased Jack, who went on to say that the third thing the man must do is to kill Count Minta's supporters, the knights on the marquee side, in three months, and eventually more than forty people should not be in this world. Ganzalas agreed at first, but when he understood the order, he was very surprised. Nevertheless, the boy said that the knight should obey. No wonder the eighth crystal appeared in him. After bowing once more, the man obeyed. After finishing this conversation, the protagonist got up and put his hand on Hansel's shoulder and said happily that he should not be sad. The detective should have obeyed him right away, and then he would not have suffered so much. In addition, the man became a magician of the eighth circle in a second. He just needed to obey, and everything would be fine. It's for the best. Hasn't the knight been beaten enough? At these words, Hansel eyes turned pale and couldn't say a word. Patting him on the back, Jack told him to relax. He had been bothering Ron all his life, and the butler had to be quiet and patient. Now it was the knight's turn. To put it simply, the man will become Ron's rag, so he should try his best. He should ask Ron himself what he should do. He has already lost his temper because of the position Gansel is, is in now. Having finished with the detective, Jack simply threw him out of the room. After closing the door, the protagonist began to exaggerate about the fact that he now had a second chicken. The first one was a complete jerk, but the second one should listen to him. After finishing his thoughts, the young man turned to the butler and asked if everything was ready. Putting the doll on the couch, Ron confirmed it. As he was about to leave, the boy complained about how hungry he was. But the man stopped him, saying that he couldn't leave looking like that. Looking at himself, the guy did not understand what his friend meant. Meanwhile, Ron was rummaging through his closet and asked to wait a bit saying that he knew this would happen. Waiting for what his servant had prepared for him, the young man just stood there embarrassed. A few minutes later, Jack was already wearing the outfit Ron had given him. After thanking his friend, he was about to go out to eat. Suddenly, the door opened and Charlotte rushed into the young man's arms and began to say that she was very worried that Jack might not wake up. Looking at her, the protagonist told Ron that he would come back later, so the man could prepare everything. Bowing. The butler wished him a good conversation, leaving his master alone with Charlotte, who did not want to let him go. The sun was already setting in the yard. Going out on the terrace, the young man said that first of all he apologized for the destroyed house. The girl replied that it was nothing, because her home was where her family was and since her mother was gone, there was no point in living in an empty house alone. Under the evening sun, Jack approached Charlotte, grabbing her hand and telling her that he, too, had lost his mother early. 
He was so young that he had no memories. And yet he always had Ron with him, and now his mentor. You can find happiness even in the most horrible life. With these words, the boy cut his hand. Seeing this, the girl began to worry. In a second, the young man put his wound to the vampire's lips and told Charlotte to come with him. Hearing this, the girl blushed and sank her fangs into the boy's hand, who thought she was obviously very hungry. When she finished drinking the blood, streams of air appeared around Charlotte. Her hair gained shine and her face changed from thin to more lively. At that moment, her body was restored. Vampires have protected themselves from dragons because they have the ability to restore their strength by drinking special blood. Straightening his shirt, the young man asked if the girl was feeling better. Embarrassed, Charlotte thanked her rescuer, who looked at her and asked what Charlotte's impression was. After all, he had just shown how devotedly he would protect her. To this, the vampire begins to say that she was a little scared, but she was impressed. Looking at the guy with a flushed look, the girl said that her brother was very cool. The protagonist was a little disappointed by the word brother. Then, with a sigh, he thought that he had to face the truth. He was already many years old. With these thoughts in mind, Jack said that he was not a brother, but a boss. Delighted, Charlotte smiled sincerely and agreed to call the boy boss. The time was already approaching night. At the table with food, Ron's voice was heard, who could not believe that the young master had caught a dragon, and an adult one at that. Chewing on his food, the young man confirmed this, thinking that his butler had a hard time believing him, because when a dragon turns ten, it already has a mana heart of about the fourth or fifth level, and by the time it is fifty, dragons generally become masters. In addition, dragons have skills. Giant individuals can shrink to the size of a small person. And this is not quite the same as polymorphs. The body of a dragon is mostly already made up of magic, but the transformation into a human is usually used in battle. If that dumbass had been a little smarter, and the guy had given him a chance for a good attack, the young man wouldn't be here. But the boy is still here. When he finished thinking, Jack said that the dragon was stupid. No matter how hard the boy tried, he would still only make it to the second round. Is it normal to defeat a dragon with a tenth circle or higher? Smiling awkwardly, Ron replies that it's amazing. Continuing to enjoy his dinner, the young man began to say that the dragon was not experienced. He didn't know how to use his skills properly, and fear clouded his mind, which is why he died. Suddenly, Jack realized that Ron was reacting strangely to their conversation. Another person, if he had learned that the boy had killed a dragon, would have laughed like those stupid hirelings earlier. But for the butler, it's perfectly normal to allow the idea that a young man can defeat a magician of this level. The man was embarrassed at this, asking if the young gentleman didn't know about the butler's past and all that. Not understanding this curiosity, the protagonist began to get angry that his friend was hiding something from him. Ron said that the conversation would be long. After drinking the wine, the young man looked into his glass thinking that in his past life, even when the two of them ran away from home, the man had not talked about the past. Therefore, it is better that his secrets remain secrets in the future. The guy wants to know only one thing. Having finished his thoughts, Jack turned to the butler and said that he asked only one thing. Is his servant somehow connected to the Tolkien Empire? Was he a spy? There was a silent pause in the air, which was broken by Ron, who said that he had no connection to the Tolkien Empire. Looking at his friend with a checking glance, the boy exhaled calmly, hoping he wasn't putting too much pressure on the butler, reassuring himself that Ron was smiling, which meant everything was fine. The young man began to think that it was time to develop mana circles. When he used the energy, he almost died. So he needs to continue to develop his physical form and mana circles to become stronger. But first he has to study at the academy, and then it will be seen. The protagonist is brought out of his thoughts by Valentine, who begins to say that the boy is really her student, since he was able to use the black crystal. In this world, only Milos and Jack know about this black magic. It is unknown to others, because it was Valentine who created it at the time that made her famous. In other words, during the war. It was then that the woman began to use black crystals. If you engrave them on a magic circle and don't follow the rules of the vow, not only the circle but your whole body will explode. This terrible magic made Milos even more famous. 
So now Valentine was sitting across from the boy, wondering what vow he had engraved on the night circle. Smiling, Jack replied that it was just a safety net for him, his sister, and Ron. Hearing this, the butler did not understand what the boy was talking about, but he was glad that he had done it for him as well. Looking at his friend's reaction, the young man thought that Ron had become too emotional after talking to his mentor. Suddenly, the door to the room opened and Charlotte walked in, addressing the boss. Seeing her, the young man asked what was wrong. She began to complain that the maids had tired her out. Saying that the girl was just in time, Jack ordered her to sit down. Ron immediately approached the vampire, asking if she was hungry. While the butler was filling the glass, a young gentleman approached him and said that he would like to send Charlotte to the academy. To this, Ron replies that the master sometimes forgets that the man is just a servant. Jack agrees, adding that the butler is a special servant. And if that's the case, can't the all-powerful Ron get Charlotte into the academy? After a pause, the man looked away and said he didn't know if he could. Hearing this and irritating Ron, the boy said that if that was the case, then he would do it himself. Leaning over to the young man, the man whispered that he could not blackmail people. The young man replied that there would be no blackmail. After all, he was not a bandit. Meanwhile, Charlotte jumped up, wondering if she was going to go to school. Jack confirmed it. Worried, the girl asked how she could get into the academy. While Jack was thinking that it would be a shame to waste such a talent. Even if Charlotte didn't have any mana circles yet, he could help her reach even the tenth one. And then she, like him, would become a skilled magician. We'll have to talk to Gonzalez and get her into the academy. The only problem is her age. You can enter the academy at the age of 14, but Charlotte is only 11. So, it's not going to be easy. Having finished thinking, the guy finally answered Charlotte, telling her not to worry. She would go to school anyway. A few days later, the protagonist was happy that they had finally arrived at the academy. Ron handed over the luggage, for which Jack thanked him. Then the man bowed and told the young man to take care of his health. Changing his tone to a more serious one, the young man turned to the butler, saying that he would like to leave all the household chores to his husband. Hearing this, Ron clarifies that does this mean that the owner will focus on the academy? Pointing at Gonzalez, Jack says that the knight is completely stupid. And it's true. You can't say that the man has outstanding mental abilities. You could even get rid of him. But Jack has a job for the knight to do, and Ron will need to supervise the execution. It's time to take all the garbage out of the Ballantier house. But gradually. Hearing these words, the butler began to worry and asked if the young gentleman was referring to Count Mintus's vassals and family. The young man confirms this, and Ron begins to worry about Lady Elizabeth. Reassuring his friend, the young man says that his sister is very kind. She would never dare to do such a thing. So he needs to help her change. The boy is afraid that the atmosphere at home might reflect badly on her. So Ron will keep an eye on her. Breathing a sigh of relief, the butler notices that his master has changed a lot. Jack just smiles at him. After the conversation, the protagonist headed for the gate. Upon entering the city, Valentine says that the young man has good subordinates. But the guy denies it, saying that Ron is a friend, not a subordinate. Suddenly, a realization dawns on the young man, and he smiles and says that his mentor is also his friend. At this, Valentine breaks into a smile. Finally arriving at the academy, Charlotte could not believe she was in such a place. Jack said that she could see everything around her, since she would have to be here often. The happy girl agrees with the boss, but when the maid suddenly approaches her, she hides behind the boy. Seeing the maid, the boy asks her what happened. She bows and answers that the director is waiting for him in the office. When the protagonist entered the office, the director began to say that he had already heard about the boy. An aristocrat who destroyed several buildings and killed a group of people. He was even published in the newspaper. While the principal was talking about this, the young man sat in his chair thinking about the fact that he hadn't been in the office of Rommel Einhardt Isenblatt, the father of the current Duke of Isenblatt and the director of the academy, for a long time and nothing had changed in the office. Everything was the same as it was in his past life. Back then in the past, Jack asked for permission to conduct an experiment. Looking at the beaten student, Rommel said that if he made the list of the best students, he would not be expelled. 
His stupid brother and father could kill the boy before he comes of age. And to tell the truth, the grandfather met many people like Jack. After listening to his principal, the young man shook his head, asking how he should live. The principal looked at the boy and put his hand on his head and said that it was up to the boy to decide. If he wanted, he would be given a private room in the dormitory. Recalling this event from the past, the protagonist reflected on the fact that the director has a weakness for unhappy children. After finishing his thoughts, the guy addressed the director, calling him Mr. with a proposal to make a deal. This turn of events surprised Isenblatt. Seeing Einhardt's surprise, Jack said that he had a debt to the director, so he was ready to save his life. Only Rommel had to fulfill one request. Curious, Rommel notices that the young man's tongue was not so sharp when they first met. At this, the young man just starts smiling, because for Einhardt, a month has passed, and for the boy, twenty years. Even a river changes its direction twice in such a period. So how is a human being worse? Gesturing, Essimble agreed to listen to the boy. Meanwhile, Jack was thinking about the fact that according to his memories, the Teslon Empire fell against the Tolkien Empire. And the event he was interested in happened about a month after the war. Time passed very slowly. The Empire had more than 30 swordmasters. Among them were half-breeds with dragon blood and dragon bones. And more than a thousand people with the seventh circle of mana. Compared to them, the Teslon Empire had only two swordmasters and about a hundred mages. Such a big difference in just a month. If Jack had been the captain of the Tolkien army, it would have been over in three days. The Empire was able to hold out for such a long time only because of Ezinblu. Among the ruins of the Empire, there were groups of mages who defended the population. General Rommel had more than 700 people under his command. They appeared suddenly and started fighting for Tesla. If everything had been fine with Einhardt, the Empire could have lasted even two months. But this did not happen because of a simple betrayal. This was the most shocking and horrifying thing. When he finished his thoughts, the boy mentioned the name Blutus, which Isenblatt was very surprised to hear, saying that Ballantyr had no right to mention this name. But the young man himself did not care about the director's warning. So he continued to say that Blutus was Marco, a spy for the Tolkien Empire. Now he has to work as an assistant instructor at a fencing school. He is a knight of the Sixth Circle and a vassal of the Duke of Osable. Interrupting his interlocutor, Einhardt said that Marco was loyal to him. Therefore, the boy has no right to accuse the vassal of Osable. Hearing this, the young man said that he was not accusing anyone. It was ridiculous. A few years later, Blutus will stab the director in the back. Of course, Rommel shouldn't believe the child, but he would regret it later. After listening to the interlocutor, Einhardt starts to get angry and says that he warns him right away that the boy shouldn't do anything he can't take responsibility for. And now the director will just pretend that this conversation never happened. And now let the young man leave. Realizing that something has to be done, the young man takes out his watch with the coat of arms, puts it on the table, and says with a serious look that he is not a joker. If the director does not understand anything now, he can call Mark when he is ready. After a while, the suspect was already in the office. After a short pause, the protagonist addressed the man, saying that he was good, but that he no longer needed to send information to the Tolkien Empire. At these words, Marco began to worry, but quickly pulled himself together and snapped. Pointing to his head, Jack said that it was clear that Blutus' head was not working, but his hearing should be fine. Was the man thinking of deceiving the boy? Without showing any nervousness, Mark concludes that he is looking at the same problematic son, Jack Ballantyr. And it's clear that the boy is not only out of shape, but also out of his mind. The principal sympathizes with him, of course, but treating a man like a spy is a terrible accusation that will be followed by punishment. Unable to stand this attitude, the guy gets up and clutching the watch in his hand, says that there is a lot of dirt in the words of the traitor. Then he punches the man in the face. Feeling the blow, Blutus immediately stood up in front of the guy, but stopped and asked the director what was going on here. Meanwhile, Jack didn't want to wait, and he was already attacking the man in the head. After dodging and taking a stance, the man turned to the boy and said that he had no right to behave like that in an educational institution and wanted to throw a right jab. Having dodged the punch, Jack found himself in a very favorable position. But when he looked at the frightened Mark, 
he saw that the spy was overwhelmed by the mana of the sixth circle, but this was Blutus' biggest weakness. The young man punched his opponent in the stomach, causing him to feel pain and go into the wall. Looking at the end of the fight, Rommel was shocked by the outcome. Meanwhile, the protagonist approached the traitor saying that it was time to confess. Throwing a smug look at the man, the guy sat down next to him, telling him to agree. Pretending any longer would be stupid. Breathing heavily, Blutus pretended not to understand. Then, with a smile on his face, Jack touched Mark's chest, thinking that the sixth circle could be obtained by overcoming severe pain. If you destroy something that a person has worked hard to achieve, it will be forever etched in their memory. With these thoughts in mind, the young man said that he would ask questions, and if the man lied, his crystals would be destroyed one by one. And so question one, is Blutus a spy for the Tolkien Empire? Smiling, Jack waited for the answer from the scared to death mark. Trembling with fear, the man shouts out that it's not true and he doesn't understand why the boy started talking about espionage. Because of the wrong answer, the young man channeled his mana to destroy the first crystal. After that, he was happy to announce that the traitor had five circles left. And now the man had to answer the second question, was he a spy? But Blutus himself could not even say a word. Looking at the poor man, the young man began to say that it was a joke. If you lose a circle, you have to almost die to get it back. But the boy was not so kind, so he put his mana in Mark's heart. And if he wants to create a circle, he will feel terrible pain. This is probably better than dying, because the traitor won't be able to get the circle of mana anymore. Alternatively, there is only one way to restore the already destroyed circle, and the guy will tell about it. You can pour dragon blood into a man, replacing his bones with dragon bones. And then, perhaps, his circle will be restored. Writhing in pain, the traitor asked how the boy knew about this. The young man replied that it was a test. How did the man know about this experiment? This made Mark even more frightened. Deciding to check the true identity of the spy, the protagonist sat on top of him, sending mana into his body and scaring him, saying that Blutus knew about the dragons and the test. Isn't that too much information for a man with the sixth circle? Unable to stand it, Mark starts screaming, asking who the hell is this guy? And how does he know about the experiments in Tolkien? Looking at him, Jack smiled with satisfaction and, collecting mana, ironically asked himself how he really had so much information. Meanwhile, the traitor was screaming in pain as his crystals were being destroyed. When it was over, Mark lost consciousness. And the protagonist, happy with the result, said that that was it. Blutus now has zero magic circles. Having finished with the spy, the guy turned to the director, asking if he would agree to fulfill the young man's request. Einhardt was tense at this request. Meanwhile, having regained consciousness, the angry and beaten Mark began to say that the Tolkien Empire would never leave the boy alone. Every day of his life will be filled with pain. Hearing these words, Jack did not let the traitor finish, silencing him with a kick to the leg. Then, stepping over the body, he apologized to the director for having to spend time cleaning up. Looking at the young man, Rommel said he did not understand. The boy didn't look like the boy from a month ago. Smiling awkwardly, Jack replied that a lot can change in a month. With a sigh, Essimbol decided not to ask about it, telling the boy to tell him better about the dragon blood. Interrupting the director, the boy reminded him of their agreement. Einhardt must already know about the situation on the continent. The war is slowly starting. After that, the protagonist began to think that there is a struggle for the throne in the Tolkien Empire between the faction of silence, led by the second son of the imperial family, and the faction of cruelty, led by the current heir to the throne. And it is the rightful heir who will win, which will affect the life of the entire continent. Of course, the young man had spent ten years with his mentor in the mountains, so he didn't know much about what was happening below. Having finished his thoughts, he pointed to Mark's body, saying that he would keep him alive. After all, Blutus knows a lot about dragons and has a lot of information in general, so the director can ask the man when he wakes up. This will be the best option for both him and the emperor. When Einhardt heard the young man mention the emperor, he was surprised. Meanwhile, the protagonist was thinking that he would like to call the emperor a bastard. Another interesting thing is that the spy knows a lot. 
The theory of creating half-humans and half-dragons is just beginning to emerge in the form of human experiments. The guy had heard about it in his past life and was convinced of it when he saw the details of the experiments. But even in Tolkien, this information was classified. Having finished his thoughts, Jack leaned on Rommel's chair, saying that if the director hadn't forgotten, they had other things to talk about. The guy had a request, but Essenbol spoiled his mood. So now he had two requests. First, the boy wants a house near the academy, preferably with a garden. Hearing this, Einhardt reminded the student that all students live in a dormitory, but it is possible to ignore one rule for such help in principle. Having dealt with the first one, the director asked what about the second one? Jack replied that he wanted Einhardt to accept another student. Rommel replied that it was the second semester, and that new students were accepted in the first semester, and the boy is probably talking about the girl sitting by the door. The boy confirms this. So, Essebel asks what kind of relationship the boy and the girl have. The young man replies that he is like a guardian to her. With a sigh, the director agrees to fulfill the second request. This makes the young man wonder what that demonstrative sigh was all about. After finishing the conversation, the protagonist went outside where Charlotte was waiting for him and immediately rushed to him. Patting her on the head, the young man answered her question about her studies and told her that she would attend the academy after all. At first she was happy, but then she lowered her head. Seeing this, the boy asked what was wrong with her. The girl replied that she hadn't even counted on it. The academy is only for the chosen ones. But as the boss already knows, she's not even human. After listening to the vampire, the young man said that there was no difference, which surprised Charlotte and asked her if she was ashamed of being a vampire. Did she want to become a human? The slightly drooping girl just shook her head. Looking at her, the young man thought that he had no right to say such words, but he felt very sorry for Charlotte. She comes from a family of aristocrats who ruled over all vampires. But now, most of her family is dead. Her father was killed and Charlotte had only her mother. But now she is gone too. Having finished his thoughts, the guy held out his hand and said that the girl should not worry about her background. There is no need to separate humans and vampires. Charlotte de Royale is her name. This speech brought tears to the girl's eyes. Rising up and taking the vampire's hand, the young man began to say that he had to keep his promise. Therefore, the girl must remember that Jack is responsible for her. If she wants to become a queen, he will make her a queen. If she asks to restore her race, he will help. If there are problems, he will solve them. Therefore, she should not allow such thoughts anymore. After listening to the boy, Charlotte began to say awkwardly that her mother used to say that nothing in this world is free. Hearing this, the young man falls into a stupor and then smilingly agrees. Then the girl continues to say that she has nothing to give. Looking at Charlotte's face, the protagonist says that she really has nothing to give now. But one day he will ask her for a favor, and she will only have to do it. Clutching Valentine, Charlotte gladly agreed to help her boss. After finishing the conversation, Jack suggests that they take their things and then go for a walk. A few minutes earlier, Rommel has agreed to arrange everything with the acceptance of the new student, and their new home will be organized in two hours. But it would be difficult to live alone in a large house, so several people would be sent to help him. Smiling, Jack agreed, saying that he would be only too happy. And he is grateful for the director's kindness. For a long time, the protagonist thought that this was a pretext to follow him. The young man was brought out of his thoughts by Milos with her gaze who began to say that the young man said quite the right things. In his views on racial differences, respect for the individual came first, and the woman thought he was a fool, but it turned out to be the other way around. Holding Valentine, the guy could not understand whether it was a compliment or a reproach, but with a sigh he decided to accept it as a compliment. Finally, the group arrived at their destination, where someone was already practicing sword swings. Seeing the stranger practicing the moves, the guy decided that he didn't care. While Milos pulled the guy's ear and said she wanted to watch more. Sitting on a bench, the group began to watch the stranger. Looking at the boy, Jack concludes that he is 17 years old and tall. Then he decides to check how much mana the student has. Looking at him, the protagonist could not believe what he saw. The stranger had a fourth circle, but the strength was like the second. Realizing this, the protagonist was disappointed 
and asked the mentor why she was interested in the young man. Looking up at him, Valentine replied that Jack was worried that she might take on a new student. Continuing to watch the boy, Valentier said that the stranger was in his fourth circle, so he was curious about what interested the woman. Milos replied that Jack sees only a general characterization and nothing more. Because of these words, the protagonist began to study the student under the watchful eye of his mentor. They sat watching the training for a while. Suddenly, Charlotte noticed that the guy had been training for a long time and could faint at any moment. Besides, he had a lot of bruises. Through the girl's words, Jack himself began to notice this. Milos turned to the young man, asking if he still didn't understand what the woman was hinting at. After a moment of thought, the boy began to smile and answered that the student had one circle broken. Valentine confirmed this, saying that it is difficult to restore a broken circle, almost impossible. Besides, it was hardly anyone's fault. The student seems to have done it himself. That's what she likes. And one more thing. Milos wanted to add something, but decided that it made no sense and did not do so. However, Jack thought that he could guess what his mentor wanted to say. It wasn't just physical strength she was after. The basis for any black magician is death, destruction, and endless revenge. The perseverance to restore the broken circle, the willpower to pick up the sword time after time, despite the great wounds and the hatred hidden inside. Having finished his thoughts, the protagonist approached the stranger and addressed him. He asked what the young man needed. Surprising the student, Jack replied that the guy was straining his arms too much. His right hand is too tense. He needs to try to swing his sword more accurately, unless he wants to die. In addition, he is too focused on breaking the circle, so it would be better to protect his heart. He should try to change his attitude to what is going on in his head. After listening to him, the tired and bewildered student asked who he was. Jack replied that he was just a spectator. And isn't it a shame for a guy with such a physical form to be so weak? The student was embarrassed by this question, which disappointed Jack a bit. The main character gave the new friend an elixir. The young man's hand held a higher level liquid with a grape flavor. Seeing it, the stranger did not understand why the young man gave it to him. Smiling, Jack said that he gave it to him for free. Thinking about what one elixir he could give away, since that jerk Gonzalez was rich enough. Suddenly realizing something, the protagonist asked the stranger what his name was. The stranger stumbled a bit and replied that his name was Thanos. After learning his name, Jack was about to leave, but the guy stopped him, asking the name of the person who gave him the elixir. The young man said he was Jack Ballantyre, and now he had to go. Perhaps they would meet again. As Valentine was leaving, she noticed that her student did not know how to carry on a conversation. While Charlotte thought the boss was pretty cool, looking at the back of his new friends, Thanos suddenly realized something. The elixir was given to him by the same Jack Ballantyr. An idiot and a stupid bastard, the son of a marquee who can only eat and sleep. I think that's the kind of rumor that goes around about Jack Ballantyr. And everyone knows them. From the beginning of his studies at the academy, he was unrivaled in terms of academic performance. In the first semester, he had DS in all subjects, although it may not have been him. Sometime later, at the estate near the academy, one of the servants, seeing the new visitors off, said that this estate was built specifically for the Duke's guests, and if Jack needs anything, he can tell the servants. Looking at the servant, Jack concludes that it is the same servant of the director, John Doe. The same pseudonym was used by another man who was famous for his cruelty. While Valentine was staring at the servant, the guy smiled and said that the Duke's estate was really on a completely different level. It's a home for aristocrats, but it seems as if they want to interfere with the inheritance of the title in the Ballantyre family. Or is that not the case? John, who is concerned, responds that his personal emotions are not important. He does what his master tells him to do. Rubbing his head, the boy agrees with the words that all such Tao are just servants, but the man is clearly hiding his true identity. I wonder if the director knows about it. John did not understand what the young man was getting at. Meanwhile, Jack continued to talk about this strange hood that hides the man's face. He's been meeting a lot of jerks lately. As far as he knows, there are very few ninth circles in the kingdom and he is obviously very lucky. So he asks just in case, isn't John a spy? 
After this question, there was a pause in the air. It was interrupted by John's laughter, whose mask began to fall off. The man began to say that he had even stopped the flow of mana in his body, but the young man could still see him. The director's request to watch some kids surprised him at first, but now he understood everything. The stranger was the owner of the Tesla Tower, Bellamy Craig. In the war between Tesla and Tolkien in his past life, he was the one who stayed with the director until the end. And now, the man wondered how the young man realized that he was a polymorph. With a sigh, Jack replied that he would not have guessed before. However, he had recently killed a polymorph. Concerned, Bellamy said that he was the owner of the tower and the rector of the Faculty of Magic, and the boy was still an ordinary student, so he should be more polite. Angry, Jack jabbed a finger at Craig, saying that in that case, the man should have introduced himself right away. Or does he like to make fun of people and then demand respect? So today, the guy has every right to be disrespectful, as he has revealed Bellamy's true identity. Resigned, the man agrees that he should have introduced himself right away. Then, looking at the boy, he said that he was amazing. Doesn't he want to learn magic from him personally? The protagonist didn't like this idea much. He said that he already had a mentor. Craig said that it must be Elizabeth. She has great abilities. He wanted to make her his student, too, but she refused at once. But this time, the man would not give up so easily. After these words, Bellamy grabbed the young man's hands, asking him to become his student, or at least a tutor. Suddenly, Valentine interrupted their conversation, turning to the child with the nine circles and asking his name. Hearing that the toy was talking, the man fell into a stupor. Jack introduced him, saying that he was the owner of the Tesla Tower, Bellamy Craig. Hearing the information, the woman assumed that this child in front of her could freely reach the tenth circle. It's just that in the past, someone attacked him when he tried to do so. Bellamy was surprised by this insight. Meanwhile, Valentine continued to say that the shape of the tenth circle is still inside the man. She can see the remnants. Hearing this, Craig concludes that remnants are visible in those who have a broken mana heart. Glad that Bellamy has a theory, Milo starts talking to him so that he doesn't give up. It is difficult to develop at his age, but he has already tried to do so, so there are chances. If a man tries at least not for himself, but for his tower and those in it, he should show his best. Thinking about the words, Bellamy asked the toy's name. The toy replied with a satisfied sigh that it was better for Craig not to know. Let him consider her an heir to the past. At the end of the conversation, Jack said that Charlotte was waiting for them. So let Bellamy tell the principal that the boy will come to see him on the first day of classes. After that, leaving the teacher, Valentine began to say that she was even sorry. Some people have no talent, but they try their best, and some people have talent, but they don't want to develop it and just sit around. Hearing this, the young man began to complain that his mentor did not tell him anything. Milos said that the guy had used a dark dismissal at Gonzales. Therefore, she had nothing to teach the young man. Heading to the house, the protagonist thought that the last thing he learned was the dark release. In addition, even the owner of the tower came to watch him. Well, let him keep an eye on him. Seeing Bellamy looking at Jack, the maid asked him what he was thinking about. He replied, walking away and looking up at the sky, that he was thinking about his conversation with the director. In which Rommel asked if Craig didn't like the guy. The man replied that he wouldn't say that. He's a great fighter for his age. He's only been in the second round at most, and he's defeated a sixth-rank magician. So the guy is quite dangerous. After listening to his interlocutor, the director said that this was not all. The boy brought a girlfriend with him and said that they would attend classes at the academy together. Hearing this, Bellamy began to say that he did not understand why the director trusted the boy so much. He could cause a war with the Tesla Empire. Enjoying his tea, Einhardt said there was no need to rush. Over time, everything will become clear where this young man will lead them. There was a pause in the air, during which Craig reflected on the fact that he was still somehow uneasy. He said that if the headmaster thought so, there was nothing he could do about it. But he added that he would not want Essimble to interfere in the disputes of the Marquis's house. Noticing these words, Rommel asked if the Ballantyre family had not already chosen a successor. After a pause, Bellamy began to say that he knew the heirs to the Ballantyre family very well. The first, Elizabeth, 
could become a master, but this idiot is using her in his political games. The second has a third circle at the age of 17. Their academy is full of them. The guy is not particularly smart. And Craig himself has never seen anyone waste their life so much. The director is already old. So the man recommends not getting involved in politics and giving up the title of Duke. Why should Einhardt get involved in such a complicated matter? Besides, for missing classes, the boy could have been sent to single dorm rooms, but he was given a whole house outside the academy. It all looks like favoritism. 100% rumors will spread. Laughing at this, Einhardt said that he and Bellamy had known each other for more than 30 years, so his feelings were understandable to the director. However, Essebel is really old, and he has a feeling that without the young man, he might lose something important. Isn't that strange? The interlocutor agrees, which makes Einhardt laugh, making his friend worry and saying that the house will be ready soon, and the man can go there and check it out personally. Dissatisfied with this outcome, Bellamy nevertheless agrees. Recalling this conversation after the meeting with Jack, Craig realized what the director meant. Seeing the smile on the man's face, the maid asked why he was so happy. Looking at the girl, Bellamy replied that everyone has the right to smile. Meanwhile, in the mansion on the second floor, Jack summed up that in addition to the maids, there was one cook and five watchmen. He told the staff to work hard, and he would help them. He also loves steaks. He needs a good breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The vegetables must be fresh and without magic. Everything must be of a high standard. Distracted, the protagonist thought that, of course, the food here could not be compared to Ron's. Then he continued to say that he also loves strawberry and tomato juice, and he needs them every day. When he was done, the young man pointed at the staff, asking if they understood everything, thinking that since they were here, he should take full advantage of them. And it seems that the cook's name was Guinness. He looks like an idiot. He will be useless. The boy is unlikely to remember the names of the guards, so he will call them the Five Musketeers. Having finished his thoughts, Jack turned to the guards and said that they were either murderers or informers brought back by the old man. He blew the men away. But he continued to say that it was clear that they, like that guy, had broken hearts of mana. And they probably don't know it, but at the academy, you can create new circles of mana, perhaps imperfect, but still. Hearing this, one of the guards was surprised and asked if the young man would ask the director about it. Pointing a finger at him, the boy replied that he might. The main thing is that they work well. The conversation with the staff was interrupted by Charlotte, who attracted the young man's attention, waving at him and saying that there was plenty of room. Waving back, Jack thought that now they would take a look at their rooms together. The principal gave Jack a house on August 9th. School starts on the 16th, and today is already the 14th. He lay on his bed thinking about how quickly five days had passed. He and Charlotte had bought clothes, explored the city, tasted the local food, and enjoyed a play. It had been fun. Apart from two things, the time had been great. The young man was brought out of his thoughts by the ringing of the clock, which announced that it was time for the young man to go. Jack ran out for a run thinking that this was the first moment. Now he is not very good with mana, but he is still very weak physically. Suddenly, Charlotte appeared behind him and started jogging as well. When he saw her, he told her to catch up with him, otherwise he would run without her. After finishing the race, the tired girl asked if they would go back to see that young man. Smiling, Jack confirmed it. It was the second moment of his routine, watching Thanos practice. The protagonist watched the student show up at the training ground every day and reflected on the fact that he had been watching the guy for five days in a row, and he was trying hard. Of course, the boy has no talent, but even with such diligence, he can become the first in the academy. But there is no need to think too much, Jack still likes women. In particular, the protagonist's attention is drawn to the injuries on the student. With these thoughts in mind, Ballantyre asked Thanos why there were more and more injuries every day. Hearing the question, the student did not understand why the guy cared. Jack concluded that the young man had not taken the elixir he was given. Realizing what Ballantyre was talking about, Thanos simply shook his head. Seeing this reaction, the protagonist asked what happened to the elixir. The guy replied that the bottle was worth a hundred gold pieces, and he would definitely repay the debt. Angry at what Thanos had done, Jack began to wonder why the young man hadn't drunk the elixir. 
The boy's injuries were serious. He definitely has several broken bones. His legs are also damaged. A little more time, and he will not be able to move. While the main character was flying in his thoughts, Thanos began to return to training. Meanwhile, Jack continued to think about the fact that the young man continues to train despite the severe pain. Every day for the whole week. This is not possible for an ordinary person. Could he really spend all his days like this? When Jack finished thinking about it, he said that he didn't understand why people like Thanos get so little out of life. The student did not pay attention to this, continuing to swing his sword. Meanwhile, Valentine snorted and turned to Ballantyr, saying that she didn't really feel sorry for the young man. As her student, Jack should understand how much Thanos is filled with hatred and greed. You could even say that these qualities are driving him forward, but it's the other way around. If you don't know how to control them, they will lead to a complete collapse. Is the young man growing? Definitely yes. But at the same time, he is regressing. After listening to the mentor, the boy thought that he had already seen enough. Now he has to decide whether to hire the boy or not. With these thoughts in mind, Jack turned to Thanos, asking why he was raising his sword. To Ballantyr's surprise, the student replied that he really wanted to become the best swordsman on the continent. The fact that the young man said it frankly. Surprised, Jack started laughing. Turning his head away, Thanos said that the boy could laugh as much as he wanted at his dream. Calming down, the protagonist said that he was not laughing at the dream and thought that he just wanted to understand how much greed was in the young man's heart. And now he realized it. Getting even closer to Thanos, Jack offered to become his chicken, which surprised the student. Meanwhile, Charlotte was humming along, carrying a teapot with the thought that boss must be thirsty. As she approached, she saw the boys talking about something. Jack was offering the student to become his chicken. Surprised, Thanos asked him to repeat himself. After repeating the words, the young man asked if the boy agreed. He rubbed his head and replied that it didn't sound very good. Agreeing with him, the protagonist said that maybe Thanos could become a dependent. Not understanding what was going on, the student asked what that meant. Smiling, Jack said that it was something like a vassal. Hearing this proposal, the young man said that he was just a commoner. But Ballantyr did not care. Lowering his head, Thanos continued to say that he didn't even have any money. But Jack didn't care about that either. The student said that he had heard about Ballantyr's family, but the guy in front of him did not look like the man he had heard about. Realizing that Thanos must have heard of him at the academy, Jack asked what the young man had decided. Pausing and tensing, the young man began to say that he had no money and no talent. He'd better find someone more worthy, because he doesn't think he can be useful. Looking at him, the protagonist thought that Thanos was quite nice. He is not worried about himself at such a moment. With these thoughts in mind, Jack said that the young man wanted to become the best swordsman on the continent. How could an aristocrat not need such a warrior? Or was Thanos not sure that he could achieve his goal? At this, the student fell silent. Then he just said that he knew perfectly well that he had no talent for mana. Hearing this, Jack turned to his friend, saying that the guy might know something and not know something. But the young man has something better than a talent for mana. With this speech, to the student's surprise, the protagonist took the young man by the hand, reflecting on the fact that there are already a lot of mana possessors. Even farmers have a talent for mana, but they cannot develop it properly. That's why they die without realizing what they've kept inside them. Jack himself has a talent for mana. He didn't know about it until he met his mentor. The world that the boy sees is not the same as others see it. With his own eyes, he saw mana flying around and the world around him. However, as a child, he did not know what it meant, so he could not develop it properly. There is no need to be frivolous in this matter. Everything is much more complicated than it seems. After finishing his thoughts, the main character continued to hold the student's hand and said that Thanos has a talent for suffering, and there are not many people who are ready to go all the way for their goal. There is no need to doubt yourself. Of all the people Jack has met, he believes that Thanos will succeed. The student was embarrassed by these words and wanted to say something, but the conversation was interrupted. Three students approached the young man and told him that he had a homeless friend. Looking at them, Jack thought that the semester hadn't started yet, so he didn't expect to meet anyone at the academy. 
and now he will have to deal with the students for the sake of peace in their home. While the protagonist was thinking about his own, Thanos said he had to go. Meanwhile, one of the group of students began to scoff, saying that he had already told this poor idiot not to behave like that with others. The guy was just a dirty commoner, and he didn't seem to have gotten enough. Standing in front of Jack, Thanos asked him to leave because his classmates had come to him. Now it became clear to the protagonist that all the wounds on the young man's body were made by those bastards, and this made him very angry. Meanwhile, the bully from the group asked if the newcomer had given the elixir to the commoner as well. Looking at Thanos, Jack asked if the elixir had been taken from him, and Thanos replied that he would definitely return the money. Realizing that his gift had been lost, Ballantyr sighed in disappointment, saying that Thanos should not allow the miserable trash of society to take advantage of him. Hearing himself called trash, one of the bastards became irritated. Meanwhile, Thanos kept telling him to leave, otherwise he would get hurt too. Looking at him with a keen eye and smiling, Jack began to say that he was not going to leave, and if his elixir was taken by these bastards, he would have to deal with them. And those two, behind the back of their boss, were given five seconds to escape. Smiling smugly, the bastard in charge said that these two were with him. Resigned to this, Jack took a stand, deciding to help the three of them get out of here and to show them that they shouldn't touch the future best swordsmen on the continent. There are five Marquises in the Tesla Empire. They are real aristocrats with lands, not those who receive the title for achievements and magic circles. One of the five Marquis, namely Marquis Herman, lives in the East. His family has one problem child, a future young lord, Dietrich Hermann, who will soon graduate from the academy. It all started with the murder of a maid at the age of 13. At 14, he became addicted to substances, and at 15, to women of dubious origin. There were even rumors that he was not only using, but also selling. The future of the Herman family was uncertain, as Dietrich was the eldest son. However, he was not allowed such freedom at the academy. The descendants of emperors and dukes study here. There were too many eyes watching his actions. So he had to make a toy for himself, or rather, he had to find one. A commoner. A student who found himself in the academy for some unknown reason. It turned out to be Thanos, who was just training at the training ground. The student was immediately beaten and abused, watching him writhe in pain. And Dietrich broke his elixir too. For the bottle he broke, Thanos received even more beatings than usual. Recalling this, the excited young man watched Jack punch one of the scum right in the face. And when Herman tried to attack from behind, but he reacted quickly and knocked the weapon out of the bastard's hands. Meanwhile, the young man was dealing with the group. Charlotte and Valentine just sighed because it didn't surprise them anymore. Looking at Jack, Thanos could not understand what kind of aura the guy had. Finally, having finished with the scum, the protagonist defiantly wiped his sweat saying that he had stretched himself a bit. Meanwhile, the beaten Dietrich tried to say something. Seeing that the guy was still conscious, Jack asked if the bastard's servants were idiots and weren't going to intervene even now. The battered Herman did not understand what his opponent was talking about and said that he would contact his father. The last thing Dietrich saw was the leg of an angry Jack. Having finally finished with the bastard, the young man began to call the servants who were hiding in the shadows. They immediately appeared, asking the young man to stop. But they said that the young man did not even realize who he was dealing with. With a sigh, the boy said it didn't matter. Then he asked Thanos whom he had beaten. He replied that it was Dietrich Herman. The exhausted bastard regained consciousness, saying that they had no right to speak his name. And again he was kicked in the head by Jack, who said that he would give exactly three seconds for the servants to explain why they allowed the idiot on the ground to beat Thanos. Gritting his teeth, one of the shadows rushed at Jack. But the boy easily dodged the blow but he was not unpleasantly surprised by the spell he heard. One of the shadows began to conjure, saying that mana mixed with bright red blood and pitch black darkness, causing an explosion. Listening to this, the protagonist thought that this was the best magic for the sixth circle. It is an explosion magic with a long range. Exploited. This servant wants to destroy Thanos, the platform, and the kid with his mentor. With this thought, in response, the protagonist began to collect his mana with the words that the shadows are really idiots, concentrating all the mana in his hand. 
Jack thwarted the explosion before it was released. Thus, he neutralized one of the enemies. Seeing the joyful boy, the second one rushed right at him. It wanted to hit the young man with its claws, but he successfully dodged and counterattacked right into the man's stomach. Having overcome the pain, the shadow pulled out his blade and tried to stab the young man. However, the guy easily knocked the weapon out of his hand with his foot. He approached the enemy and said that he must have a headache to think so stupidly. Then he grabbed the servant by the neck and began to strangle him. The man still tried to do something, but quickly lost consciousness. The enemy, who was injured in the explosion, asked who the guy was. Letting go of the body of the unconscious servant, Jack thought that now the man's mana was blocked in his body. He was unlikely to restore it. However, he could have disrupted the entire academy. What a bastard. The wounded enemy still wanted to know how the boy had managed to stop his magic. But Jack decided that the magician didn't need this information. Instead, the protagonist asked why they were mocking Thanos. Although there was no point in listening. For them, a commoner is just a toy who can't even complain to anyone. And if so, then they must compensate for the elixir. Irritated, the bastard said that the elixir was not so important compared to the fact that the boy had become an enemy of the Herman family. Hearing this, the young man smiled and said, he said that he didn't care about someone else's family, but the elixir was his. One bottle was worth a hundred gold pieces, and since they had taken it five days ago, then now they will settle for five thousand gold pieces. Although where would the servants get the money from? After stepping on the magician, the young man went to Dietrich, who was lying on the ground, and began to say that he would not beat him anymore. Just let him give him everything he owed. A few seconds later, Jack was holding 2,000 in cash and 60 gold coins. Leaning over to Herman, he said that he was lucky. If they hadn't had the money, they would have been finished for sure. Angry, Dietrich finally decided to ask who had beaten him. Smiling, the protagonist took the bastard by the hair and said that it was too late to introduce himself, but his name was Jack. Hearing this, Herman shouted out in surprise that he was really Jack Ballantyre. How is this possible? Is this the younger brother of Palon? Looking at Dietrich's frightened face, Jack thought that he now realized what kind of friends his older brother had. And now he felt even more comfortable making fun of Herman. With these thoughts in mind, the young man said that he didn't touch ordinary people, but people like Dietrich were exceptions. After these words, the young man put his shoe in the bastard's mouth and started saying that people like Herman have only a last name. Even the bastard circle is made as a result of the mana of higher level mages. He himself can do nothing but mock those who are weaker. And he's lucky to have the disease. But when they turn 20, the boy will definitely throw his corpse into the lake behind the academy. So he should remember Jack, who lives in the mansion behind the academy. If the bastard wants revenge, he will be waiting for him. But next time, the guy won't stop. With these words, the protagonist pulled his shoes out of Dietrich's mouth, who wet his pants in fear. Having finished with this situation, Jack turned to Charlotte saying that it was time for them to go. Then, passing by Thanos, the young man clapped him to attract his attention and said that the offer was still valid. So the student can come to him. They have a great cook in their house, and the young man will be able to eat as much meat as he wants. Here, Thanos didn't say a word. On the way home, Jack was thinking about the fireworks festival tonight. The magic of explosions in the sky. He had nothing to do anyway, so he would go see it. In the province of Alborg, there is always a fireworks festival two or three days before the start of the semester. It's a great opportunity to welcome new students and transfers. And even though Jack had to see some disgusting things today, it's usually not that bad at the academy. All the bigwigs of the empire were mostly trained here. The emperor, two dukes, the emperor's wife, the princesses, they are all graduates of the academy. Usually, graduation from the academy guarantees a good job. But if you cause problems, expulsion will not be long in coming. While chewing his food, the protagonist was thinking about this and the fact that in four or five years, in the past, the Tesla empire was wiped out. Therefore, he hopes that all the bastards will soon take a break. Suddenly, Valentine caught the young man's attention, saying that it was terrible. This made him think he was speaking out loud. But Milos was not talking about that, but about what had happened. Namely, the attack on the academy. 
The woman did not understand why there were guards here at all, if they allowed such things to happen. When he heard this, the young man thought that his mentor, who was one of the founders of the academy, clearly did not expect this. According to the first paragraph of the first article of the Special Law on Behavior on the Academy's Territory, all students are equal. There is also a group of inspectors who regulate the internal discipline of students. Article 1, Paragraph 2. Everyone must be neutral with regard to political views. Of course, such institutions would be beneficial. While enjoying his meal, the young man said that such an ideology would be useful, but it changes over time and the norms are set by those who are in a position to settle down. Thinking about her student's words, Valentine surprised the boy by telling him that she had hidden something, dragon blood and dragon bones. Realizing what she was talking about, the boy rubbed his head awkwardly, saying that he could tell her about it, but it would take a long time. Not surprised that the young man already knew everything, Milos just sighed and pushed the boy and said that he didn't need to tell. Smiling, Jack agreed with her. Meanwhile, Fireworks appeared in the sky, and the festival was already in full swing. Looking at it, the protagonist thought that he hadn't been in such a world for a long time. Unexpectedly, Charlotte attracted the guy's attention, asking how the boss was so good at fighting. The young man replied that he just had a lot of experience. This answer made the girl ask if he had killed a lot of people. To the sound of fireworks, the young man replied, Yes, a lot of people. Then Charlotte asked another question, which meant that the boss really came from the future. To this, the young man said that it would be more accurate to say that he had come back 20 years ago. Having said that, Jack remembered telling Ron this information. Back then, he said that he had died by accident. Continuing the conversation, the protagonist said that in truth, he saw the girl for the first time in his life. He often visited the city, but had never seen her. More precisely, the young man met vampires only in the forest of monsters, and he hoped that Charlotte understood what he was talking about, but it was the girl who simply remained silent. This made Jack think that when Vivian died, Valactus told him that he had come to kill Charlotte. So, Charlotte from her past life died when she was only ten. Having finished his thoughts, the young man asked why the girl had asked about it. Blushing and embarrassed, she replied that she too would like to fight as well as the boss. The protagonist recalled that it was a familiar feeling for him, a difficult past and a heart that wants to change something. Realizing this, he stunned the girl by saying that if so, they would start training tomorrow. After that, he took her by the cheek and said that there was nothing to be surprised about. She wants to learn, after all. So tomorrow they will make her a mana heart and see how she manages to control it. Against the backdrop of fireworks, Charlotte thanked the boss. He smiled sincerely as he imagined what the future held for them. Meanwhile, in the Hermann's house, servants trying to calm the young master were being punched by a furious Dietrich, who was just throwing a chair against the wall. The angry boy stood in the middle of the room, foaming at the bastard Ballantyr, and thought that, even for a second, Jack's gaze was frightening. He had also wet his pants in front of him. These thoughts made Dietrich even more angry. He began to swing his sword destroying everything around him and swearing that he would do the same to his offender. Enraged, Herman decided to kill Jack Ballantyre himself. At that moment, returning home with Charlotte, the protagonist was thinking about the fact that the second day of the semester had already begun. Many out-of-town students have arrived, but he wants to see Ron because his steaks are the most delicious. And now he is shivering and his head is spinning for only one reason because the red sauce on Charlotte's burger is his blood. Watching the girl eat, the young man asked her if she was enjoying herself. She happily replied that it was delicious. Suddenly, something caught the group's attention. Thanos was sitting in front of the gate. Jack approached him and asked what he was doing here. The young man looked directly into his friend's face, and the latter, unable to bear the look, lowered his head, saying that he had come to ask a favor. A few minutes later, Jack pointed to the table and told the anxious guest to eat whatever he wanted. After that, while sipping wine, he said that they would find a room for the new tenant. Not to be left out, Charlotte also offered Thanos something to eat. With wet eyes, the young man looked at the gorgeous food and couldn't stand it any longer and started to cry. Seeing Thanos's tears falling on his lap, Jack fell into a stupor. Meanwhile, the young man could not stop shedding tears. 
Glancing at Guinness, the young man told him that the cook was in a hurry, because this time there was too much onion and it was cutting his eyes. Smiling, the cook agreed with the young man, and the dinner continued. The next day, a happy Jack greeted his new friend and asked if he was feeling better. Rubbing his head in embarrassment, the young man apologized for his behavior and, equally embarrassed, asked if Jack would ask him the same question. Patting the young man on the back, he replied that he was certainly a little curious, but everyone has their secrets. Having said that, the smug protagonist thought that in this way he could earn Thanos' loyalty, and his mentor was looking up to him. Meanwhile, Valentine, who had actually seen the situation, was disappointed that her student was playing the hero again. At that moment, alone, the boy asked his friend if he knew that he didn't have to attend classes, and if he did, he could stay here. This news stunned Thanos, and Jack continued to say that the young man now had his own room, and if he gets hungry, he can go to Guinness. After that, the guy pointed his finger at the guards, saying that he could call those five the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. They are here to watch Jack, so it is better to make friends with them. After listening to the boy, Thanos asked if this was not the Marquis estate, to which the protagonist replied that it was originally the guest house of the Duke of Ozenblatt, and now it is a gift he received from an old man. As Thanos was leaving, he thanked him for this information. Stopping him, Jack asked if he was going to train again. Thanos confirmed this, saying that if he missed even a day, he would become weaker. After that, the student went back to practicing his swing. Looking at him, Ballantyr thought that Thanos's injuries had been healed by the elixir he had drunk before eating. And maybe it was the elixir that made him cry yesterday, not the food. While he was thinking about this, he was called by Charlotte, who was standing in her gym clothes, ready to start training. With a satisfied smile, Jack said they would start by doing laps. It was already night. Exhausted, Charlotte fell to the ground. Looking at the tired girl, Jack said that she had done a good job today. Realizing something, Charlotte asked if she could use mana now. Smiling, the boy confirmed it, thinking that although he had guessed, the girl was really amazing. She uses mana perfectly, which is at a high level. It was as if she had been practicing with it for a long time. To manage to create the first mana circle in 10 hours is a good result. With these thoughts in mind, the young man gave the girl his hand and said that they were done for the day. Gladly accepting the help, the girl tried to leave, but fell down on the bench from fatigue. Looking at Charlotte, the young man concludes that she is really exhausted. Suddenly, Jack's attention was drawn to Valentine's voice, which said that it usually takes two to three days for beginners to create their first circle. She didn't understand why he didn't tell Charlotte about it. Smiling with satisfaction, the young man imagined Bellamy asking Charlotte to be his apprentice, thinking that he would have done the same in the man's place. But without his help, it would have taken the girl at least a whole day. This is a magic circle on the ground that draws mana from the air. You can use it to collect mana and use it to create a barrier. And having collected the mana in the middle of it, the young man simply passed it to Charlotte. It's easier, but this method is not for everyone. That's why the girl is still a good girl, since she managed to create such a clean circle in such a short time. While the boy was thinking about it, the woman said that it was interesting that the young man wanted nothing in return for his help. To this, the boy simply remained silent. On his way back to the mansion, the protagonist saw the student looking worried about something. So he asked him if he had been crying again. This attracted the young man's attention and he turned away and denied it, asking when Jack had returned. The young man replied that he had just arrived. And seeing the red rings around the young man's eyes, he thought, saying that the boy must have reached his limit. The student confirmed this. Why did he ask Jack if Thanos was planning to surrender? The young man lowered his head and simply fell silent. Deciding to add fuel to the fire, Jack said that the kid managed to reach the first circle in just 10 hours. And Thanos must be jealous of her, right? He definitely is. He hopes she doesn't have a talent for fencing, doesn't he? Or did the boy think it was easy to become the best knight on the continent? Thanos could barely hold back his tears and began to tremble. Then, unable to stand it, he fell to his knees and cried, saying that he hated himself at such moments. Looking at the young man crying, Jack did not understand how he could be such a crybaby. So he asked again if the boy was ready to surrender. 
Is the best knight on the continent really going to give up because of a girl? With these words, the protagonist put his hand on the head of the student who was in tears, saying that he could still realize his dream. But it won't be easy. He mustn't give up. So let him keep trying. Hearing these words, Thanos began to say that this was the first time someone believed in him. No one took his dream of becoming the best knight on the continent seriously. Everyone laughed at him for being so stupid. Realizing what he was talking about, Jack asked what was the point? Reaching out, Thanos took the boy's hand, thanking him for believing in him. Looking at him, the young man smiled and told him to try harder. Because in his experience, only skills will never betray you. With that, Jack looked at the crying Thanos, thinking that he was the best knight on the continent right now. But how could he refuse this little child in the body of a big man in front of him? Suddenly, feeling something, Jack removed his hand from Thanos's and turned in the direction of the sound he heard, devouring his gaze on the way to him. The protagonist felt a familiar sensation, and he didn't like it even more. Irritated, the guy said that they had an intruder. Hearing this, Thanos did not understand what the young gentleman was talking about. Smiling madly, Jack ordered the boy to take the baby and go to him. Thanos agreed and left the boy. Meanwhile, the young man, rubbing his head, began to say that he had certainly invited the bastard to die, but he could not have imagined that he would actually show up. Using his Minachi, the protagonist began to look for the guest in the corners. Examining the area, the guy saw the staff lying on the ground and thought they were still breathing. It was obvious they were just unconscious. While Jack was doing this, Valentine came to him with Thanos, who was holding Charlotte in his arms. In a half-asleep state, she told him to let the boss go to dinner. But dinner was still far away. A group of shadows led by Dietrich stood in front of the protagonist. Smiling with satisfaction, Herman said that they hadn't seen each other for a long time. With Jack Ballantyre, no less pleased, the guy told Dietrich that he was a scumbag, and he warned him not to let the bastard come back. At that moment, Dietrich was thinking about the fact that he was the future Marquis of the Great Eastern Province. The world is ruled by only one power, and his family's power will soon be his, so why keep the annoying Jack alive? Of course, there may be problems with the Duke of Ozemblum, but Jack did stab him, and there are witnesses to that. This will cause a second dispute between their families. Standing with the boy is the master of the Fentanyl Guild, Ventimon. No matter how strong this jerk Jack is, he can't beat a strong man with a ninth circle. Earlier, the guy had already explained what the target was, namely Jack Ballantyre, who was at that time training with Charlotte, who was transferred to the academy by order of the director. At that moment, the young man was pleased with this information. No matter how talented she was, it would take at least two days for the mana to take hold. Further information was that Jack's staff included a cook and five servants, and they could be killed, but it was better to prevent a direct dispute with the Ozenblatt family. There was no chance of mobilizing the Knights of Ozenblatt, because by the time they arrived, a fire had started in the basement of the Duke's estate, and everyone would be busy fighting it. Everything was perfect, and they set off exactly when Venomon gave the order. That's how it was. It was a special order for 500,000 gold pieces. And now, Jack Ballantyre will be finished. Relaxed, the protagonist just waited. Suddenly, Charlotte and Thanos appeared in front of him. The latter began to say that he would detain them, and the young gentleman could escape. He thanked Jack for believing in him, and that this situation was entirely his fault. Therefore, the owner does not need to intervene. The young man will definitely apprehend them himself. Looking at the backs of his wards, the protagonist was happy that they had voluntarily come to his defense. It was a pleasant feeling for the guy. As he went to the front, along with Valentine, he told them to hide behind him. He would not let the kids get hurt. After that, the young man turned to Dietrich, saying that if he wanted to die, there was nothing to be done about it. Since it happened, they would all have to. The angry young man was stopped by Milos, who stood before Hermon alone. Seeing her, Dietrich did not understand why the toy was moving. Under the full moon, Valentine began to glow. It was so bright that it blinded the enemies. After that, the fog that enveloped her along with the light began to fall away, showing everyone the woman of legends. Everyone stood there in shock, looking at the great heroine who had been able to raise this continent 
and all of humanity to the top of the pyramid in the past. She returned after a 400-year break. When Jack saw her, he bowed and said that he had been waiting for her. And at the same second, he was hit in the face by a woman. Falling to the ground, he asked why his mentor had hit him. The haughty Valentine replied that now the young man had to remember how he had ignored her opinion when he had dragged her out of the cave by force. He didn't care what she said or what she thought. But Milo's words did not move the young man. He simply admired her beauty. While Valentine said that it was a punishment for the young man. When Jack got up, he surprised Dietrich by pointing his finger at him and ordering him to give him his coat. Does he not understand what is happening? Let him give the coat back quickly. Frightened, Herman throws his clothes to the guy anyway. He, in turn, puts it on his mentor, saying that it is very cold now. And he does not regret pulling the woman out of the cave. He had to do what he thought was right. But everything turned out well. Hearing this, Valentine ironically asks what would have happened if she had wanted to die there? To which Jack replies that he does not know what she wanted, since he is her student. After a pause, Milos began to say that maybe she was wrong. After all, all people are just animals who follow their desires. And knowing this, she thought that the world created by humans would be different from all other worlds. But she was wrong. There is no difference between humans and other races. So, that day, the boy pulled her out of the cave because she subconsciously wanted to. Rubbing his head, Jack agreed with her and said that he knew his mentor hadn't made any bad decisions in the past. But by trusting someone he shouldn't have, he had failed to fully see what she had been working toward for so long. After some thought, Valentine said it was true. That cave had become a prison she had created for herself. And it seems that now she is in debt to her student. Looking at this whole event, Dietrich began to worry. Meanwhile, Jack was thinking behind his mentor's back that he thought the woman didn't consider him her student, but just an annoying child. So her words were quite pleasant. While the young man was thinking about his own thoughts, Valentine began to release her mana directly at the group of enemies, saying that they had come to eliminate her student, so she asked them not to be angry with her when nothing was left of them. Gritting his teeth, Dietrich ordered his men to attack. Seeing the attack, Milos stopped time for everyone except Jack and began to cast a spell so that the black tar that covers the earth and colors the sky would return to this world at her command. After the spell was completed, death itself followed the woman. Meanwhile, somewhere in the Tolkien Empire, an unknown man was drinking wine. Suddenly, feeling the witch's mana, he fell on the sofa. One of his servants asked if Mr. Begerman was all right. He replied that he was. But he began to think that he had already had such an unpleasant feeling before, but perhaps he was just imagining things. And on an island in the Black Sea, when one of the dragons felt Valentine's mana, he said that there could be no doubt. The past energy of the soul and the present energy obviously belonged to Valentine Milos. He still had a gap in his heart that this woman left. Agreeing with his friend, another dragon said that he would like to forget her, but he can't perhaps because she is still alive. But a person cannot live for 400 years. How much longer is this woman going to rule the world? The sorceress continued her spell. As she did so, the figure summoned by Valentine's mana was reflected in Jack's eyes. The statue that appeared unexpectedly began to scream, radiating mana right at the enemies. Watching this, Dietrich began to worry because he had never seen anything like it. In front of Herman, there were wounded soldiers lying in agony. Now the boy himself understood. This was death. Looking at his arm, which was slowly disappearing, Dietrich began to scream. But more than that, he was frightened by the very summoned creature that was right in front of him. As he disappeared, Hermann began to bargain with Valentine. However, Milos just looked at him as if he were trash. Finally, death touched the boy and he simply disappeared from this world leaving only dust in front of the witch. The portal in the sky closed and silence hung in the air. After that, Valentine turned to the group, and seeing her, a frightened Charlotte said that Ms. Valentine was indeed the final boss. These words caused an uncomfortable silence, after which, the woman reached out to the frightened girl, putting one of her hands on her head and the other on Thanos' shoulder. The woman told them that Charlotte de Royale, who inherited the noble blood of her ancestors, and Thanos, 
a warrior who moves forward without obeying anger and his desires, are called Valentine Milos. She is the mentor of a stupid student from the past, and she hopes that they will take care of her. There was another pause in the air. Having understood something from the sorceress's words, Thanos said that she was right about everything but one thing. The young gentleman, or rather Jack, is definitely not stupid. These words surprised Jack himself, and Thanos tensed up even more as he stood before the magician from the past. With a sigh, Valentine agreed, which caused her student to boast, which the irritated woman immediately interrupted, poking him in the forehead. In the silence of the night, Valentine asked to be left alone with Jack. Finally, the protagonist told Charlotte that there was his blood in the kitchen and she could drink it before going to bed. Also, let Thanos wake up the staff on the premises and go to bed as well. Having understood their orders, Thanos and Charlotte left Jack and Valentine alone. Waving to them, the guy said that he would not be bored with such a company. To this, the woman simply remained silent. Smiling, the young man asked what the mentor wanted to talk to her student about. Milos began to say that she had been thinking seriously about the words the boy had said in the principal's office, the words she had heard sitting on Charlotte's lap about the blood and bones of the dragon. With a sigh, Valentine continued to speak about immortality. It is natural for a person to want to live forever and never grow old. It is the heterogeneous system that has become a continuation of the study of immortality. Does this mean that the dragon's blood and bones are connected to this? After bowing, Jack confirmed this, saying that all people want to live long. But, in the end, this is not enough. You want to live a long time and still be healthy and young. During a study of immortality that was conducted in the distant past, one of the scientists expressed an interesting idea. It is impossible to live forever, so why not start living like dragons? For thousands of years, races that have lived for many centuries, such as vampires and dragons, are different from species whose blood, organs, and even bones are short-lived. The rate of body aging, the number and quality of cells, and sensitivity to mana intake. After that, the experiments became interspecies communication experiments. Heterogeneous mating was only half successful. It was a complete failure on the way to eternal life, but people were able to use the power of orcs and elves. But there was one problem. After gaining the power, one lives for five to ten years. Nevertheless, the experiment, conducted more than 400 years ago, is still being conducted in the Tolkien Empire. In two years it will be completed, and the life expectancy of half-breeds will increase to 30 years. After hearing this, Valentine said that she thought she had killed everyone 400 years ago, but apparently not. At this, Jack shook his head, thinking that his mentor had learned about the experiment too late. She tried to destroy it by burning all the documents related to it and killed all the half-breed monsters. Even though they begged for help, scientists, mages, knights, and so on, all died by her hand. The woman destroyed all the documents, killed everyone who was somehow connected with the experiment, but she missed one point. After finishing his thoughts, the young man said that his mentor should have killed the dragon lords. These words took Valentine by surprise. She was upset, saying that in order to destroy the dragon lords, they most likely gave their own as wards for experiments. Jack confirmed Milos's guess. And then the woman said that the two lords were eager to infiltrate the human world. To which Jack began to say that the experimental dragon was someone about whom it is unnecessary to say much. This is a half-breed of the future who can use soul energy. Just like he and his mentor. The surprised woman added that this meant that the dragon that became the material for the experiments was the child of two lords. And Jack confirmed this guess, saying that among the existing dragons, only two lords can use the energy of the soul. And of course, their descendant also has a talent for it. A heterogeneous combination of the tenth circle holders of the Tolkien Empire and the child of two dragon lords. Thanks to their talents, they can easily break through the mana wall and use soul energy. After listening to the young man, Valentine turned to him, asking what he wanted. Jack did not understand her question. And then Milos clarified that she was a person from the distant past, and she doesn't want to be connected to this world, but she can't stop being interested in it. Since a guy knows about the future, he must have some kind of plan. This is what interests the woman. In response to such curiosity, 
while Thanos was dealing with the unconscious staff, the young man replies that he knows nothing. In any case, the experiment will be completed only in two years. In a year, he will have grown to the fifth or sixth circle and plans to go to the Tolkien Empire during the holidays. Smiling, Jack added that they would also have to destroy all the laboratories and kill everyone involved in the experiment. While the boy was talking to Valentine, Thanos was taking the staff to the rooms. With a wave of her hand, Valentine repeated Jack's words that they would go to the Tolkien Empire. She surprised him and asked if he had to wait for the vacation. The boy began to worry because his mentor had already started warming up. He told her that she had said that she did not want to interfere in world affairs. Valentine replied that she just had to make sure that everything was over, so she thought it would be right if she intervened this time. Jack's mind racing. He realized that his mentor was going to go to the Tolkien Empire right now, and he can't even stop her because she is his mentor. And she's right. For the Tolkien Empire, the explosion of the laboratory will be a big problem. More specifically, for the radicals who want to unite the continent. The reason is that radicals are conducting experiments on interracial relations. Now she doesn't remember the resentment from the past, which remained forever only with the boyfriend. In fact, now that she thinks about it, they annoy the young man as well. With these thoughts in mind, the young man asked if his mentor could open up another space. He just needs one sword. A very good one. Raising her hand defiantly, Valentine smiled, saying that the young man even knew that. And cutting the air with her palm, she cut the space from which the sword began to appear. Putting out his hands to receive the weapon, Jack thought that it was the same famous sword that had been crafted by mermaids in the past and personally forged by the king of the dwarves. Then, showing the blade, the boy waved the sword saying that they had not seen Solarian for a long time. Opening the gap, Valentine took out another mask and said that the boy needed to hide his face and handed it to the boy. Taking the mask in his hands, Jack began to think about how he felt the magic that covers and opens his face, as well as a strange flow of mana. With these thoughts in mind, the young man asked what kind of mask it was. Valentine replied that she did not remember. She had bought it at some market. Glancing at his mentor, the protagonist put on the mask, saying that the woman had items that even he did not know about. After that, he began to mock her, asking if she ever spied on men in the bathhouse using this thing. Valentine hit the guy on the head in anger, and turning away from the young man, said that she needed the coordinates for teleportation. To the woman's surprise, Jack said the numbers 37541 and 129986. Milos asked if these were the coordinates of the capital of the Gunnar Empire, and the young man confirmed that they were, thinking that 400 years ago people were at the very bottom of the racial pyramid, but even they had their own country. The Gunnar Empire was the Minter's homeland. Having found out the necessary information, Valentine began to conjure up the words that the laboratory was under a landmark. The radicals had a good idea. A second later, the portal began to open. Halfway through, Milos asked if Jack was ready. Smiling, the boy replied that he was always ready. At that time, one of the doctor's servants said that the man was a genius for having invented the union of man and dragon, and he is honored that Heinz B. German himself praised him. But could he ask why the doctor had just done so? Not understanding what the servant was talking about, the man asked him what he had done, and the servant clarified that the man had suddenly held the glass. So perhaps he had done something wrong? Looking at his glass, Heinz began to say that he just had the feeling that something had appeared in their world that did not belong there. But this is impossible. Therefore, it is not worth talking about it. Now let them get back to the point. When did his ward start experimenting on people? Excitedly, the servant said that he had an idea, and the experiments on animals had shown excellent results. So far, he is most concerned about reducing the life expectancy of the subjects, but if the experiments with cell activation, the man stopped his interlocutor with his hand and looked at him with his green eyes and asked when he could start? In a trembling voice, the ward replied that he could see that the doctor was as interested in the experiment as the crown prince. It's hard to find materials for experiments nowadays. If only they were available, then for sure. Hearing this, Begerman quickly concluded that the scientist needed test subjects. The man confirmed this. Rising, Heinz called a maid who put on his coat and said that he had only one question. 
What would a scientist call a person who would be created from the union of a dragon and a human? To which the man immediately replied that they would be called half-breeds. After giving the scientist a parting glance, Begerman said he liked it. Suddenly, Heinz stopped at the exit and turned to the scientist and asked if he had arranged a meeting with someone. The latter did not understand what the man was talking about. Then Begerman clarified that he felt someone's mana flow, and it was clearly the energy of a master. In a moment, an explosion came from the ground, and the man put a barrier around it. The explosion was so strong that it destroyed the room and forced Heinz to strengthen his barrier. However, everyone felt the force wave, especially the scientist, who did not understand what was happening, looking at the flames that engulfed the building. One of the servants asked if it was the end, to which Begerman replied that it was not. They are attacking. In the same seconds, there was an even bigger explosion. It even made the man strain. The barrier began to give way, and eventually Heinz went into the wall. Spitting his blood, he cursed those who had done it. Returning his gaze to the unconscious doctor, the man wondered what was going on here. Meanwhile, in the dungeon, the bodies of people were already lying lifeless on the ground, washing the floor with their blood. Jack stood with his mentor, who said that it was just horrible. There was a dragon hovering in front of the group, and when he saw it, he felt the urge to kill. It was a very deep and big emotion that even moved Mana around. Looking at her student, Valentine asked what he was going to do. Smiling, the young man replied that his mentor should just leave everything to him. Milos agreed, and put her hand forward and cast Hellfire. Looking at the spell, the young man said that it looked great even in this life. And yet it looks like a fire. Suddenly, the young man realizes something and thinks that they must be on the third floor. Who would have thought that these are the remnants of a civilization that disappeared hundreds of years ago? While Jack was thinking about this, Valentine, clapping her hands, had already finished her part of the job. Hearing the roar, the boy turned to the dragon and looking at it, thought that in his past life, this subject had begged for the boy to kill him. This time, however, everything was different. With these thoughts in mind, Jack drew his sword and stood in a stance, gathering mana around him. A second later, the dragon looked in shock as a stranger flew at him, who easily cut the chains. Under Valentine's watchful gaze, the shackles fell to the ground, and the dragon itself fell to the boy's feet. Touching the dragon's head, the boy said that for some reason he thought it was for the best. It was just that 18 years had passed, and he doesn't even know what to say. The dragon looks very tired. The protagonist looked at the dragon, realizing now who the one who begged him to die was. Sitting next to his old friend, the boy asked him if he wanted to live. Abandoned by his parents, he was a material for experiments. Falling into the wrong hands, the dragon gave up his flesh and blood. Now it is no better than livestock. People used to make armor from its skin. Blood and bones were used for interracial experiments. And if it didn't work, they tried again and again. And of course, no one was interested in the experimental subject's opinion. Eventually, the dragon would go crazy. But one day, it would lose its will, forget all resentment, and just beg for death. So does he want to be used and just die? Now he can live in another faraway place. A little dragon with no name, his freedom should come first for him. So the young man asks one last time, does the subject want to live a normal life? Shedding tears, the dragon tried to say something. But not hearing him, the young man told him to speak louder. If he wants something, he should shout it out with all his heart, so that even those who had abandoned him could hear. With tears in his eyes, the dragon cried out that he wanted to live. Looking at this scene, Jack thought that in the past it was he who had killed the lizard. In this life, it was also a possible option. But in the past, the boy did not want to kill. He just had to do it. What could be better than eternal peace for someone who has lost his soul? However, this dragon is not a dragon from the past. It asked to be killed, and now it is begging for life. Of course, the boy must save him. With that thought in mind, Jack smiled and said that they would return home together. If his mentor doesn't mind? Hearing this, the woman just sighed with satisfaction. Seeing Valentine's reaction, the boy realized that she liked the dragon too. Suddenly, someone interrupted the scene. Heinz stood behind the protagonist. Looking at the man, 
the dragon began to tremble. Meanwhile, Begerman himself drew his sword, saying that he would not repeat himself twice. So let the strangers say who they are. Seeing her husband, Milos said that the young man could do as he pleased. Rising to his feet, Jack replied that even if his mentor hadn't said so, he would have done just that anyway. Realizing that the thieves would not respond, the man clenched his sword and rushed at the young man. But Jack took the blow and, irritating his opponent, began to push him back. Begerman tensed up from the fight and sparks began to fly from the blades. Smiling, he thought that Heinz should have been at that level at that time. This reaction angered the man even more. He shouted that the boy had no right to smile. This amused the young man even more. After deflecting the boy's sword, Begerman took a stand to collect mana. Seeing this, Jack thought that the man had the tenth circle. Even among the masters. Heinz, one of the best mana wielders. No wonder he is considered one of the strongest on the continent. With these thoughts in mind, the protagonist began to release his mana himself, saying that the man was still not strong enough. Feeling the young man's energy, Begerman remembered that it was the same as the one he had felt recently. Meanwhile, Jack was already heading for his opponent. The boy attacked from the knee, but the man successfully blocked the lunge with his sword. However, the force of the blow cracked the blade, and Heinkins had to jump away. Determined to finish off the sword, the young man struck at the weapon, splitting it and attacking the man. Valentine just watched the fight, as did Beggerman's servant. At the end of the duel, the man lay unconscious, leaving only a mark on the wall. Approaching him, the protagonist said that he did not even think that Heinz would lose consciousness so quickly, and it was disappointing. Meanwhile, the man himself had already regained consciousness and looked at the guy and got scared, asking who he was. Looking at his opponent's fright, the young man smiled and replied that the man did not need to know. Rising to his feet, Begerman stood in front of the young man, who began to speak a prophecy that there was a person familiar to the young man. So far, the boy is very simple and strong only in his dreams, but the day he becomes the best knight on the continent will be the day Heinz dies. This prophecy made the man angry, so he screamed at his seer. The latter, in turn, just stood there waiting for the attack and did nothing until the man got close enough so that, with a glance, the boy could find a vulnerable spot and cut off the man's hand. In a moment, Begerman was looking at the place where his arm should have been, and Jack, who finished the lunge, said that Heinz was still weak. It's amazing and a bit of a pity. After these words, the young man threw several kicks at the man, sending him back into the wall. And this time, Begerman fell completely. Approaching him, the protagonist began to say that it was only his opinion. He asked Heinz to become much stronger. Having said that, the young man began to reflect on the fact that Begerman serves the rightful heir to Tolkien. And the prince is the head of the faction of supporters of cruelty, the source of all things. In just a few years, all their heads will fall off their shoulders. So if it's too easy, the guy won't be interested. Having finished with Haynes, the young man turned to the one who was with him, saying that he was also very weak now. He was Beggerman's student. I think his name is Mirnos. The fact that the stranger knows his name makes the guy panic. While Jack was recalling his past, that he remembers that in his past life, when he killed Beggerman, he was attacked by a knight. Of course, he immediately cut off his head and didn't remember him clearly, but still, remembering this, the protagonist began to collect his mana, saying that the student and the teacher are one. Therefore, you cannot cut off the hand of one and leave the other. In a second, the chains were already coming at the young man, wrapping his body. When this happened, fear appeared on Marengo's face. Grabbing the chains with his hand, Jack began to squeeze them, thus tightening them on the arm of Beggerman's disciple. Feeling a hellish pain, the young man finally loses his arm. Falling to the ground, he starts screaming, asking where his hand is. Valentine began to get bored with this case, so she asked if her student had graduated yet. He replied that yes, he had. After that, the woman reminded him of the dragon they had to pick up and teleported everyone back to the manor. Afterwards, Milos noticed that Jack looked like he was bored. Taking off his mask, he says that he's just used to it. Then he turns to the dragon, asking his name. The excited lizard stumbles, 
and replies that his name is Selba Hammett. Looking at the excited dragon, the protagonist begins to stroke his head, saying that this is enough. What's the point in the surname of the parents who betrayed him? From now on, his name is just Sel, and first they will heal his wounds. Seeing the smiling face of his savior, the dragon lowered his head in embarrassment. After a while, Sel was already sleeping in the mansion room. Meanwhile, Valentine asked Jack what he was going to do with the dragon lords. The young man replied that he did not know. The one who needs to be worshipped comes first and bows. It will be strange if the strong finds the weak. He smiled. Milos wondered if the guy really cared about her that much. Rubbing his head, the young man said that it was true. But then he thought about the fact that his mentor was 400 years old. In the past, she had accomplished many things and created the basis for the existence of the human world, which now does not even remember her name. For the sake of such people, she did not need to intervene at all. With these thoughts in mind, the young man got down on one knee and took the woman's hand, saying that he would deal with the lords himself when the time came. Therefore, she no longer needed to sacrifice herself for the sake of people. Looking down at him, Valentine simply remained silent. Then, rising from her seat, she agreed with the young man. Seeing that his mentor was heading somewhere, Jack asked where she was going. Milos replied that they were covered with a layer of dust and smoke, so she was going to wash. The young man just wished her a good time. Valentine went to the bathroom, hanging up her coat, and after a while came back into the room in a bathrobe. When Jack saw her, he immediately said that she looked beautiful. Ignoring these words, Milos said that the young man could use a bath as well. Entering the bathroom, he began to take off his clothes, but as soon as he touched his body, he stood in front of the mirror all gloomy. Leaving the empty bottle behind, the young man climbed into the bathtub, saying that he might become addicted to the elixirs. A few minutes later, Valentine saw that the boy was not dressed in his sleeping clothes, so she asked him where he was going. Sitting down on a chair, Jack replied that he was going nowhere. Looking at her student, Milos asked him if his wounds hurt much. Smiling, making his mentor sad, the young man said that his wounds hurt a lot. He even thought he was going to die. But now everything is fine. Lying in bed, Valentine says that judging by the young man's clothes, he is not going to sleep tonight. Jack, who is happy, says that he heard that his mentor had been watching over him for the entire three days he was unconscious. After these words, the protagonist thought about the fact that Ron told him this information. All three days while the boy was unconscious, the mentor was watching him. That's why Ron thought that it was just a quality doll. Having finished thinking, the young man says that now he will look after his mentor. She always loved to sleep. However, Valentine did not hear these words as she fell into a deep sleep. To the sound of the clock, the protagonist sat on a chair watching his mentor with the thought that sometimes he thinks that if they had met earlier. If he had met the woman 400 years ago, when she was born, with these thoughts in mind, Jack began to climb onto the bed and, looking at Milos's face, continued to ponder how she could be called the most horrible necromancer terrorizing the entire continent. She was so beautiful. A few hours earlier, in the dungeon prison of the Duchy of Ozenblatt. In the dark prison, Mark was being interrogated by a man chained to the wall, who said that Blutus had been with the Duke for ten years. Had he really been spying on the head of state for so long? With a satisfied smile, the prisoner raised his head, answering that there was nothing wrong with that, master of the tower. On the other side of the bars was Bellamy, clearly not happy, who began to say that the head took care of Mark. He took him in and raised him, and Blutus stabbed him right in the heart. There was only a short response from the prisoner, so? With a sigh, Craig said that this meant that all Mark's work and sincerity was just a game. There is no testimony no evidence. How much longer does Blutus think he can keep quiet? Angry, Bellamy decides to ask one last time, to tell Mark everything he knows. In turn, he just smiled, saying that the owner of the tower really doesn't know, or is just pretending. Craig did not understand these words. Looking at the prisoner, the man thought that it was amazing that even in such a situation, Mark felt too confident, and this is despite the fact that his circle was destroyed. Where does this confidence come from? While Bellamy was thinking about this, 
Blutus was wondering if the tower owner had thought about everything that had happened over the past ten years. Did he really think it was a coincidence? Why did the previous owner of the tower decide to become a citizen of the Tolkien Empire? Why did so many Tenth Circle Masters leave this country without question? And why were so many mages summoned under the pretext of clearing the forest of monsters? The man replied that Marco would speak when the torture began. At these words, Blutus starts laughing madly. When he calmed down from laughing, Mark asked why he hadn't been tortured yet, why Duke Ozenblatt was still keeping him here, despite the fact that he was a traitor, perhaps because they are not sure what will make such a traitor talk. With these words, looking at Blutus, Craig began to think that the prisoner in front of him really did not look like someone who had been tortured. He had been in prison for five days, but he hadn't lost any weight. In conclusion, Mark said that the owner of the tower needs to think carefully. Is there really a future for this kingdom? After finishing the conversation, the man walked away. He did not understand the reason for Blutus's self-confidence. Is the kingdom completely rotten already? Is that why Mark is behaving like this? Tomorrow he will be transferred to the castle. But there will probably be no official trial. Everything will be decided internally. But Blutus is not afraid. He is quite confident. Does he really believe that he will survive? I think so. Craig. For hours later, a fire broke out in the underground prison. And the man was already rushing to the prison. But to his surprise, there was only a corpse there. And it was not camouflage. Blutus was definitely dead. This puzzled the tower owner even more. Later, this morning, Jack said that no matter how much he thought, the dragon still stood out. When Charlotte saw Cell, she began to behave like an angry cat, while Thanos couldn't believe it, that he was seeing a real dragon. Pointing his finger, the guy asked if it was really what he thought it was. Jack confirmed it, and the young man almost threw up. The dragon that was supposed to die and disappear is here now. Looking at his friend's reactions, Jack thought it was amazing to realize that not everything people know is true. And yet, Charlotte behaves like a wild cat who has seen the enemy. Because of this, the protagonist puts his hand on her head, telling her not to look at Sal so angrily. This is not the Valactus she remembers. Holding her nose, the girl agreed with the boss. While Ballantyr was talking to Charlotte, the guy saw the dragon's reaction and took him by the head and told him not to worry. No one would eat him. The protagonist wondered if an ordinary sword could harm a dragon. Never in his life. No wonder dragons are called blessed animals. Most likely, it was Begerman who used the body of a dragon for the sake of experimentation. Nevertheless, the young man was able to kick its ass. Of course, Cell is now afraid of him. After finishing his thoughts, holding the head of the excited lizard, Jack said that he looked a little different after sleeping. Which is understandable, he is a handsome man. Cell just shook her head. She made the boy think that this was probably the dragon's way of expressing submission. In his past life, Cell almost lost himself. But now, he thinks that the dragon will be better off than ten years ago. But that's not quite true. Cell is still worried. As far as he knows, the dragon must be about eight years old. And if you think about it, only unfortunate creatures have gathered around the boy. In the paws of a lizard. At night, Valentine used a spell on the dragon to restore them. And this, of course, shocked Sal. It was amazing that such an injury could be healed in a minute. While the protagonist was thinking about this, Milos came into the room and said that she thought the dragon would stand out too much and used another spell on Sal. At first he didn't realize what was happening, but in a second he began to turn into a human. A minute later, a little girl was standing in front of everyone. Shocking Thanos and Charlotte and satisfying Valentine with her work. Looking at the woman's smiling face, Jack reflected on the fact that his mentor now looks like an ordinary person. She shines, and you want to look at that light. Noticing her student's intense gaze, Milos asked if today was the beginning of the first semester ceremony. The boy confirmed this, but said that he had to leave. Thanos and Charlotte should be there too. Having decided that, the young man turned to sell saying that they would be back soon, so she could rest. And by the way, what do dragons eat? Surely they have some kind of food preferences? Fish? Meat? I don't think she's a vegetarian. Does she like steaks? Listening to this, Cell asked what a steak was. This made Jack think about what she had been fed in the dungeon. It must have been horrible. 
Realizing the situation, the boy put his hand on the girl's shoulder, saying that he would ask the cook to prepare something for her. And now she has a task for her. The view from the roof is just wonderful. If she gets bored, let her go up to the roof and think about what she will do next. These were the last words of the young man before he left for the ceremony. De Einhardt had already given a speech to the students about how many years ago a country called Tesla appeared. The academy was also founded in those days and managed to grow a lot of talent. There is nothing eternal in the world. Everything eventually falls into decay and disappears. Hearing these words, the main character thought that this is not what he heard in his past life. You are the hope of the kingdom. Be confident, students of the academy, and focus on your studies. The old man should have said something like that. As Jack thought about it, Ramel continued to say that the same thing would happen to the current generation. It is not visible from the outside, but the kingdom hides a very dark shadow behind it. The students started whispering at the principal's words. Meanwhile, the protagonist agreed with Essimble's words. Based on the fact that yesterday the Minter blew up the laboratory, however, two-thirds of the Tenth Circle Masters and Tolkien are still supporters of the cruel party. Of course, they will win the battle for the throne of Tolkien, and in a few years, war will definitely break out. The old man knows a lot. I wonder if Blutus told him about this? While Jack was thinking about this, the director was already coming to the end of his speech. Einhardt concluded by saying that their kingdom was built with the blood and sweat of their noble ancestors who had given their lives for them. They were very resilient, and so are they now. So let the students remain steadfast on their path. They are all dear students of this academy. The academy yard was in a tumult after the ceremony. Stretching out from boredom, the protagonist thought about the fact that there were no lessons or events on the opening day. That's why it's all over. Perhaps it will be necessary to visit the old man. You need to thank him for the house. Suddenly, Jack's attention is drawn to someone in front of him. Calling out to his brother and frightening him, the young man approached the company and asked when his brother had arrived. The frightened Palin replied that he had arrived yesterday. Satisfied, the young man looked at his brother, who was scared to death. Then, to the older man's surprise, he put his hand on his shoulder, saying that the boy looked great. He can already drink water. They should at least greet each other. They share the same blood. Isn't that right? And why doesn't Palin answer? Does he want his bones broken? The frightened older man could barely squeeze out the answer that he did not want that. This satisfied his younger brother, who was ready to kill the young man on the spot. Having finished the conversation with his brother, Jack sent him to his friends. However, the latter took one look at his younger brother and just started running away. Meanwhile, Charlotte appeared behind the young man and asked if the boy was related to the boss. Jack denied it. This aroused new curiosity by calling him a blood brother. The young man said that he was. However, not everyone who is related by blood is family. At this, the girl just looked at the guy. Noticing this, the protagonist put his hand on her head, telling her not to think about it too seriously. At that moment, Charlotte suddenly asked who she was to the boss. What puzzled the young man? who looked at her sweet face and thought what kind of nonsense she was talking about. Was she going through puberty? With these thoughts in mind, Jack said that she was his family. This certainly satisfied Charlotte. And for the protagonist, these were not empty words, but 100% true. When he considers someone his person, they become his family. Those he cares about, those he is responsible for, become his family. And Thanos and Valentine are no exception. The young man thinks that he really shouldn't be with that idiot, but with the people around his mentor. While Jack was indulging in joy, Palin's friends wondered what was wrong with him. The frightened young man did not understand what they were talking about. Then one of the students clarified who the guy was. Is he really Palon's brother? He looked like a retard, but it was strange. If you look at them together, you could mistake Palin for the retarded one. These words made the young man feel angry with helplessness. As he walked away, he thought about how the thought of the younger man scared him. Why is he even afraid of him? He's a scumbag, and he was his toy anyway. With these thoughts in mind, Palin headed in the other direction. This caused his friends to say that he must be bipolar. Heading to his younger brother, the boy called him out, calling him an idiot. Hearing this, Jack looked at the older man with a scorching look, frightening him. In a second, the protagonist was already hurting his brother 
wondering if he had just addressed him. Frightened, Palin looked away, telling him to shut up. As he walked away, Jack said that his brother was really boring. Looking at his back, Palin thought that he had overcome his fear of water, but why was his heart beating so fast? He had never experienced anything like this before, so he didn't even realize he was injured. When Jack arrives at the principal's office, he finds out that Blutus is dead and wonders what's the big deal. This shocks Einhard a bit. Chewing on another gingerbread man, he says that he doesn't care about the dead at all. After that, he asks if that's all. Ramel answers that it is. That is all. Then the guy thanks him for the mansion. He likes the house very much. And the cook, surprisingly, is a great cook. While the young man was talking about this, Essebel thought that it was strange that the boy did not react to Blutus's death. Meanwhile, Jack was about to leave, but the principal asked him to stay, which surprised the young man, and began to say that as far as he knew, the boy had entered the first year of the fencing department. Was he thinking of transferring to the faculty of magic? These words clearly surprised the young man. That's why he said that the director must have been asked to do so by the owner of the tower. But in any case, he was not going to attend classes. Sooner or later, the laws of the academy will be revised. In response, the director said that a group from the student council had reported that there were students like the boy who used lightweight methods and did not attend classes. After these words, Ramel just waited for an answer, and the young man, in turn, thought that the academy's laws would indeed be revised in the second semester of next year, and that talks about it had already begun. While the young man was thinking about this, Einhardt said that in that case, he would have to attend all classes. However, if he transferred to the Department of Magic, his time for classes would be reduced. After hearing these words, Jack thought about the fact that he certainly needed a document about graduation, but he really didn't want to attend classes. Will it help the other students to have someone like Jack studying with them? They will have to put up with his character. With these thoughts in mind, the protagonist agreed with Einhardt, saying that he would attend class once a week. Rubbing his beard, Ramel smiled, saying that three days a week sounded better. Here, Jack says he has no plans to attend the academy at all. He has nothing to learn here, and he has the best mentor in the world. Such words provoked a question from the director. Why did the boy come here? Was he also looking for a house nearby? To this, the young man replies that he needs a certificate, and that's it. This surprises Einhardt, so he clarifies that he really needed it to enter the Academy's treasury. The Academy's treasury. In the Teslon Empire, a graduate of the Academy is given not only a graduation document, but also armor, cloaks, a staff, a sword, a spear, a shield, and so on. In the middle of the treasury is a magical weapon with 400 years of history. Each generation of graduates can take one of its types with them. Because of this, the director says that everything valuable has already been taken from the treasury, and it is unlikely that the sword the boy needs is left there. Of course, there is no such thing in the duchy. However, from an ordinary sword, the director can make a sword worthy of a squad captain. It will be better than any weapon in the vault. Hearing this, the guy concludes that it's definitely not free. Then he thinks about the fact that Bellamy Craig is a man who, as everyone knows, has been loyal to the director for more than 30 years. He needs an apprentice. At first, it was his personal desire, but now the principal wants to make Jack his student. Being like this is beyond Einhardt's years. With these thoughts in mind, the young man says that since he is going to enroll, it would be good to organize everything as soon as possible. Smiling. Ramel says that now the young man wants to jump a year of study, but they will come back to this later. Now they need to decide between one and three days a week. Perhaps the boy will agree to at least two days? With a sigh, Jack finally agrees. Hearing this, Einhardt says that if that's the case, then the young man's first year at the Faculty of Magic begins today. Interrupting the headmaster, Jack says that he will not become an apprentice to the Tower Master for now, because he has a sharp eye and he needs to see Craig's mana first, to see how talented he is and how much he has grown. The young man's skills in magic are much higher than anyone can imagine. Hearing this, Einhardt begins to say that the boy has a talent for separating good and bad. If this is true, the headmaster will take responsibility and make the boy a marquee. This puzzles the protagonist, which is why he starts laughing, surprising Ramel. After calming down, 
Jack says that he doesn't need to be a marquee. Having finished with this, the protagonist headed for the exit, but Einhardt stopped him, asking what happened at the mansion yesterday. Recalling the staff lying unconscious, Jack replies that nothing happened. Ramel then asks him if this is exactly true. The excited boy begins to say that he went to check on the staff because they hadn't prepared food. They were all unconscious. The guy didn't ask what happened, but it seems they just started a fight with each other. Well, the director should know that children fight when they grow up. Having finished with this, Jack bows, saying that he really has to go. Then he quickly jumps out the door. And looking up, he sees a painting. Looking closely at it, he sees his mentor. Meanwhile, Valentine, who remained in the office, thanked him for the tea. Looking at her, Ramel thought that he had been in the political arena for decades, and his senses were hard to fool. He had seen hundreds of aristocrats, knights, and even kings, but he had never felt anything like he did in front of this woman. Every little movement she makes is extraordinary. The director is sure that she is a unique woman. While Einhardt was thinking about this, Milos, standing by the window, began to say that Ezenblu was more suited to the title of general than headmaster. Einhardt replied that he had fought on the battlefield before, albeit briefly. After these words, Valentine continued to say that so did a child named Bellamy. Tesla has a lot of talent. Will Einhardt be able to protect them? And does he even think about it? Excitedly, Ramel wanted to answer, but Jack burst into the room, shouting, What is the mentor doing here? And why isn't she leaving? Essembol's reaction was to stun him, while Valentine said that their obstacle had arrived. And the guy shouldn't be acting so careless, she was just about to leave. Smiling, the young man said that he was just wondering why his mentor had been gone so long. After leaving the academy, Milos and his student walked through the city, attracting everyone's attention with their appearance. Residents approached Valentine, offering her to try their products or have tea with them. But the woman simply turned them all away. Jack concluded that she must have gotten used to this kind of treatment. Continuing to walk around the city, the boy asked if the principal wanted to make Milos his student. Surprising her student, Valentine replied with a counter-question, asking if the boy trusted Ramel. Smiling, against the backdrop of the bustling city, Jack says that he trusts no one but his men. He and the old man have a different relationship. They need each other. That's why he shouldn't worry about it. With a smile, Valentine confirms this, saying that the guy would definitely not let himself be taken advantage of. At the end of this conversation, the group arrived at their destination, the Arabesque Guild. A happy Jack, shielding himself from the sun with his hand, says that they have come here for his money. The Arabesque Guild is a guild of mercenaries, hunters, and similar people. Anyone can be hired in this place. Opening the door to the building, Jack said that he knew for sure that if they needed a ninth circle mage, they would need more money than it might seem at first glance. Most likely, the ninth circle magician is the one Dietrich hired to kill Jack. However, what happens if both the one who paid and the one who took the order die? Upon entering the guild, the group was greeted by the secretary, who asked how she could help. The girl immediately met Valentine's piercing gaze. Meanwhile, Jack asked if he could meet the manager. With the idea that in the event of the death of both the hired man and the one who hired him, he would get all the money. With this thought in mind, the guy told the girl to tell the manager that there was a murder last night, the ninth circle. Hearing these words, the worker quickly realized the situation and was about to say the guy's name. But her colleague shut her up. Approaching her, the young man smiled and said that she did know him. So why was she so surprised? Of course, the guy could guess, but Dietrich, this idiot ordered here, didn't he? The girl was frightened by this turn of events, and her colleague said that she would get it later. Meanwhile, Jack continued to talk about how Herman did not meet them face to face, but tried to simply kill the young man with the hands of the guild. The frightened staff didn't even know what to say. And then, the young man gave them five minutes to bring the manager to him. With these words, the protagonist took out an hourglass and continued to say that otherwise, he would not look at the fact that they were the Arabesque Guild and would wipe them off the face of this continent. Time was slowly running out. While they waited, Valentine asked if her student was serious. Would he really destroy the guild? With a sigh, Jack replied that many groups that called themselves guilds in their empire, and guilds that used the word adventurer, 
were intermediaries, not independent institutions. They could be considered informants. In fact, the boy came to find out who exactly Dietrich had paid, and the mentor herself saw the reaction of that worker. After hearing this, Milos clarified that the girl knew about Jack and was surprised that he was still alive. The young man confirmed this, saying that if an aristocrat requests the assassination of another aristocrat through an agency, it literally means that they are telling the whole world that they will be killed. That's why the young man thought that Dietrich and the killer had met in person. Who knew he would use an intermediary? Herman was an even bigger idiot than he had first thought. While the boy was talking about it, Valentine noticed that everyone was looking at her student as if he were a dead man who had come back to life. With a sigh, the protagonist said that those who tried to kill him, those who wanted to make money and showed this place to Dietrich, they were all the same to him. Looking at the guy, Milos began to understand a little bit what kind of life he had. Meanwhile, the hourglass continued to tick away, when a frightened worker entered the office of the manager, who was eating fruit. Upon entering the room, the girl began to say that Jack Ballantyre was there. This shocked the manager, and he was even more shocked that Jack was alive. Meanwhile, the girl hastily said that the guy had introduced himself, and he asked me to tell you that there was a murder last night, the Ninth Circle. And the young man also said that if the head did not come in five minutes, the Arabesque Guild would disappear from the face of the earth. After listening to his frightened worker, the head thought that in his 34 years he had heard a lot of things while he was on the path to becoming the head of the guild but this was the first time something like this had happened. The Fentanyl Guild is a group of assassins who never make mistakes. The head of this guild is a ninth circle mage, but is his target still alive? With these thoughts, the man began to rise from his seat, wondering where this young gentleman was now. The sand in the clock was just coming to an end when the head began to come down, apologizing for keeping them waiting. Appearing before the guests on the stairs, the man introduced himself as a barrow, the head of the Arabesque Guild. When he arrived at the office, the head offered tea, but Jack wanted to get down to business as soon as possible, which surprised the man, who immediately asked if the young man had come to leave a request. Jack confirmed this, and looking at the glint in a bear's eyes, he thought that the head already felt the money that would soon be in his pocket, but in vain. With these thoughts in mind, the young man began to say that last night someone tried to kill him. The assassination order was placed through the Arabesque Guild, wasn't it? After a little thought, a bear confirmed it. Seeing that the head of the guild had no remorse, the protagonist concluded that the man should not hide it and continued to say that according to the law of the Empire, the Adventurer's Guild is an intermediary who connects the client and the hired hand, receiving payment for it. Smiling, a bear says that he did not fully understand what the young man was talking about. Their guild is legally protected. These words made Jack think that the man was telling the truth. Mercenaries need work, and they are sought after by those who want to do their work with the hands of others. That's why the Adventurer's Guild was created, connecting clients and contractors across the country. The Arabesque Guild is the largest medium-sized organization in the Teslon Empire, and its head is in hiding. According to rumors, he may even be a member of the Imperial family. At such thoughts, the young man sighed saying that he could imagine how much the person who wanted to kill him had paid. Angering Jack, a bear confirms the boy's words, saying that it was, after all, mercenaries from the Fenthalil Guild. But he himself does not know how much the white sum is. Hearing this, the young man says that he is here for that. He needs all the information about the amount and payment. A beer obviously did not expect such a turn. Meanwhile, an angry Jack says he doesn't like to repeat himself twice. Against the background of Valentine, who was just watching, the man hastily begins to say that he thinks the guy wants to entrust a task for the Arabesque Guild, but he is not their employee or hireling, so he needs to sign a contract. And not just in words, but a real contract with the Empire. These words began to infuriate the protagonist. But a bear continued to say that, for the young man's information, the clause mentioned earlier is the first clause of the contract and the clause of the real contract is the content of the second. The client, Jack Ballantyre, will have to determine the exact amount of payment for his request, specifically the down payment, advance, and commission. This influx of information began to drive Jack crazy, and unable to bear it, the guy stops the chapter, which surprises him, and says that he did not come here to leave a request. The person who wanted to kill him, 
and the person who helped him with it are the same. And a bear is clearly confused. With these words, the young man taps his foot on the table, thinking that the head did not refuse Dietrich's request, although he had a choice. Approaching the man, the furious Jack said that if he did not fulfill his order, he would kill all the guild workers. The frightened guild leader tried to say that he was under the protection of the empire. But the young man didn't care. He put his finger to a bear's chin and began to say that the man should know who he was talking to before the boy destroyed his impudent face. He would not continue. Let the head do his best to find Jack's money. He has a week to do so. If the guy doesn't have it by then, the Arabesque Guild will disappear from the face of the continent that day. After finishing this conversation, a bear almost fainted. Heading for the exit, the protagonist stopped at the door, saying in conclusion that he would conduct his own investigation later, and if he saw the difference between Dietrich's payment and the amount received, even if it was one gold, it would have its consequences. The man should not even think that there is a payment for his efforts or work. The boy hopes that the man realizes his situation. The pale abir just grabbed his face, confirming that he understood. At this point, Jack and Valentine left the guild. Meanwhile, looking at her boss, the worker asked if he was okay. A bear himself was sitting on the couch thinking that he was completely fucked. He shouldn't have taken that order. An aristocrat killing an aristocrat? Was that kid even in his right mind when he approached them for such a job? The man didn't even want to take the job. When a bear first read Dietrich's request, he immediately thought that he would never want to fulfill it and that only a madman could ask for such a thing. But when the man reported it to the top, he was told that he could not refuse the young Mr. Herman. The head promised to cover him. A bear introduced Dietrich to the Finthalil Assassin's Guild, and everything was going to end very simply. When he told his friend about it, he began to say that they were now being blackmailed by the youngest lord, who was not even in line for the throne. Hearing his friend Taliso repeat this, Aber became angry, asking if the Marquises were not his friends? Or could he not even understand what to say, and what not to say because he was new? To this, the young man only scratched his head awkwardly. Looking at the young man, the head thought that they had only hired him a few months ago. The guy really has incredible skills in gathering information, but it's not clear if that's all he has. While the man was thinking about it, the young man apologized for his mistake. With a sigh, Aber continued to think about the fact that it was impossible for Vintimon to suddenly become a raven and gather the most elite members near Ozenblatt. That would be worth 30 pieces of silver, but what if the target of the assassination was alive? The man continued to think about this in Talaso's company. Jack Ballantyre didn't know the amount of the contract, and he had no proof that the killer had left the province. Perhaps the killer was caught, but then the guy would know the amount. With these thoughts in mind, the man turned to Taliso, who immediately became agitated, saying that that idiot Herman was supposed to be at the opening ceremony today. The man denied this, saying that only his servants were staying at the hotel where Dietrich was staying, and that the security guards had not shown up since yesterday. After hearing this information, Iber grabbed his head in despair and suggested that they think about it. Then he began to tell the boy to imagine that he was attacked by a ninth circle magic wielder and thirty professional assassins of at least six circle. After imagining this, Taliso said that it was just horrible. Meanwhile, Iber went on to say that they were the professionals of professionals. There was no escaping them, but the missing Dietrich died, and the entire Fentanyl Guild was destroyed. The mission is a complete failure. A jubilant Taliso confirms this, which makes the man even angrier. He says that the target has returned alive. But is it normal that Jack doesn't even have a scratch on him? Taliso just stood there, not understanding why he was being asked. The head of the guild was thinking that even if the target was able to defend himself against the killers with someone else's help, he should at least have an emotion of excitement on his face. However, he was completely calm. There was no one special among the latest recruits in Ossenblatt. Even if the Marquis could have a few nights, even so, it would still not match up in time. Could it have been someone from the local area? Could it be the Duke of Isenblatt himself? Jack Ballantyr even lives in the Einhardt residence. If he's a high-ranking guest in the duchy, that's a good reason to protect him. But yesterday's fire in the duchy could not have been started by the army. The man is clearly missing something. Having finished his thoughts, Aber ordered Talaso, 
to contact the representatives of the Marquises de Ballantyre and to find out everything possible about Jack Ballantyre. Bowing, the boy said he understood. Then, Aber added that the young man should gather a group and search everything they could. They should find a place where Vintimon could have hidden the money. Suddenly, the leader remembered something else, which surprised the young man. The man said that he also needed to send a letter to the top, to tell them that Dietrich's mission had failed, that the fate of Fentanyl's mercenaries was unknown, and that Jack Ballantyr might be under the protection of the Duke of Oxenbull. And then there's that woman? Although, in principle, that's enough. After giving his orders, Aber wondered who the woman was. He had recently met her eyes, and an animal fright had enveloped him, but he would not remember her. With these thoughts in mind, the man was already standing next to the secretary, asking how the letter of apology was going. Meanwhile, Jack had already returned home. The first thing he saw was a fired-up Charlotte fighting Thanos with wooden swords. The girl jumped at her opponent from the mountain, but he successfully blocked her attack. Looking at them, the protagonist thought that they were hardly fighting seriously. It's probably just training. They look like chickens arguing over who has the strongest first circle of mana. Meanwhile, Thanos crossed his swords and deflected Charlotte's sword. Looking at this, Valentine thought about it. Then she said that it was strange. Did Thanos really think he could defeat that child last night? Thinking about his mentor's words, the boy remembered Begherman and told Valentine that it was true. As they continued to watch the fight, Milos said that Jack should realize that Charlotte did not hold a sword. The young man agrees, adding that now the girl is uncertain about him and does not know how to keep her distance. Hearing this, Valentine adds that even so, she's pushing Thanos around. Looking at how the student defeated the girl, the protagonist thought that from the outside it seems that Charlotte is losing ground, but in fact Thanos is losing ground. He is stronger than Charlotte, but it is impossible to say for sure who will win. While the young man was thinking about this, Thanos swung at the girl, but she parried the attack. Looking at Charlotte's achievement, the young man smiled and suddenly turned to Milos, offering to make a bet. She asked about the terms, to which Jack replied that in nine years Thanos would be able to defeat Begherman. Valentine was obviously surprised by this time frame and said that Heikes would become stronger himself in that time. Smiling, the young man said that his mentor was not afraid to argue. With a sigh, she agreed. Then the boy said that they would bet on a wish. The loser would fulfill the winner's will. Milos only said that she was curious how her student would make this child strong. As Jack walked away, he said there were many ways. Then he approached the group and said that they had had enough. Excited, Charlotte said that she and Thanos were not arguing. But the young man did not come to scold them. The young man addressed the worried Charlotte, saying that she had a talent for fencing. These words encouraged the girl. Then the young man said that she had succeeded three times. Charlotte did not understand what the boss was talking about. And Jack clarified that she managed to hit Thanos' sword three times. And this is a very good method of fighting when the enemy is stronger than you. If the guy hadn't interrupted their fight, she would have hit Thanos for sure. So she's good. She has talent. With that, Jack patted the girl's head and asked her to come upstairs and eat some cake. She could also play with Cell. Meanwhile, the boy would talk to Thanos. Looking at the student and then at the boss, Charlotte bowed, wishing them good luck. Left alone, Jack started talking about how Thanos had lost. It's a shame that Charlotte is so good at this, but she has a talent for close combat. Unlike the guy, it's easy enough to imagine how to overplay the situation when you're losing ground. Charlotte did it, even twice. But the student was confused and did not understand how to repel the attack. Another minute, and the young man would have been on the ground. Is it stubbornness or selfishness? These words worried Thanos. But Jack was not going to stop talking about the fact that the girl was physically small. However, such a small girl was able to understand the strength of the enemy and come up with tactics to repel the attack. What was the boy supposed to do in such a situation? It's simple. He should have changed his sword technique or strength to avoid losing control so easily. But he didn't. He just kept swinging his sword as before. This cannot go on. Therefore, he must be killed once. With that, Jack began to smile sincerely. Thanos was stunned by the news. Then Jack asked if the student wanted to train properly. Rubbing the back of his head awkwardly, 
The boy confirmed it. The protagonist began to laugh, pointing his fingers at the boy and saying that he would have to try hard to become the strongest on the continent. Then, with complete seriousness, he put his hand on the young man's shoulder, saying that he should be ready to die. And was he ready to try so hard that he would even risk dying? The student's hand began to tremble from this question, but he said yes with confidence. Happy with this answer, Jack turned to his mentor to help them. He wanted to use an illusion inside a magic circle. Hearing this, Valentine asked if the young man wanted to change the path of magic and create a partner for the kid to train with. The protagonist was once again convinced that his mentor was no ordinary person. Then he started drawing a circle. Looking at this, Milo said that it would take a lot of mana to create an illusion that looked like a real person. Meanwhile, Jack was already completing the circle. When Valentine saw it, she was surprised, asking if it was a combination of the rules of death and illusion. This is interesting. After listening to his mentor, the protagonist thought about the fact that the rule of death is a dark magic spell of the tenth circle. It controls a limited space, spreading black magic in it, and changing the path of mana in accordance with the caster's will. In this space, you can drive your opponent crazy and make them panic. And the illusion of the ninth circle is a spell that creates an illusion that looks like a real person. But if you combine these two spells, you get something interesting. He and his mentor had invented it in their past lives. While the young man was thinking about it, Valentine was already channeling her mana into the circle. Turning to his mentor, and then to Thanos, the boy said that battles have a level of difficulty from 1 to 10. The higher the number, the stronger the opponent. So what level does the young man want to start with? A little nervous, Thanos replied that he wanted to start with the first one. We agreed with him. Jack began to put the finishing touches on the painting, thinking that when Thanos dies a hundred times, he will definitely learn how to hold a sword. Finally, the protagonist ordered Thanos to enter the circle. Worried about what awaits him, the student still enters the circle. After entering it, the guy immediately hangs in the air. Seeing this, Valentine wonders who the first opponent will be. Smiling, Jack approaches her ear, whispering the name of the opponent. Even Milos was shocked by this. Meanwhile, the excited boy said that they would be able to do it even faster than in nine years. Disappointed with the young man, Valentine says that he is not a good person, to which Jack says he hears that a lot. While the student was talking to his mentor, Thanos found himself in a place unknown to him, in complete darkness. Suddenly, turning around, the boy saw a figure slowly walking towards him. The stranger was getting closer and closer. A second later, young Jack stood in front of the boy. Looking at him, Thanos thought he had seen this man somewhere before. The stranger had exactly the same eyes as the young gentleman. While the young man was remembering this, Jack stood upright. Realizing that this was a training session, Thanos also prepared for the fight. Without waiting long, the illusion already attacked the guy, who stood there not knowing how to stop it. The enemy's sword was reflected in his eyes, and at that moment, Thanos thought that everything slowed down. He realized that his head would be cut off. Unexpectedly, Thanos woke up, immediately standing up and catching his breath, checking to see if his neck was okay. At that moment, Jack approached him. Seeing the guy, the student immediately jumped away from him in fright. With a sigh, the guy gave his hand to his friend, saying that there was an illusion in the circle, namely the magic of illusion. Thanos had little experience, and he had never been in a situation where he had to risk his life. That's why he saw Jack in this circle when he was 18 years old. The young man had already tried and had to figure it out for himself, but he would still be told that he would have to fight against Jack from his past life. The longer he can hold out, the stronger he will become. The lack of talent can be made up for with experience. Magic is not used there, only fencing. So the difficulty was at the level of the first round. The guy has to try to win. After hearing this, Thanos asked what past life the gentleman was talking about. Remembering that he hadn't told the boy about it, Jack smiled. Asking if the young man was not confident in himself, Thanos just wiped away the cold sweat, saying that he would still try to win. Looking at this, the protagonist thought that even if it was the magic of illusion, the feeling of death was very plausible. If you die several times, you can go crazy. But Thanos is different. And it's not just compassion. The guy really believes in him. 
Even though he had broken bones and sprained muscles, he practiced with his sword day after day. When the young man asked him last time, he said that he trains in his free time when he is not sleeping or eating. The problem is that this great mental strength was being wasted. So he just has to die and learn from his mistakes. He will definitely be able to surpass Beggarman, and Jack will help him do it. With these thoughts in mind, the protagonist asked Thanos not to call him the Marquis anymore, and continued to reflect on the fact that at first he just wanted to play with this chicken, but over time, his plans changed. He would make a man out of the chicken. When he finished thinking, he told the boy to call him boss. To Jack's surprise, Thanos asked him if he could call him young master. Clapping the young man on the shoulder, the protagonist agreed, which surprised Thanos and made him very happy. Rejoicing, the boy said that he hoped for a young master, and that he simply called him to follow him. Meanwhile, at the mansion, Charlotte was thinking about what she had done wrong. She had waited for the boss after the ceremony, but he hadn't come, and then she saw her big brother nearby. She wanted to ask him to teach her fencing, but when the boss came, even though she had received a compliment, something was clearly wrong. It seemed as if he was a little angry, perhaps because they had dueled without his knowledge. She would have to apologize to him. With these thoughts in mind, she met Cell, who was clearly worried. Seeing Charlotte, the girl immediately fell to her knees, bowing and apologizing for not seeing her coming. Charlotte began to panic at this reaction to herself. Charlotte began to think about how Valactus, the dragon, used her and her mommy as if they were toys, calling himself uncle. That's why she hates dragons. However, the boss said that Cell is not like Valactus at all. And now it shows when the girl in front of her bows down, trembling with fear. Looking at her, Charlotte swallowed the lump in her throat and pointed at it and rushed to hug her, thinking that the boss hadn't told her what happened to Cell, but maybe the girl could help her. While the girls were hugging, in the kitchen, Jack asked what was wrong with the little girl. The cook replied that Cell had been on the roof since morning. And doesn't the young gentleman want to eat something since he came here? Jack remembered the words. The cook looking at the girls and asking why they were both hugging on the floor? Had they really become that close? Hearing this, Valentine notices that only one party has become friends. Looking closely, he does notice that Sal is shaking for some reason and Charlotte is crying. Noticing the boss, the girl immediately ran up to him, apologizing. The young man himself continued to watch his cell bowed. Seeing this, Charlotte went to the girl, trying to pick her up. Because of this situation, Milo said that something was wrong. Last night, the dragon was completely different than it is now. Rubbing the back of his head, Jack says that Cell had to go through a lot in that lab. With that, the boy picked up the two girls, immediately asking what Charlotte was apologizing for. The girl reluctantly replied that the boss was angry that they had dueled without permission, and she wouldn't do it again. Smiling at Charlotte's reaction, Jack said that she could have a duel whenever she wanted. She didn't need his permission, so why should he be angry at all? If she doesn't hit him in the head with a wooden sword, he certainly won't be angry. After calming down, Charlotte asked again if the boss was angry, to which he said that he just felt sorry for Thanos, who was not fighting well so they were convinced of her fencing talent. So tonight they will test her magic. These words lifted Charlotte's spirits. Having finished with that, the protagonist looked at the still trembling cell, asking if she liked the steak for lunch. The girl confirmed it, but did not stop shivering. Then the young man asked her what else she would like to try, but there was no answer. With a sigh, the boy said that cell had no strength at all, and yesterday she resisted so much. It's only been a day, but she's changed a lot. Does she really feel bad? The girl just shook her head. Suddenly, Valentine began to say that the blackened demon would change the earth and sky. Hearing this, Jack sat Cell down, wondering if her condition was somehow affected by the destruction of the world. The girl confirmed it. Then Milo said that this was the prophecy of the third dragon lord. After listening to Valentine, the young man thought about the fact that 400 years ago the third dragon lord, who was stronger than the fourth and fifth lords combined, had rebelled against his mentor's will and died. Of course, her victory was obvious, but he could foresee the future using the power of his soul, so he left his predictions until his death. In the near future, a blackened demon would appear, 
changing heaven and earth and destroying the whole world. With these thoughts in mind, Jack asked Sal what was the reason why he was afraid that he was the blackened demon who would destroy the world. And judging by the reaction, this is true. However, this prophecy is complete nonsense. This news shocked the girl. Sitting down next to her, the boy continued to say that it was complete nonsense. There would be no end of the world. Surprisingly, Sel began to resent the fact that this was a prophecy of the Third Lord, and he was never wrong. Pleased with the girl's energy, Jack said that apparently her parents had not told her that the Third Lord liked to betray his prophecy. This news shocked Sel. Meanwhile, the young man continued to say that the dragon often did this to protect the dragon race. That's why she was worried about nothing, and now she could calm down. With that, the boy patted the girl's head. Excited, Sel asked if he was sure he wouldn't eat her. To which Jack replied that dragons were not his taste. And by the way, it's almost lunchtime, so let her tell him straight up if she liked that steak. Sel's mouth watered at the thought. Blushing, the girl said that it was delicious. Happy with this answer, the boy said that they would eat steaks tonight. And tomorrow he would ask her to cook something new. After hearing this, Sel started to think about new types of steaks. Having solved this situation, Jack told the girl to eat the delicious food and not to be sad. This made Sel's mouth water even more. Suddenly, the young man remembered that he hadn't introduced them to each other yet and said that they already knew each other, but Charlotte was standing in front of her. She would become the future queen of vampires, and Sel was the future ruler of dragons. And he will introduce Thanos at lunch. Having said that, Jack called Charlotte, ordering her to ask Guinevere to prepare lunch. The girl agreed to do so. Then she grabbed Sal's hand, asking her to come with her. Not expecting this, the girl blushed, but agreed anyway. Looking at their backs, Valentine began to say that the young man was a great liar. The third lord was very special. He used soul energy not as mana, as they do now, but only for mental skills. And all his prophecies were short. Tomorrow it will rain, the day after tomorrow a battle will begin, and so on. All his prophecies turned out to be true. Only one did not, and that was his last prophecy. After listening to the woman, the young man asked if his mentor really thought he could destroy the world. Valentine replied that, as far as she could see, he was the only one who could talk about such things. When she objected, the young man began to say that if this were true, then he had destroyed the world in his previous life. But he only destroyed one country and then died. Then he had no reason to live. He didn't really want to live at all. So this is definitely a false prediction. The blackened demon is probably someone else. The future and fate are uncertain. Having said that, the protagonist thought about the fact that tomorrow it might start to rain, and then a battle would start somewhere. However, if you close the sky, stop any disputes, then you can prevent the prediction from coming true. Therefore, the future is uncertain. A fate in which the mentor has 30 years to live. If this really happens, the boy will be very angry. They gathered around the table and finally got to know each other. Thanos is 17 years old, Charlotte is 11 years old, and Cell is 10 years old. And of course him, who looks 14. They're like a gang of kids. Ginez is a better cook than the guy expected. The man said he had worked as an imperial chef for four years. Who knew that such talent was so close by and cooked so well? While thinking about it, Jack noticed Charlotte and said that the steaks were bloodless today. Hearing this, the girl began to beg him. Looking at Sal's reaction, the boy thought that the girl was probably afraid of blood. It's amazing how children grow and learn so quickly. Charlotte will become a vampire queen and Sel will become a dragon queen. This is what it means to raise children. While the young man was enjoying the day, Valentine looked at his happy face and asked him why he wasn't training. The young man was clearly not expecting this question, and there was a pause in the air. Chopping up his food and bringing it to his mouth, Jack replied that two laps were enough for him, so she didn't have to worry. Continuing to pierce the young man with her gaze, Milos asked, What about Blutus? Valktus? And the mercenary guild? Or does he think that the woman doesn't know about anything? Hearing this conversation, Charlotte perked up her ears. Meanwhile, Valentine continued to say that her student doesn't really trust them, but only himself. Of course, he has a small body now, but he only needs time to easily get the third and even the fourth circle. Hearing this, 
Jack clarifies that if he tries hard, he can even get the fifth. After these words, looking at his mentor drinking wine, the protagonist thinks that the physical component is very important. He doesn't want to admit it, but biologically he is a little boy. His body is not what it used to be. There is a difference in the size and length of his veins. And even the size of his heart is different. At Thanos' age, he could easily get coke every day. But now he needs more time, and he shouldn't forget to be vigilant. Interrupting the young man's thoughts, Valentine said that if someone injures a person while creating a circle, it will collapse, and the person will get a big shock. So, is the young man worried that he might be in danger while creating the circle? Hearing this, Jack was once again convinced that it was impossible to deceive his mentor and began to think about the fact that after he was reborn in the body of his 14-year-old self, he first made his circle right in prison, because no one could get to him. And when he made the second circle, he had Ron by his side, a person he could trust. And now he needs to protect his mentor when she is in the form of a doll. And that means he doesn't have time to create a circle. The woman returns to her normal form only once a month, and it happened today. While the protagonist was flying in thought, Jean Eyes brought dessert, making Charlotte happy. Looking at the cake, the young man decided that he couldn't waste time in a circle. Besides, his power is not in circles, but in energy. At this point, Valentine began to say that she should not rely on the student's protection when she is his teacher. Even if she is there once a month, she can still fulfill her duty as a mentor. These words surprised the young man. Meanwhile, a joyful Milos added that she would protect the young man while he was creating the circle. Jack was obviously not happy about this news, as he already had plans for the evening. Tonight, there was a performance at the Ozenblatt Theater with a famous group of artists. He wanted to go and see it. Seeing her student's reaction, Valentine slammed the table, saying that only once a month she returns to her true form and can protect him. Does he refuse? Turning away from the woman's evil smile, the protagonist realizes that he cannot defeat her. But getting up, he says that there is nothing to be done about it. It's one o'clock in the afternoon, so they'll have to make it in five hours, and in the evening they'll all go to the theater. While the friends were rejoicing in their plans for the future, meanwhile at the Arabesque Guild, Taliso showed them the information he had found. After reading it, a bear could not believe that 500,000 gold pieces were paid for the murder of one man. From this news, the man began to panic, saying that the young Mr. Herman was indeed a psycho. A bear thought about the fact that 500,000 gold pieces was the price Dietrich was willing to pay for the murder of Jack Ballantyre. And the Marquis's annual budget is about 300,000. How could the young Marquis Herman pay so much money at once? Moreover, for the sake of killing one man. With these thoughts in mind, the head lay reading reports out loud that Dietrich had borrowed 200,000 in the name of the House of Hermon and received the other 300 at once. That made 500,000. But where did the guy get so much money? Perhaps he sells forbidden items? Rubbing the back of his head, Talisso replies that there are rumors that the boy had a business, but he found nothing. This news makes a bear think that it is not unusual for aristocrats to lead a free lifestyle and use drugs. But who would even start a business related to this? Usually, it would be just a hobby for a young gentleman. But in Herman's case, it was not. While the man was thinking about this, Talisso said that as far as he knew, Dietrich did not run a business on his own. It seems that all the Marquises of Hermon are involved in it. Hearing this, a bear said that it was interesting. Perhaps Dietrich is just speaking on their behalf, but he doesn't do anything on his own. They have distribution channels all over the country. How far have they gone? Impressed by this, Talisso asked if the head understood all this only from the documents. A bear replied that yes, he knew everything. He then asks how far they have gone. Disappointed, the man says he does not know yet. Continuing to look at the documents, the man continues to think about the fact that the business of selling elixirs is impossible without the family of a duke or king. And that means, with these thoughts, the man got up from the couch saying that they had enough investigations. It was important for them to make the payment now. So did the young man find what he was sent for? Concerned, Talisso replied that he had only found half of it. With this news, the head of the guild now finally understood that the assassination attempt had failed and the Fentanyl Assassin's Guild had been destroyed. Otherwise, his informants would have found out about everything long ago, 
and would not have let them go just like that. Ventimon hid his money after he split it. That is why they found only half of it. The other half would not be difficult to find. Having decided so, the man got up to go eat, telling Taliso to continue the search. He also ordered the others to join him. Hearing this, the frightened boy asked if they would hide this event from the top. Looking at the frightened young man, a bear smiled and said with a smile that they would not hide it. They will just solve everything themselves so as not to add to their problems. They are busy people after all. After hearing these words, Taliso began to admire the wisdom of the head, and the man himself was glad that the young man was a fool. After a while, a bear was already standing at the counter asking for tin buns to be wrapped for him. Looking at the pastries, the man thought that he could not trust the top. Jack's threat was real. So now the leader needs money to save his head. And then he will decide whether to report to the top or not. And in general, although he is the head of the branch, there is no point in giving his life for the guild. While the man was thinking about this, a cat appeared at his feet. Sitting down to pet it, a bear continued his thoughts about how he had never seen the top of the guild, even when he became the head. The man does not know their age or gender. He is only sure that they are not the same person. How can you be loyal to people who hide their identities? The man is brought out of his thoughts by the seller, who warned him not to feed the cat, because it had already eaten two plates of food. Taking the buns, a bear walked down the street, continuing to think about how strange it was to try to conquer a forest of monsters at first. He even felt a little sorry for the people who gave their lives there. But this battle could have been avoided. Besides, this is not just a battle, but a war between humans and monsters. Monsters can't get out of the forest, but that doesn't change the essence of it. In general, wars are created to plunge society into chaos, and the kingdom is now calm. With these thoughts, the man reached the guild, and handing the package to the staff, said that everyone should have one. Then he went to his room, thinking that the Arabesque guild was stronger than it seemed. It's easy to control the mood in a country with information. Their faction supports the king, so of course the guild is protected by royal law, and the number of enslaved mana owners who were not needed has decreased dramatically. Although it is highly likely that the king will lose the support of the aristocrats, but why is their guild also involved in all this horror? So many strange things have been happening lately. With these thoughts in mind, the man collapsed on the couch, exhausted, looking at Dietrich's portrait from the file. But I was thinking about the fact that Hermann and his business of using illegal drugs, if you think about it, it was impossible without the support of the empire. Then maybe those 300,000 gold pieces were used to push the asshole Dietrich forward by making him responsible. Then they would definitely have made a fortune. But even without talking about the amount, how could the guild not know about the movement of such money? Would a day of investigation be enough to find out? The man himself was not aware of what his bosses had deliberately concealed. That's why he received a reply earlier asking him to accept Dietrich's offer. Why would the top management go so far? Is it really the management's stolen money? But it's not that kind of money. Then maybe it's military spending? Are they planning to start a war? Then whose money is it? Is it the money of the top? Or people even higher up who have their backs? This is definitely not money to attack a forest of monsters. Count Mintis paid most of the money. But who and why? Suddenly, Abir realized something. Because he began to think about the fact that lately it seems to him that someone is deliberately undermining the strength of this city, or rather the whole country. Both the number of drug addicts and the level of accessibility are growing. That's why so many hired guns are now being used for protection. The man clearly doesn't like it. In addition, Two years ago there were rumors that the Tolkien Empire was conducting experiments on dragons. Although it was said that dragons were extinct, it was just a rumor. Of course, there must be a reason for these rumors. Then the man immediately wanted to check whether they were true, but he received a message. Not to investigate anything about rumors related to the Tolkien Empire. If it was just a rumor, he would not have been given such an order. It's just a man's intuition, but still… He needs to stop thinking about it, but his life is connected to getting information. He cannot just stop. This terrible feeling can take over his body. The guess he made, using only the information in his head, is something like this. The top of the arabesque is either connected to the Tolkien Empire or one of its members is connected there. 
The Adventurer's Guild is actively helping to obtain and control information. If so, then we need to think again. Experiments on dragons? If this is true, then where did they get the dragon from in the first place? Perhaps dragons still live in the forest of monsters. And if in fact a hunt is conducted to find their tracks, it will be very likely. The Tolkien Empire does not value soldiers at all and is ready to use them as expendable material. If there is a result, good. And if not, they will be just happy to have reduced the country's military strength. It is the man from the Tolkien Empire who should have the most power and control over what is happening. If the man's assumptions are correct, the Tesla Empire will not last long. Anyway, it is already barely holding its borders and can easily become a colony of the Tolkien Empire. So, Tolkien, what they really want is war. These thoughts made a bear's blood run cold. However, he continued to think that the Teslon Empire would be helpless in this case. And it was indeed possible. There are definitely people from Tolkien at the top of the Arabes Guild and in the Empire's leadership, which means they want to unite the continent. There is not much time left. Twenty years? Thirty years? No. At best, ten years. My husband likes this country. But when the time comes, what will happen to the Guild and to him? He does not want to become a hunting dog that was thrown away after it caught a rabbit. The man needs to create new cords, strong ones that won't break. While Abir was thinking about this, Jack was creating a new circle. Charlotte entered the room where the protagonist was, along with Valentine and Sal. Looking at the young man, the dragon thought that she hated people. They cut off her limbs, drained her blood, and held her in magical chains. She couldn't love them, but ironically, it was one of them who saved her. Her parents abandoned her, and they also wrote knowledge about xenobiotics or something on her body and left her in the middle of the land in a country called Talcan. At first, the girl was afraid that strong people like Jack could eat dragon meat, but the person in front of her wanted nothing in return. On the contrary, he just patted her head. Such a good person can't be a demon who will destroy the world. The third lord was definitely wrong in his prediction. As a human being, the guy was able to reach the third circle in just an hour, and another hour to reach the fourth. And after two hours, he was able to reach the fifth. With such thoughts, Sal and Charlotte watched Jack with admiration. Looking at the boss's success, Charlotte said that he was awesome. Hearing this, Sal thought she understood her. Anyone who saw that? Suddenly Valentine called out to her, scaring her, and asked if Sal was worried. Sal confirmed that she was. Then Milos told her to be calm and she watched her carefully. They both have wonderful talents after all. This is the most amazing state of the circle. While the woman was talking about this, the protagonist's heart began to glow. Observing this, Valentine continued to say that the difference of one circle is already very big. This is exactly the case. Hearing this, Sel wondered if the woman was really a human being, if she was a god, or a demigod, or a monster. While the girl was thinking about this while looking at Milo's, it was Valentine who said that the young man was strong enough, and every circle of his body was in harmony. The form in which the body and mana become one is sometimes called mana unity. If one knows how to control this state, one can open up all boundaries. Having said this, the woman saw that the girl was not listening to her, so she called out to her, asking her not to think about nonsense. Then she put her hand on her head, asking her why she thought the woman and the boy were like that now. Cell could not answer that. Then Valentine said that she could only talk about herself, not about her student. Hearing this, Cell hung her head, thinking that it must be because she was a stranger. As if reading her mind, Milo smiled and said that she didn't know much about Jack herself. Seeing a gloomy Cell, Valentine rushed to hug her, saying that she understood perfectly well what had happened to the girl in that laboratory, but she should just trust the woman's student. As long as the boy is around, no one in the whole world will hurt the girl. Cell is surprised by these words, and then she can't stand it any longer and starts crying with happiness. Meanwhile, the day has already turned to evening, and the protagonist thinks that the fifth circle at the age of 14 sounds like a reason to be proud. This is really an unprecedented case. I wonder if the boy's body had always been like this? He thought he was able to create a circle very quickly because he was with Ron and in prison, but his energy is not so pure because of his age. I wonder if it is because of the energy of the soul? It is higher than mana and level. 
and since the guy is good at controlling soul energy, he is no worse at mana. Therefore, perhaps he can even become stronger than the last time he first discovered his inner energy? With these thoughts in mind, the young man watched the performance with Charlotte, who was fascinated by the action, and continued to think, while the prima sang, that if he became stronger than himself, then he might actually be able to destroy the whole world. While the protagonist was flying in his thoughts, the performance was over and everyone started applauding, including Sal and Charlotte. Looking at his mentor and the dragon, the boy wondered when they had managed to become friends. The girl smiled so cheerfully, but the mentor, the boy thought she had forgotten how to do it. If he had known they would like it so much, he would have made Thanos come here. The young man left him at home as he stayed at home to train. It's hard to become the best swordsman on the continent. Jack was brought out of his thoughts by Valentine, who said that he didn't seem to like the show. Smiling, the young man says that on the contrary, it was interesting. It was just amazing. And the plot twists were great. Hearing this, Valentine smiled slyly and asked him if he liked the part where Christina turned out to be a ghost in the theater. Rubbing his chin, Jack replied that it was indeed incredible. Who knew that she would turn out to be the main character? This answer puzzled everyone. Because Valentine said that the ghost was not Christina, but a man named Eric. At this, the young man just laughed awkwardly. Then he offered to eat, because people were starting to leave. Hearing this, Milos immediately realized that the guy was just confused and tried to change the subject. Sometime later, in a tavern that was full of noise, the door opened and the protagonist walked in. The waitress immediately asked how many people were in the young man's group. Jack replied that there were four, and they would take one more dish to go. Sitting down at the table, the girls began to discuss how much fun they had at the show. Watching this, the guy was just enjoying the moment. Suddenly his attention was drawn to the girl's words, and he turned his head and saw a bear. In turn, the man looked at the table and saw Jack, and for a second he was numb. Then he approached him saying that he did not expect to meet him here. Smiling, the young man asked if the man was following him. The man replied that he had just come to eat. Would an information gatherer give himself away so much? Hearing this, Jack smiled, saying that the man must have a lot of time on his hands if he was going to restaurants instead of looking for money. To this, a bear said that he had already found half of it. With these words, the head sat down at the table with the young man. Seeing the man's expression, the young man said that the boss obviously wanted something from him. A bear confirmed this, but would not talk in such a place. Smiling, the guy understood why. It was because of the stares of the visitors. His mentor stood out. Expectedly, one of the adventurers approached the woman, asking permission to sit next to her. When Jack saw the stranger, he grimaced, realizing that it was the one who played the role of the ghost in the play. Meanwhile, Valentine smiled, saying that she was busy today. Hearing this, the man said that since the woman was busy today, he would wait for the next opportunity. Perhaps she could tell him where she lives? Seeing this, a bear called out to the stranger and said something in his ear, which caused the sparkle in his eyes to disappear. And in a moment, he stormed off, apologizing as best he could. Seeing this, Jack said that the man did not have to wait for an extra payment. Rubbing his neck, a bear said that he hadn't even counted on it. And now he would go. And very soon he will find the guy's money. Suddenly, Milos told the man to sit down and eat. Then she looked at the student. Realizing that she was waiting for his approval, the young man agreed. While a bear was sitting down, the boy began to say that he hoped the man had money with him. Because the guy doesn't buy food for people who are taller than him. The words showed despair mixed with irritation on a beer's face. Because he said he had money. While enjoying his meal, a bear held out a plate for the girls and smilingly told them to take as much as they wanted. Seeing this, Jack concluded that the man cared about the children. The head was about to put a piece in his mouth, but suddenly the boy asked why the man had accepted Dietrich's request. Putting down his fork, a bear replied that he had been ordered to do so by his superiors. Smiling, the young man asked if the man meant that he had no choice. With a sigh, the leader said that he was just a tool. Hearing this and chewing his food, the young man began to say that the man had a hard time. The leader also said that he had found some of the money. How much was there? A bear replied that there were 500,000. 
The guy almost choked on this information. Wiping his mouth, Jack said he thought there were 50,000. After that, he wondered where the idiot had gotten that kind of money. Meanwhile, the man put the food on a fork and raised it to his mouth, saying that Dietrich must have run several businesses. Hearing this, the young man said that the man just wanted to test him. After all, the answer was too vague. He just wanted to see how he would react. As for the several businesses of Dietrich's family, surely there was something more to it? To this, a bear replied that he could not give this information for free. Unexpectedly, the young man grabbed the man's shoulder and said with a scary look that he hadn't asked for it. Let the head just swallow, because he would still pay half the bill. After all, the guy said that he did not treat strangers who were older than him. Hearing this, a bear tried to make excuses that he was one of five people here and had to pay only one-fifth, but Jack did not care. He continued to say that he had ordered the food for himself, but since the man had joined him, he had to pay half the bill. Why doesn't he say anything? He would pay, wouldn't he? This turn of events scared a beer to death. Suddenly, Jack let the man go, deciding to stop playing the fool, and said that he would pay for everything himself. Let the head think that this is a gift in honor of his journey to the afterlife. However, if he does not find his money, the guy will have another gift. Jack continued to enjoy a beer's fright until the end of the dinner. Suddenly, Valentine said it was time. And at the same second, the woman began to glow, surprising the head. The fog cleared and revealed the doll again, puzzling a bear even more. Meanwhile, the young man took the toy in his hands, saying that he didn't care if the man told others about it, but let it remain between him and the man. Surprised, the head looked at the doll and averted his gaze and agreed with the boy. While the young man himself was thinking that no one would believe the secret between him and his mentor even if the whole world knew about it, so he didn't care if people found out. Although it seems that Aber believes that the teacher used the polymorph on herself. Having finished their thoughts, the group went outside and began to say goodbye. Looking at the man's back, surprising her student, Valentine began to say something she hadn't told him something she hadn't even told him in her past life. About her intuition. Perhaps it was because she had felt death all her life, but she could smell death on people who were about to die. When Jack hears this, he asks if Amber is going to die. The answer is yes. However, the woman does not think that the young man will do it. Someone else will kill him. After listening to Milos, the young man thought that as far as he knew, many talented people have been dying in the kingdom lately and that the man would probably be one of them. While the young man was thinking about this, Valentine asked if her student was concerned. Jack replied that it did not bother him much. Thinking about the fact that he only knows his name and position about the head, the man still doesn't look completely talentless, but he hasn't shown anything that could convince the boy of his skills. But now he is only concerned about his new family. With these thoughts, the protagonist hugged Charlotte. While the group was having fun, a bear looked at the moon with his tired eyes, thinking that it seems he will be working overtime today, and he would probably eat some fruit to stay awake. 